on as fast or faster than humanly possible. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the board, uh, let me welcome you to the 27th uh, conference of the uh, HPRCT group. So on behalf of our board and our planning chair, Mr. Walters, uh, we welcome you aboard uh, for this learning opportunity. So uh, this year we're gonna do it fully by Zoom, uh, but that certainly won't be the case uh, as, we, as we move forward. Uh, if you look at this lineup, it is, it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of great learning that is going on, but we 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 long for the day uh, and the opportunity uh, to get back with the actual learning and sharing that takes place in between sessions or these workshop uh, workshop kind of sessions as we have here, and then also you know out and about uh, in an evening when we have our get together uh, to share, ruminate, and then challenge thought processes uh, toward uh, greater learning. So quick review here on day one. Thank you for joining day one. Uh, our keynote is Mr. Todd Conklin. Uh, I suspect Todd has uh, been with us as many times or more than any other speaker that we've had. And we are uh, as happy as we could be to have my brother Todd Conklin back uh, with us. So we're gonna have a, a, a mix. I think it's a great mix of people who are brand new to us, uh, and then people who are, are, are quite uh, experienced, let's say. So uh, Todd is quite experienced. Ivan is experienced, but he's new to us. Uh, Bob been with us many times. Uh, you're gonna really enjoy uh, the story and the lesson uh, to take home with Bob. And then Brian Biscuit, who, who's been around this concept uh, for an inception, inception many, many years ago. Uh, day two. Lindsay, new to us. Asher, uh, kind of, you know, going through the same kind of programs. Uh, he's there with David Woods, uh, uh, kind of thing that Decker has gone through. Uh, he's going to talk about the new things going on uh, coming out of Ohio State and the learnings there. And Jake, who we've had with us before, and then uh, Tanya, who's, who's been with us many times, first time, actually going to present. Uh, great to have Riz uh, with us. You know, most of you have seen him before. At other conferences, great to have him uh, presenting here. And then on day three, we're going to round out with uh, Melissa, Deborah, uh, new to us, and then Kim, uh, longtime listener, first time she's called in for a while, right? So uh, a good check in with, with Kimball as we move forward. So we're an all volunteer organization. And if you didn't see your name up there on the plan committee or the board or as a speaker, uh, it could be. Right. So you have an interest, you have the knowledge and don't make us come look for you. Uh, share what you have. So don't deprive the rest of us of your brilliance. Right. So if you want to get better at your craft, this is an opportunity. We have to sit down and think about, OK, what what would I present? How am I going to do it? How am I going to be succinct? How am I going to be impactful? That, that's the same skill set you need to go home uh, inside your culture and make a difference. So that's exactly the thing. Uh, that we need you to do because you'll make us better and in the process it will make you better. 1942, uh, Mr. Einstein, uh, he was uh, walking along the, 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 the grass at Oxford University and he had just given an exam to the senior class and he was walking along with one of the teaching aides and teaching aide said, uh, Mr. Professor, uh, may I ask you a question? Oh, yes, 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 of course. Uh, the test you just gave, isn't that exactly the same test you gave as a final last year? Yeah, yeah, same test. But Professor, how, how could you do that? He said, well, the questions are the same but the answers have changed. So what was true in 1942, that the questions that we seek to answer may not change very much. The answers to get us the results that we want are always changing and growing. When we look at uh, the cognitive field of study that we, that we want to entertain, to inform us, to help us get better, 
and help this group come together uh, to understand the human socio-technical interface uh, to help create improvement uh, for this world. We have to always think that the answers must be changing because there's some things working against us, right? The view from above, the higher we get in the organization, the harder it is to see the side of the Jenga stack, but the easier it is to uh, boil things down where there's no context. The more likely we are to say, ah, what a great system that I helped build. It must be this bad apple who's operating in it, right? So that is something that we, as we get further and further up in the organization, might become more susceptible to. So here's the, the hard, honest truth is that leaders have a lot more to learn than front frontline workers. But more importantly, we and, our, and the people we work with have a lot more to unlearn than frontline workers. So, you know, when we talk about what makes progress, what has made impact, uh, you know, you've probably seen Todd talk to the asymptotic curve uh, of things that were once uh, revolutionary, right? Like scientific thinking in, in, in 1911 and scientific management uh, and what that meant uh, as far as production and safety. It improved everything. It lowered costs. It was fantastic. But there came a time where it met its limit, right? And then uh, things went along until 1942 uh, or so. And then we see uh, the studies that were done in the B-17 and others around the fact that uh, any human will fail when put into a certain set of circumstances and systems. And instead of trying to continue to make the human fit within the system, we started to look at how do we work the context in which people work to improve outcome. And then most of the uh, levels of cognitive study that, that we typically talk about today uh, haven't emerged over the last 30, 35 years. And they're not done, nor is it a dead uh, science is the thing I wanna say. Because this, this view from above that we have to continually work against makes the situation look simple. It makes the choices look clear. It makes deviation look deviant, right? and defiant in its nature. Uh, and we have to understand uh, the context drives. If you're not on mute, you should be. We are smarter than, because we know how it ends. So what we talk about a lot is how to change and improve our ability to see. So it's about changing the way you see work, the way we see workers, the way we see error, the way we see violation, the way we see ourselves, the way we see problems. It's about changing the way we see and not being limited by our current level of sight, right? That we, that we have the ability to stand on the shoulders of others, that we can yet see further and allow others to stand upon ours. So let me talk about blindness for a second. So here we, have, we have a bat. Uh, we have in the, in the lower uh, left there, we have uh, a man named Jerry. Now, Jerry has two detached retinas uh, since about age 28 and doesn't see anything. And then we have me, right? So I'm up there. And the question is, you know, who is the most blind? Well, when we look at bats, they actually have uh, vision very comparable to our own. Color vision may not be as good, uh, but they definitely see a whole lot better than we do. Uh, in a low light situation and probably just as well in most situations, right? So we have a limiting kind of mindset around bats. Uh, they're maybe not, maybe not so blind at all. Maybe they see better than we do. And then when I look at Jerry, I think, wow, I can obviously see better than Jerry. But when we think about all kinds of blindness, the more we learn, the smarter we are, the more we get recognized for being uh, the smartest person in the room, the harder it is for us to see where we have blind spots, where we need to change, where we could grow. And we become prosecutors of other people's positions and preachers of our own and fail to continue to learn. And this, this organization, this community is about continuing to learn that we don't continue, uh, to know what we know very well and be blind to the things uh, that we could know. So we're bringing together this community and it helps, uh, helps us address the old questions, 
right? We all want productivity. We all want engagement. We all want greater safety. Uh, we all want those things, but we're talking about do in different ways to get those answers that we might get there. So uh, we are searching and expanding uh, the cognitive areas that we represent, the things that we would consider, and we want to have an open door to be able to learn uh, from anyone. So we're in search of, just like Mulder and Skelly, we're in search of that truth. That truth is out there. And as I said before, you might be the very one, right, who has that piece of knowledge that you could bring to us. So I invite you to interact over the next three days. Uh, I invite you to uh, reach out with uh, your uh, positions and knowledge that we all might get better in what we do. So we always have to challenge uh, what we see, but also the things that we think. So here's a, here's a management trap, right? Is that if you've, got, you've been in organizations, right? They'll tell you what, 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 the, what results, what KPIs, what we want by the end of the year. And as a manager, you only get paid to do really one thing and that's improve the KPIs, leverage the people that you work with. We don't make the products, we don't uh, provide the service directly. So we have those results that we're measured on and then sometimes people care about our actions and we get in this do loop without digging deeper. And this community is about digging deeper to understand the beliefs and mindsets and the culture and the context that, that leads to people taking actions that will give better results. And then what do leaders do to give better experiences, better context, uh, to better position people uh, to think and feel and act like owners and to move forward. It is hard to know what to think. Uh, things have changed. The Heinrich Pyramid at one time was super duper. And now if there's anything that's an, uh, a limiting factor to growth uh, in mindset around safety, that's it. So here we have, uh, there's no such thing as unconscious thought. And this is a peer reviewed kind of thing. And then we have over here, there is no such thing as conscious thought. So what's very interesting to help you not get rooted in who you are and what you think and what you think you know, uh, is when we look at the half life of truth in the social sciences, and really more and more of the physical sciences. The half-life of truth is about seven years. So here's a replicated study, peer-reviewed, gets published, and within seven years, uh, over 50% of those have been disproven, couldn't be replicated, uh, improved or, or changed. And we have to have that same kind of mindset and ability. So we want to do that with HPRCT. We want to live what we talk. So let me tell you this. Thank you for being here and being part of our, our 27th conference. But let me tell you, this is the last time that we're going to have the HBRCT conference because we want to live what we talk about. at HPRC three, three years before I could remember the acronym, right? So we probably won't talk about acronyms very much, but we are the community of human and organizational learning, right? It, it, it removes some of the barriers, uh, some of the things. We have to keep adding acronyms uh, into the discussion if we want to have the same discussion. Let me tell you a couple of things about astronauts I know to be true. Every one of them that goes to space and spends much time there, they have a loss of bone mass. They have a loss of muscle mass. They actually lose most of their sense of taste, but what they gain, they think is worth it. What they gain is a sense of perspective. What they gain is the knowledge that the world is boundaryless, right? That everything on a map uh, is false and created and not real. That those boundaries don't really exist. And everyone that comes back from space 
is more humanitarian and dedicates their life to creating change for the most part and spreading that word. And that's what we want to do over the next couple of days is help to back up, create perspective that we can see the whole, that we can have holistic answers and holistic solutions. So welcome. We thank you for making, helping us make this leap as we move forward and love to see you in person uh, in beautiful Colorado next year when we get together. I'm now going to turn it over to the incomparable Dean Smith. Uh, Dean, he's got the voice. He's got the look. He's got the charisma. He's got the, the twinkle in his eyes. He's got everything needed to be successful. And he's now going to help us go on a journey. Thank you, Dean. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. And it is good to see everybody. And I'm going to uh, quickly turn over the, the sharing rights to Todd Conklin. Todd Conklin. And Todd, just give me a second. I'll... Uh, I'll turn that over to you and then you'll be able to share out and we'll get started with our day. And I have, so there we go. Did it work, Dean? Not yet, Todd. Todd, there you go. I've done it successfully. It really? only took like 32 <laughs> seconds, but thanks for the patience. And it's great to see you. You're super empowered. No, it's good to be seen. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Are you excited? Is this exciting? To me, I think this is a really interesting opportunity and I'm excited. And I know that change is tough because change is tough, but change even for the better oftentimes comes with a little bit of adjustment period. And I think actually it's a really good time to talk about this idea of adjustment period because this has been a pretty crazy ride. And once again, we're meeting via Zoom, which I actually think I look better. Now, before we get started, I need to tell you that the camera adds about 78 pounds. So when you're looking at me, just minus 78 pounds, which I'm actually doing for you as well. And some of you are really looking skinny. That's all I'm going to tell you. That's, that's all I want to say. But to get that out there, I think that's a really interesting part of a discussion today as well. And I'm excited. I actually have some things to talk to you that are relatively new. Oh, let me change my uh, break food just in case you're anti-carbs uh, and have any kind of gluten issues. So I'll, I'll just switch over to keto, which actually should maybe make everybody happy. So actually, this isn't um, a slide. I actually normally am always thinking about bacon. That's kind of how it works for me. So I want to just spend a little time with you today and talk to you about this idea of a community of human and organizational learning. Because I actually think this community idea is a very powerful way to tap in to exactly what we've been a part of for many years. And this name, I think, is more accurate and really sort of understands the more contemporary understanding of the world in which we live. But I think Charles said something really powerful. In fact, so powerful that I grabbed it really quickly. This community, I think, fundamentally helps address some very important but old questions in new ways. And this idea of addressing these old questions in new ways is a theme that I'm going to carry through at least my keynote today, because if I had to call this keynote anything, and I'm really bad at naming stuff, I would call it three big changes. Because this idea of three big changes is important. And, and I spend a lot of time uh, talking to people because that's what we do now. And Pretty much everybody asked me at some point, well, what can I do immediately to facilitate an entire change of my organization? And I understand when they ask that question that they're looking for the silver bullet. And I understand the attractiveness of sort of doing one thing and causing great amount of change. And I also know that that's difficult and virtually impossible. But I would suggest there are three things that this community of learning has been toiling with for a long time. And those three things, I think, are the three big changes. And I'll just kind of give you an overview of what I think those changes are, just to kind of reduce the amount of, uh, of uh, anxiety you must feel right now watching this presentation. I think the first thing we have to think about is we have to change the way we define our outcome. And I would suggest Charles's references to uh, 1911 and the early 40s and sort of the trends that have changed kind of 
as they've moved, the sort of moving from Taylorism to less Taylorism to understanding sort of systems as a as an entity, as an organic sort of response to solving problems, has helped us along the way. But I think the outcomes that we are trying to achieve are just that we've seen them as outcomes, and unfortunately, I think what we deal with is probably not an outcome. What we deal with is kind of an ongoing capacity that organizations must engage. And and that's an important part of what we want to think about. The second change is that I think we have to change the way we learn about our organizations, which is exactly what this group has done for 27 years and longer for some people. We've really helped organizations understand that the way we learn colors how we respond. And so if we want better responses, then we have to do better learning. And then the third change, and I've really struggled with what to call this. I, I, I sort of left it in, I would suggest kind of the wussy zone for this first slide, but I'll get a little more edge on it as we progress through, is I think we have to change the way leaders respond. And I think Charles hit that pretty well, right squarely on the nose when he talked about that leaders have much to learn. But I think it's important for us to understand that we have to help leaders be successful in creating that opportunity to learn. And what I think is really changing is, in fact, accountability. And we talk a lot about accountability. We have for years. But I actually think accountability for operational success is now in a phase where it's moving up the organization, not down the organization. And that shared sense of accountability is a big part of what we want to talk about. And this little list was going to be great, you guys. I mean, this was going to be like the dreamy thing. And I've been thinking about it a while. And I was really excited to share it with you guys. And and I was excited to think about it. And then the world changed. And we've been a part of that change. Many of us dramatically so. And, And what's interesting is this change, I think, has helped us re-evaluate what it is we do. But I also think it's put a sharper point, a, a finer edge on the work we do, not only for ourselves and the way we think about the work, but for the organizations that we represent and how they think about the things we've been talking about. I don't know how it is for you guys, but I spent an awful lot of my career talking about building capacity and systems to fail safely. And people, often would ask me to define capacity, which I found really frustrating because it's not a terribly difficult concept to grab. I mean, you know, if you have a dozen eggs in your refrigerator, you have capacity for scrambled eggs, right? I mean, it's, it's not a terribly complex uh, definition, but organizations really struggled with this idea of defining capacity. And the pandemic, I think, helped teach that in ways that I couldn't even have imagined. And and now that change that we're dealing with really sort of threads nicely with the very changes that Charles talked about in his presentation. Because we're coming from a world, I don't even care what you do, but we're coming from a world that was truly optimized towards leveraging efficiency. And in fact, every one of us has sat through countless meetings and countless strategic planning sessions where they really talked about creating much greater levels of efficiency. And that's fine. I mean, I think that's actually a a great thing to talk about. And I'm relatively certain, although I'm open for debate on this at any level, that the need for efficiency is not going to go away. But I think it's changed. We lived in a world that truly wanted to do things better, faster, and cheaper. We lived in a world where we truly talked about providing shareholder value at at a pretty high level and creating systems that would actually increase that shareholder value. We lived in a world that talked greatly about things like leaning processes out and Six Sigma and ways to actually reduce the variability that exists and to create really one right, one efficient way to do work. And we bought that pretty much hook, line, and sinker because the world in which we live told us that that value was incredibly important. And then things changed. And what's interesting is that we're still now, I think, dealing with the fact 
that our organizations are really being forced to also understand and optimize towards the notion of resilience. And the distance between efficiency and resilience, I'm not sure I've quite measured yet. I mean, I know they're different terms. They're certainly spelled differently, so that helps. But also, I would suggest they ask different things of our organization's leaders. And those different questions, I think, have created an environment where suddenly our place at the table is no longer sort of a good thing to have. Not that I'm devaluing what we did. I don't mean that at all. I actually think we've always offered really important and valued information to our organizations. But suddenly, and I don't know if you're feeling this, suddenly the things we talked about, about reliable and safe performance, are now being applied to things like production and operations and logistics and human resources and finance and leadership. And the challenge we have, and I think it's a, a true challenge, is that our role as people who understand at maybe a, not a deeper level, because I think that would be sort of pompous and, and a little creepy for us to say, but at a level where we've thought about these ideas a little longer within the organization's processes, gives us a really nice entry point to have these discussions. And I think the challenge is, and I don't know what you're thinking, but I think the challenge is, is to help the organization realize there probably is no normal for which we will return. And since we're not going to go back to the world we left, which sounds awfully dramatic, but I don't know how else to say it. Since we're not going to go back to that place, I think we have to help the organization move forward. And I've talked about that a lot. In fact, I talked about it with, with us the last time we got together, this idea of bouncing out of the funk and bouncing towards improvement. Well, I think what's amazing about this is that you guys are doing it. I, I mean, and I, I really want you to think about this because you're actually creating an environment now that's better than it probably was 18 months ago. And that's worth taking a moment and giving a stock check on. Because now the voice that you bring to the table about creating tolerance and processes and understanding variability and knowing how important agility is and knowing that workers in an improvisational way solve problems all the time, that message becomes a powerful, powerful message to help our organizations and maybe more significantly our organization's leaders really be better prepared for what's going to happen next. Even though I don't have the Vegas idea what's going to happen next. I've sort of given up. I don't know how you are, but I've completely given up on that. I, I sucked at predicting the future anyway. I mean, I had that problem back when things were pretty easy to predict. Now I really suck at predicting the future, but I, I would guess we all do. Because if we were good at predicting the future, we would have bought a lot of Dogecoin and we wouldn't be at this meeting. Our assistant would be sitting at the Zoom screen taking copious notes of everything you say and then sharing that information with us on our yacht. That's kind of what I think will happen. But I think there's good news. And as near as I could tell, the fact that we're not going to go back to normal is an incredible opportunity for us to really move forward in a much different way. And that comes back to this idea of the three big changes. Because I think we have to hold on to, at some level, three, maybe four, I would even maybe accept five, but three compass points, three directional indicators, three north stars to help organizations know what the best way, well, a best way, I don't know if it's the best way, a best way to not only restore our ability to do the work we do, but to actually improve the work we do. And so that's what I want to talk about. But to get there, I have to actually do something that I'm a little uh, hesitant to do, and that is to tell a story. Now, I'm not against telling stories. I'm actually pro-story. And if you read my record, and I think it's out there available for you to look at, I've been pro-story my entire political career. I mean, it's out there. The, the data's there. 
But this story is kind of high risk. And it's high risk because it's really not one story. And it's not two stories. It's three stories. And I think three stories is a lot to ask. Like, maybe not if you're from the southern part of North America. Like, three stories in Alabama is where a story begins. A lot of times in Alabama, you can get a fourth and fifth story, right? If you move over to Mississippi, you can almost guarantee a fifth story. And so some of you have some talent in understanding multiple stories, but others of you, I'm looking at you Canadians, you're not big storytellers. So two stories is really kind of a stretch and it'll freak you out a little bit and you'll wonder when it's over. Here's my advice. Just sit back and enjoy the ride because there's really only one story I want you to hear. That one story is the last story. That's the story that I think will launch us into our conversation. And weirdly enough, Charles, and we didn't really talk about this, it ties in greatly to the things you're thinking about. But to get to that third story, I have to tell the second story because the second story provides this little thing we call context. And we know that context is really important. So the second story makes the third story make sense, except that the second story doesn't really stand on its own. So that's where the first story comes in. Now, this first story is an interesting story because really this first story is not going to be the story of amazing success. Because the one thing we all share in this meeting today is the fact that all of our organizations, all of the places where we help organizations thrive and survive in an uncertain world, all of our organizations have really good days and really crap days. In fact, every organization moves forward and then moves backwards. And that's normal. And I would suggest where I came from, when we did reliable performance, we were the best in the world. But when we sucked at doing it, we were world-class suckers. I mean, nobody could even touch us. And I think it's important for us, maybe not us as a group this morning, but for us in the work we do to really recognize and talk openly about the fact that the organization will ebb and flow and that improvement is not an arc that moves consistently towards the future. That in fact, the world is filled with these variabilities that move back and forth. And it's teaching us that virtually every single day. And that's kind of what this story does is it helps us understand what it looks like when the system is not successful. So without any further ado, let me show you this story. And I've actually chosen to, uh, I had a little product made for this meeting and I wanna show it to you for a couple of reasons. One is I wanna model the way you can tell a really long story through mediated communication like Zoom or Team or whatever it is. And I wanna do it in such a way that I think you'll find it somewhat compelling. So without any further ado, and if I can do this, cause it's really hard for me to do all this crap. So that's why Dean, I have a complete appreciation for what you've done. This is going to be the story I'm gonna tell. Here it goes. Good at having resilient and robust and reliable systems. We're really good at it. And when we're bad at it, we suck at it. And this is the story of suckage, not of goodness. We've done a lot of high-risk work for many, many years, and we're located on these five mesas. Now, if you don't know what a mesa is, it's a flat top mountain. And so at the facility, we have lots of water test wells, and they're located all around the facility, mostly in these canyons, because that's where the water goes. And we check those water test wells with incredible discipline and great regularity. And for a bunch of reasons, all of them kind of administrative and boring, one of our wells fell out of our regulatory inspection schedule. We haven't really been looking at this well in 10 years. We're about to send people out there almost on a daily basis. Would you go out and do a hazard identification and just check the environment out before we start sending workers out there? So I said, sure, that's a good idea. So I picked a couple guys that are really good, gave them a pickup, and they drove out to the well. Now, the well's located at the bottom of this canyon, 
and it's about a mile off the blacktop highway. So it's, it's kind of not on the regular road. It's a dirt road that kind of, it's a switchback that goes down the side of this canyon. And the guys drove down there and they checked everything out. Hour and a half later, they came back and they said, everything looks great. It's fine. It's in good condition. It, it's, um, it's probably okay for us to send workers out there. There's only one problem. And I said, what's the problem? And they said, it looks like nobody's driven out there in like 10 years. The road is in terrible condition. And I said, well, that's a, that's a pretty accurate assessment. So what do we need to do? And they said, well, we're going to have to work on that road because the road is the riskiest part of this operation. So I did exactly what you guys would do. I pick up the phone and call our best contractor, the one that does really good work, but also has a contract that's got a little flexibility in it. And I could say, hey, this is a priority one. There's a lot of attention on this. I'm not going to have full time to run a scope schedule on it, but can we get this job done? And the contractor came back and said, you bet, which is why I called that person, right? And so they set up, in fact, they said, is it okay if we start tomorrow? And I said, it's not only okay, it's perfect. So the next day they set it up and they went out and actually looked at the environment and they came back and they said, we're going to put a crew out there and uh, we're going to, we're going to put an inch and a half of base course, an inch and a half of gravel on that road. So we're going to have a couple dump trucks. We're going to have a, a loader. We're going to have a compactor. That's one of those machines with all the tires on the bottom, a supervisor spotter. We'll put a crew out there and we'll fix it. It's going to take us two days. It's a two day operation because it's about a mile and a quarter. So they sent the crew out there, they ran through all their pre-job and they said, everything's great. Don't run with scissors. Don't poke yourself in the eye, be careful. You know, all the normal safety stuff. And then they said, the biggest hazard on this job is about a mile in, a power line crosses over the top of the road and it's very low. And where that power line was going was down the edge of that canyon to that pump house. So that the power line powered the pump. They said, we're gonna mark it, we're gonna flag it, and we're going to put signs up and we'll paint an orange line on the dirt underneath where the power line is. You'll have absolutely no problem identifying it. When you get there, notch up your carefulness and let's get under there without having any kind of event. So the first dump truck comes and it's a new guy. He hasn't worked for this contractor before. It's basically his first day. And he runs in there with a dump truck full of gravel and he starts to dump it. And grown men begin crying and angels sing, and a rainbow appeared over the top of the dump truck, and a unicorn jumped over the top of the rainbow, and it was amazing. This new guy was like the best heavy equipment operator that anyone had ever seen, and he had this ability to dump gravel in such a way that it didn't really need to be moved around very much. So if you've ever seen a really good crane operator, and you guys have, or a really good dozer operator, really good heavy equipment operator, it's way more art than it is science, and they're just good at it. And this guy was just like the Michelangelo of dump truck drivers. And what happened is the crew decided, holy crap, with this kind of talent, let's not rotate dump trucks. Let's keep this guy driving everything. So they would bring him a new dump truck. He would jump between one truck to the other truck and just keep dumping gravel. And they were really making some hay on this job. They were moving really far ahead. And in fact, by noon that day, they were almost a mile into the road. Now, this driver, he's really good. He's going down a hill and he's at the end of a load and he's at the one mile point. And his focus almost entirely is on dumping the load and so he's looking in his mirrors and looking back and he's got a spotter helping him understand exactly where to put this gravel. And it has worked beautifully for the last six hours. And as he goes down this hill and he's at the end of the load, the bed of that dump truck is as high as it can possibly. In fact, if he could get it higher, he'd have it higher. It's as high as it can possibly be. And he slips underneath that power line and the corner of that dump truck grabs that power line and he has an arc event. Now, that's not a big deal. If you wanna have an arc event, the very best way to have an arc event is in a dump truck. I mean, nobody got hurt, but it was an electrical safety event and at our facility, that's a big deal. And so the contractor did exactly what he knew he should do. And that is he stopped the job immediately and notified us that they'd had this accident. So I get a call and, uh, I send the two guys that had been out there the day before to check it out because they already know the way. They're perfect. 
they run down there and I say to them, hey, they've had an event, do a critique, tell me what we have, and then we can sort of determine what we need to do to move forward from there. Because we really want to learn from this because learning is really important to us. So they drive out there and they're back in like 45 minutes. And I said, what's up? That's quick. What'd you learn? And he said, not much. He said, by the time we got there, the contractor had terminated the dump truck driver, terminated the spotter, and terminated the supervisor. And I said, well, that's not what we want. I mean, we, it's going to be really hard to learn from that. And my guy said, yeah, but that's what happened. And when we asked him why, he said, that's what you guys really want us to do. So that report filtered up to my leadership, my director of my facility, and they decided they had to take some action. So the action they decided to take was not to actually punish anybody, but to increase awareness of the potential hazard of hitting something with the top of your truck. So they made a decision in the fancy boardroom. I didn't get to be invited to that meeting. And the decision they made in the fancy boardroom was that they were going to have a stand down a safety stand down. Now, I don't know what you guys think about safety stand downs. They're used a lot. I would actually suggest a stand down is kind of an elaborate way to ask workers to care more. And if the problem is the workers don't care enough, then we have to assume that the accident happened because the person wanted to or chose to hit that power line. So a stand down is not gonna be very effective, but my voice was not very loud nor was very welcome. And so they determined they were gonna do it anyway. So what they did is they got an auditorium and they picked an afternoon and they brought in lots of speakers with PowerPoint slides, all of them with the same theme, which was don't hit crap with the top of your truck. They brought out people from the outside, you know, guys from like a hundred miles away with a briefcase, experts in not hitting crap at the top of your truck. And they had an entire afternoon long meeting with about 300 drivers where they basically told them to be more careful, try harder, care more, and for goodness sakes, don't hit stuff at the top of your truck. But they knew the stand down was not enough on its own. So they also then had stickers made for the dashboard of every vehicle. And those stickers said, don't hit crap with the top of your truck. And then they measured every vehicle to determine the maximum height and they put the maximum height of the vehicle on the bottom of that sticker in the cab so the driver or the passenger could see it. And I think they felt really good about this meeting. They would got everybody together, they'd heightened awareness, and they'd got these stickers out on all the vehicles. So every vehicle now told you how tall it was. That is story one. Story two happens about a week and a half later on a Monday. And at the place where I work, we have a lot of drivers. I already told you, we have about 300 and, and they're all sorts of different driver jobs. If you start as a new driver at my facility, you come in probably at the trash truck. The trash truck's a good entry place. If you're really good at the trash truck, you can be a recycle guy. And the supervisor of our drivers is actually the manager of our warehouse system, and he's really well-respected and well-liked. He's a very, very, very good leader. And he every week has a safety meeting, and every week he doesn't really talk much about safety. He talks about operations, and his idea is that the two things they want to have is they want to be professional and courteous. And his theory is, if his drivers are professional and courteous, then they're also going to be very safe and reliable. And it works brilliantly. It's a really, really good thing. And so that Monday meeting happened, and they talked about all sorts of important stuff, probably even talked about not hitting crap at the top of the truck and the new stickers. I mean, they probably got all that in. And then he sent everybody out to do their job. And we have three recycling trucks in our facility, two 12-foot box trucks and one 10-foot box truck. And each truck has a driver and a helper, and they go out with empty recycling cans in the morning. There's a Tommy lift on the back of the truck, and they pick up full recycling cans and trade them out. So everybody got their route. The 12-foot box truck goes to a big area. Another 12-foot box truck goes to a big area. And the little 10-foot box truck, the sports car of recycling trucks, its job is to mostly go around our main administration area where there's uh, more congestion, a little tighter. A smaller truck is actually a really good idea. 
So the first two crews, the two 12 foot box trucks leave and start their day. And the two guys that are in the 10 foot box truck go out to their truck and they do a walk around just like they're supposed to. And then they open the door to get in the truck and a family of mice have moved from their summer home to their winter home. They'd moved from outside to the inside of that truck. And so there was a bunch of mice living on the floorboard of the 10 foot recycling box truck. So our guys do exactly what they're instructed to do. It's not that they're scared of mice. Don't get me wrong. They're as macho as the next uh, recycling truck driver. There's something called the Hantavirus. And the Hantavirus is a, a respiratory illness that is, uh, that is obtained by inhaling aerosolized mouse urine. And so when they saw these mice, they knew they had a biohazard issue, and they called our rodent control people to come and do the cleanup. Now, believe it or not, the top priority for the rodent control people is not the recycling truck. So they said, we can't clean it today, and we're probably not going to get there tomorrow, but the, we can probably be there Wednesday. So the two guys go back in the warehouse, and they say, hey, the truck's got mice in it. The supervisor says, oh, okay, it's out of service. They'll clean it on Wednesday. And then he says, ugh, I got to call out and see if everybody else has mice as well. So he grabs the radio, and he says, anybody got mice in their truck? Everybody comes back and says, no, we're clean. And then he says, I'm going to take the 10-foot box truck out of service on the recycling side. You two 12-foot trucks, if you have time and space in the vehicle, on your way back to the warehouse, stop by the main administration building. Everybody agrees, and everybody does their work. Towards the end of the day, one of those 12-foot box trucks is coming back, and they think, we got some space, we got some time, and we're right, right by the main administration building. We'll just swing in and pick up some recycling. So they go to the main administration building and they're going to go to the back dock, which is where the truck fits perfectly, except there'd been a water main break that weekend and the back parking lot was closed because they were excavating and replacing this rather large water main. So the guys think, well, um, maybe we'll go to the front. So they go to the front of our main administration building. Now, our main administration building was built by a committee of military people during World War II in a hurry. So to say that building is ugly would be probably a compliment. It's, it's an ugly, it's really an ugly building. It's functional, but it's not beautiful. And several years ago, somebody made the decision that we should really try to give that building a facelift. So they took this big, ugly building and they painted it brown. So here's a little hint. If you have an ugly building and you paint it brown, at the end of this experiment, what you're left with is a big, ugly brown building. And unfortunately, it's the building where all the bosses sit. So everybody started calling it the Brown Palace, which has a whole nother series of jokes we can talk about later. But the Brown Palace is really famous and it's really ugly. So a couple years prior to that, they decided that maybe what they needed to do is put an awning on the front of the building, kind of like a Hampton Inn style awning. You know, that'll really beef the building up and make it look super, super, super professional. So they brought in a crew and they built an awning on that building and they built it right in the front of the building over the front entrance. So these guys are driving along the side of the Brown Palace and they're going to turn to drive into the front of the Brown Palace and they're going to park their vehicle in front of that awning and they're going to pick up recycling. And as they drive across the front of the building, they see a sign on that awning that says 12-foot clearance. Now, they know their truck is a 12-foot box truck. And the reason they know that is because they drive 12-foot box trucks, but also there's a brand new sticker, still kind of smells like plastic on the dashboard, that says, don't hit overhead objects with your vehicle. This vehicle's maximum height is 12 feet. 12-foot truck, 12-foot clearance. Let me say that again, just in case you missed it. 12-foot truck, 12-foot clearance. What would you do? I want to introduce two concepts to you that we haven't talked about much. One is the notion of operational ambiguity. What seems really, really clear in the planning stage, I mean crystal clear in the planning stage, let's put a sign that says 12-foot clearance, that'll save problems, right? In the actual operation stage, oftentimes is much more ambiguous. 
in fact, I would suggest, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, had that sign said 11 foot, 11 inches clearance, they would not have had a problem. The challenge is, is that 12 foot truck and 12 foot clearance is as much a green light as it is a red light. And if you're thinking, well, they, they, they probably gave a little latitude in that metric, right? They probably didn't measure. It's probably a little higher than 12 feet. Then you might even have a renewed sense of confidence. So they do something that's pretty remarkable. I would say not unusual. And in fact, I would bet you maybe some of you even thought about this. There's two people in this truck. There's a driver and a helper. So the driver turns to the helper and he says these words. Ready? Jump out there and spot me. Right? And that makes good sense, doesn't it? I mean, he's putting a control in the system, and they're going to know really quickly if it fits or not. They don't have to let the air out of the tires. This could actually be a pretty good idea. So the, the passenger jumps out, and he stands underneath the awning, and he looks towards the driver. So he has eyes on the hazard. He can see the overhead hazard, and he can see the driver, and he waves his hands and says, come on in. And the truck slowly creeps in. And it gets to the awning, and it fits. In fact, it fits perfectly. In fact, as it comes up to the spotter, because I don't know if you know this, but international rules of being a spotter means you shouldn't walk one more step than you have to. As soon as the truck lines up with the spotter, he opened the door and jumped in. Now, I'm going to introduce the second thing that's really important for you, and that's the notion of confirmation bias. So when you go to the field to watch something happen, if what you think is supposed to happen is happening, then there's really nothing more to look for. And the idea that confirmation bias, we see what we want to see, is a very, very strong force. And because the truck fit, there's really no need to spot any longer because... Obviously, 12-foot truck, 12-foot clearance, we're going to be fine. So the truck continues under that awning, and it hits the first sprinkler head, and then it hits the second sprinkler head, and then it hits the third sprinkler head, and then it hits the fourth and final sprinkler head because no job is worth doing halfway. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen a box truck hit a sprinkler head, but it is quite a dramatic release of water times four, it's a deluge. I mean, it, that's the definition, a deluge. And the problem for these guys is not that they just turn this awning into our brand new 12-foot box washing station. The problem is those dumb sprinkler heads were interlocked to the fire protection system in the main administration building. And so all the alarms in the entire building went off. And every single person in that building exited through the emergency doors which meant every single person saw a 12-foot box truck stuck underneath the brand new awning that had just hit four sprinkler heads. There was no hiding this one. And the saddest part is all the bosses, the guys with the good shoes who actually cared about where they walked, they had to walk through water to see this happen. And this was a problem. Now, I was out of town. I was actually in Amsterdam giving a paper and my phone rang like six times in a row. And I was acting like I wasn't getting the phone calls because I'm in Amsterdam. Uh, what can I do, right? Work hard. But after about the sixth time, I thought, maybe, you know, maybe I should answer this. And I picked up the phone and it's my big boss. It's the director of the facility. And he said, we had an, another event. And I said, what happened? And he said, well, these guys hit a bunch of sprinkler heads in front of the main administration building with a 12-foot box truck. And I said... So what are you going to do about it? He says, we're going to take some action. I said, give me a minute. Let me do some research. And then I acted like I was doing, I was killing time. I wasn't really doing anything. And I came back and I said, I just did a Google search. Nobody in the history of mankind has ever knocked a sprinkler head off a building with a 12-foot box truck on purpose. It's an accident. And if you punish these guys for having this accident, it's going to have a lot of damage. And my boss said to me, I have to do something. Because if we don't take action... <laughs> The stand down we did the week prior is meaningless and we look stupid. And I said, what are you going to do? And he said, we're going to terminate the driver. 
We're going to terminate the spotter. And we're going to terminate the warehouse manager. We're going to send a loud and clear signal that we're serious about not hitting things with the top of our vehicles. And I said, that's the stupidest plan I've ever heard. That will cause more damage and you will be sorry you did it. You guys have learned because you've been supervisors for a long time. You learn pretty early in your supervisor journey when your contributions to a meeting are no longer very wanted or valued, right? I mean, we all know that lesson. You can kind of, they give you a look, kind of the shut up now look. I learned that day that I was not welcome in this conference call because at that point, my boss hung up on me. And I felt really bad about it because three people lost their job. That's story two. This is the story I want to tell you. Exactly one week later, uh, almost to the minute, a 12-foot box truck leaves an office furniture and supply company. And it leaves at 3.45 in the morning because they have to drive 100 miles. Then they have to go through the exploding truck inspection area. And it's Monday morning, so there'll be a big line. And that's going to take a couple hours. And then the driver and the helper have to go through our badge office to get security clearances to go onto our site. So they leave extra early and they drive the 100 miles and they get through the exploding test inspection area and they get through the badge office. And now at about 8.15, almost four hours later, they're driving their truck to deliver these file cabinets to the main administration building at our facility, the Brown Palace. And they pull to the back lot because the back dock is where they can unload these. That's where everything's unloaded. But it's the weirdest thing, you guys. There'd been a water main break the week before. And today's the day they were putting new asphalt on the back parking lot from the replacement water main they put in. So the parking lot was closed pretty much all morning and maybe part of the afternoon. So the guys think, well, we've driven all the way up here. We got up at 345 in the morning. We've got a job ticket that says deliver it to this building. Let's try the front door. So they drive along the side of the Brown Palace and then they turn to the front of the, and they're driving along the front of the Brown Palace and they're driving in their 12 foot box truck and they see a sign on this awning that says 12 foot clearance, 12 foot box truck, 12 foot clearance. So the driver says to the helper, Hey, jump out and spot me. And he says, sure, no problem. And he runs out there and he stands underneath the awning and he looks at the driver and he looks at the awning and he says, come on in. And the truck comes in. It's the weirdest thing. You guys, the truck fits. It fits perfectly. And so the spotter jumps in because no spotter ever wants to walk one step further than they have to. And they drive underneath that awning and bang, 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 bang. Four sparkling brand new fire suppression sprinkler heads were knocked off in a row perfectly. All four are gone. Water goes everywhere and the fire alarms go off in the building. I'm sitting in my office looking pretty because it's Monday, that's what I do, and my phone rings. And it's the administrative assistant for the director of my facility. And she's been a friend of mine for a long time. And she says, hey, Todd, the director would like to see you at 2.30. And I said, why? Well, we had another box truck event in front of our office. And I said, so he wants to meet me at 2.30? And she said, yes. And I said, tell him I'm busy. And she said, no. I'm not going to do that. You have to come. And then she said, if I have to come and get you, I will. I said, okay, I'll be there at 2.30. So at 2.30, I go to my boss's office. It's a lot like going to the principal's office. I'm sitting in the little uh, waiting area. And he comes out of the door and he says, Todd, I'm glad you made it. Come on in. And I walk towards his office and I walk in and the weirdest thing happened. He closes the door behind him as we walk into the office. That's not a good sign. Because that means we're going to be there a while, and he must have some serious stuff he wants to tell me. And I walk towards his desk, and he says, let's not sit at the desk. Let's sit over here on the couch. Now, I don't know if your boss has a couch in his office, but let me tell you guys, if you, if you don't have a boss with a couch in his office, the couch is where the bad conversations happen. You, you, the good conversations happen in the hallway. The bad, when they bring you in and set you on the couch, they're going to tell you something bad. 
And then there's this whole two guys on a couch thing. I don't know if you guys know about this, but that is just socially awkward at every level. Because two guys on a I don't know. Are we crossing our legs? Are we not crossing our legs? Do I look over my shoulder? Am I supposed to turn on the couch and put one knee up? I mean, what am I supposed to do here, right? So we finally settle into this couch. And then he looks at me, you guys. And he takes his hands and he puts them like he's in prayer at his lips. And I think, oh, my God. I don't know what's going to happen. But he shut the door. We're on the couch. And he's praying before he starts talking. This is not going to end well. And then he turns to me and he says, Todd, I just have one question for you. And I said, yes, because I was pretty nervous. I had no idea what he's going to say. And he looked at me and he said, did you pay those box truck drivers to knock those sprinklers off the second time? And I said, no, sir, I didn't, but only because I didn't think of it. And then he turned to me and he said this. He said, we drifted to a place where we started asking the wrong questions. And I knew at that moment we were going to be okay. And the reason I think this story is important to what I'm going to talk about today, and this was a lot of work to, you know, you guys had to sit through a bunch of stuff right there, right? Is that I actually think that quote may be the best management feedback indicator I've ever received in my entire career. Because as soon as he said, we drifted to the place where we started asking the wrong questions, I, I knew that everything was recoverable and that in a restorative way, we could move forward from this. It, it sort of gave permission to actually have a conversation that I probably could not have had beforehand. And it's interesting because Charles said that the answers are different to the same questions. I would actually challenge you guys as a part of the three days you have in this conference to think about that. Because I would suggest one of the most powerful things we have is not in having answers. In fact, I don't know how you feel, but I don't really know very much. I mean, uh, I don't think I've got that much going on. But one thing I am is curious. And that curiosity, I think, has helped me craft better questions. And better questions automatically get better answers. And so one of the things I think about when I think about the world changing and the answers needing to be different is that maybe it's time that we look seriously at the questions that we're asking. This story is interesting. These three stories are interesting, I guess, because they happened. So it's always better when the stories are real. That, that makes kind of a difference. They're easier to tell when you make them up, though. I'll just say that for you in case you're wondering. But it's also interesting because this became a real turning point in leadership at my facility becoming curious in a different way. And that's what I think we want to do is help people to become curious in a different way. And that's really a part of this idea of these three big changes. But to talk about these three changes, I think we have to talk a little bit about change. And this is a pretty good meeting to talk about change because lots of things are changing, right? I including the name of the organization. And where I go when I'm desperate for answers and I seek answers because I see operational confusion in an organization is almost always the same place. I don't know if you've got your sort of go-to people, your go-to material that you lean on when you need it especially bad, but I do. And the man's name is Edgar Schein. And if you don't know of Edgar Schein, well, today's kind of a big day because you need to know of Edgar Schein. He's remarkably important in the work you do. If you do know who Edgar Schein is, then this is kind of like the choir practicing on Wednesday night. I mean, we need the opportunity to sort of reground ourselves back in what Shine says. And one of the most important models that Shine's ever made, and he made it years ago, this is not his most novel or contemporary work. In fact, this is kind of the work that started him, was an understanding of how change and culture influence organizations. And he really starts with a very interesting foundation. And he says, that if you look at the people who are in the organization and that who, in fact, are the organization, they make up the organization, people start with a foundation of belief. And one of the things we've done, whether you know it or not, is really helped people change the way they believe. So when we talk about the fact that what we do is not a program, you've all had this conversation 
that we don't have anything shiny, you know, that we don't have a card with nine things to do tomorrow. I mean, we have those cards because we love those cards, but we don't really bring to the table answers. One of the reasons we don't bring to the table answers is this shiny notion that everything starts with a belief system. And you can define belief. I mean, I think you know what a belief is. A belief is something that you hold to be true and you don't need a lot of evidence to prove it. Like I believe bacon is God's gift to the meat category. I believe that's true and I don't need a lot of proof to reinforce that belief. I will hold that for a long, I've held it for a long time. I will hold it for even a longer time. I think the reason I'm fixated on bacon is a friend of mine said he has a store that he goes to where they cook 10 pounds of bacon and put it in Ziploc bags and he puts it in his refrigerator. Okay, now that's bacon you don't even have to cook. That's a whole new level of bacon appreciation that I didn't even know existed until this morning. So it's kind of a big day. Shine says that this belief system is fundamental to the way people respond within the organization. Now we can have a big debate and we probably should whether workers have free agency, free will to act any way they want to in the organization or whether workers are part of a larger system where much of their outcomes are predetermined by the organization culture and structure. But it's all gonna start, no matter which direction you go, with a fundamental belief system. And Shine says that belief system is important because what it does is it influences values. So beliefs are foundational to values. But we should take a moment and sort of talk about what a value is. Because if a belief is something you hold as true and need no evidence in which to hold as true, then what the value system is, is really the things you do based upon that belief system. The things you'll do, the things you'll use your life's energy to accomplish based upon that belief system. So if you have a strong foundation in bacon, right? That's your belief system. Then your value system is you're gonna be at places that serve bacon. So if you go to a restaurant and you open the menu and it says, we're all vegan, that's not a bad restaurant. I'm not against that restaurant. It's just not aligned with my value system. And so I will have to find another place that has bacon on the menu, right? And values are pretty significant because values are really what programs for years and years and years have tried to influence. So behavioral based programs, programs that really consciously talk about engaging the hearts and minds of the workforce. What they're doing is they're trying to really leverage this notion of a value set. Now, the interesting things about value and belief is that value and belief then actually influence action. You could call this behavior if you want to. You could call it sort of the actual auditable things people do. And Shine's notion is, is that the beliefs actually create the value set and the value set then will influence the action. So if you're following along at home and it looks like from the video, most of you are, you're probably going to pick up on the fact that this is the A side of the ABC model. Okay. We're not talking about consequence at all. We're talking about all the sort of profound antecedents that exist in why workers do what they do, or more importantly, how organizations function the way they function. And then Shine sort of throws a little pickle in this, and it's a pretty good pickle to throw into it because I think it's pretty accurate. He says, there's kind of a funky line between action and value. And that funky line really represents the idea of observable and non-observable. So here's a little quiz for you. Which one of these things is observable? Giving you a moment to answer that. So here's how it'll work. I'll ask you questions. I'll look at you lovingly. That's what's going on right now. Do you feel it? That's love coming at you. There it is right there, right? Okay. And then the second question is, is which two of these things are unobservable? I've tried to make that question as easy as I possibly can for you. I, I hope you uh, follow through with that. And Shine says the most interesting part of 
of action is the fact that two thirds of the motivation that people have for those actions is non-observable. So when we say we're not a program, it's a paradigm shift, it's a philosophy, we're sort of capturing Shine's notion that what we're influencing is not directly the action of the people who make up the organization. What we're actually influencing at a deeper level is their belief system, which influences their value system, which thusly creates the outcomes that we see. And probably you guys, if you think about this, that's probably how every change has ever happened ever. And it certainly is a really good example of how change has happened in society. And not to belabor the pandemic, but I actually think it's a really important data set for us to understand. And if we're not doing after action learning in our organizations, we're really screwing up because the opportunity to sort of understand what we just went through and to learn from it and improve is rich. And I realize that there's a big push to get back to normal as soon as possible but I'm relatively certain normal's not there anymore. And my friend who's the chief practicing psychologist for a large beverage company located in Atlanta, you'll have to sort of figure out which one that is. He tells me that he thinks the actual recovery process will be really pretty difficult from a mental health standpoint for the workforce that we represent. And I know at least in my experience, and I hate to say this because it feels like a plug, but next Saturday's podcast is around the notion that we're seeing whole entire groups of people who have become incredibly risk adverse. And I think they came by it honestly, because I think the world had a lot of risk and people responded to that risk the way they thought was best for themselves and the families they're a part of. Now, the reason this is so rich is because what shifted during this pandemic to a great extent was our belief system. What shifted in your organization is the belief system. And in fact, maybe most profoundly for us, what shifted in your leadership is their belief system. And once they sort of lost the fact that they could strategically predict the future in order to control the future, right? Because that's what leaders want to do that put a lot of uncertainty at the C-suite level of our organization. It's not unlike when an organization has a significant catastrophic loss, like a fatality. One of the things that's so profound about a fatality within an organization is that it erodes the confidence in the leaders in their belief that they can actually manage high-risk work safely. And one of the first things we have to do in our work is to actually help rebuild, restore that confidence in leadership because leaders that lack confidence aren't the kind of leaders we need because then accountability is driven down towards the workforce and not pulled up over the leadership suite. What's remarkable is that shine doesn't stop here. Although I would suggest between you and I, you could probably stop here. This is a pretty rich little cartoon. This, this explains a lot. And it helps us understand how to facilitate change successfully, because if you want change to be successful, you must first influence the belief system, which again, is exactly the work that you've done your entire career. But Shine takes it one step further and he says, the organization then is a function of these things. And in fact, actions create the organizational culture and the organizational culture influences the individual worker belief. Now, I'm wide open and super interested, and I mean that. I'm not even buttering you up. That'll come later. I'm super interested in whether you think this is a closed system or whether it's an open system. Because I would suggest in a closed system, this makes a lot of sense for most organizations. But I would also suggest there's outside forces that dramatically impact things like belief systems or dramatically impact things like organizational behavior or culture. That's sort of Shine's term for organizational culture. And the thing about culture, again, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, is that what scares me most and what I'm seeing really frighteningly often right now 
is the belief that somehow we must fix the culture to restore our ability to go back into the workplace. And, and when organizational leaders say that, that's an immediate data set for us because what that means is they think that culture is something you can control. But I would suggest culture is an outcome. And that's what Shine says. It's an outcome of the individual beliefs and culture always exists. It doesn't not exist. It's always there. And culture is really not a tool that we can tweak in order to create change. If we were going to do that, we'd really need to probably treat, tweak behaviors, which would tweak values, which would tweak actions, which would change cultures. And, and again, this is what you've seen in every single success, big or little, that you've had on this journey in the work you do. And what's so valuable about this idea is I think the ability for us to reroute back in this fundamental thinking that the world's changed a lot, but these first principles on how people perform and how organizations function, they haven't changed so much. There's still a robust framework by which we can make sense of the world that's happening around us. And it helps us by reinforcing the fact that what we're really doing at a fundamental level with leadership across the board in our organization is influencing their belief system. So when we say workers are not the problem to control, workers are actually a solution to understand and listen, what we're doing is not influencing their actions because I'm not sure what that looks like action-wise. I mean, I guess we could talk about learning teams and better investigations. We can talk about a bunch of stuff and we will. I mean, that's why I'm here. But what I really think we're doing is shifting the way the leaders believe the workforce functions within their organization. And that's a really powerful part of what we do and, and how we think about the world. And so where's this take us? Well, given this as kind of the background, which is exactly what it is. I mean, it's just a background. It's a, it's a foundation. It's a, it's a cartoon upon which we'll build our discussion. Let's talk about these three big changes. And, and let's start first with this idea of changing definitions. So do me a favor, right there where you are, sitting in the comfort of your beautiful home office with maybe a, a cinnamon roll, warm right out of the oven, sitting next to you, like a pillow. Only don't use it as a pillow, eat it. Also, don't eat pillows. That's another story. I want you to imagine for me that you're going to define something. And what I want you to define is nothing. I, I mean, honestly, nothing. But I want you to use no value of either light or dark to define what nothing looks like. You can't use gray because that's clearly a value of both light and dark. But if I ask you, what does nothing look like? And you can't use any value of light or dark, any color, any hue. How would you define nothing? You know what nothing is. I mean, you're actually an expert in nothing. In fact, if you're like me, I've spent most of my career honing my ability to do nothing to a very, very sharp point. I mean, I've worked it pretty hard. The crazy thing about that question, and that is, by the way, sort of your first time ever smoking pot question that you'd ask, not that any of you would understand that, but if you live in a state where it's okay and you try pot for the first time, that question will arise somewhere in the conversation. That question is really an important question because it helps us illustrate the idea that the language we use to describe the world is in fact the language that defines the world. And there's a hypothesis that's quite famous called the wharf sapir hypothesis. And it says something really profound for us to think about. And that is that meanings for words are not in the words, they're in the people. And so the words we use to describe what happens, either positive or negative, success or failure, whatever it is we're talking about and describing, those words themselves bring with them a set of limitations. And language is kind of tricky, which is why the struggle to think about what we're called as a group has not been an easy journey. I mean, I don't know the background, Charles, but I'm guessing 
there were several meetings and lots of raw emotions around this. It kind of feels like that would be the case. I mean, I know that I've certainly pissed off a lot of our fellow members with some feelings I have around the word cause, right? What's interesting and important for me to remember is that those feelings I have around my definition of the word cause, those are my interpretations of the language. And the language itself either provides the opportunity for an organization to blossom and grow or for an organization to become limited. It's kind of like bias. It's, it's always there. And what's remarkable about this idea is that we're in a position where what we deal with becomes really interesting. So let me present one idea. And it's something you know, so it's not very shocking. And that is events or accidents or failures or operational upsets or screw ups or losses, they happen all the time, all the time. In your organizations right now, things are happening. The issue is, is that they're almost always typically handled by the people who do the work. And what's remarkable about that is that that idea is really a function of the language we use to define what a failure is or an accident or an event or whatever it is you choose to call them. I mean, different people have really strong opinions about what this is called. And what's amazing is, is that I would suggest one thing you know at the belief level is that the difference between a good idea and a bad idea is just the outcome. And that events could be successes if something different would have happened. And so oftentimes what I see is that organizations respond as if accidents happen to them. And the language they use is really almost the language of being a victim. We wish the workers would have done this better. We wish that supervisors would have caught this earlier. We wish they would have called stop work. And what's interesting is that even in conceptualizing the failure in that way, we've colored the path forward that the organization will take simply by the choice of how we describe the event. Now, you know, I don't have to tell you that when something happens, the organization chooses to either see it as a cost or an investment. The difference is profound because if they see it as a cost, then what happens is we go drifting back to the old school and we'll find blame, we'll punish, we'll actually determine culpability, we'll fix the person who screwed up and we'll move on. And the outcome there is that we will have learned nothing, which is fair. We probably didn't deserve to learn anything, but more profoundly is we will have fixed nothing because blame fixes nothing. In fact, blame stops improvement. In fact, blame stops questions. And so the power we have is really in the power in understanding how we define what it is we want. And we said earlier that I think one of the most significant parts of what we deal with is the fact that our people in our organizations see reliable and stable performance as an outcome that they'll achieve. That's a function of language because reliable and stable performance in an organization that has events all the time isn't about the absence of failure. It's about the presence of control. And one of the most valuable lessons that I think this group has taught me, and you guys are enormously influential in the world, you really are, is the fact that you don't make a system better by taking away the bad things. You make a system better by actually dramatically increasing the good things. That idea is a powerful function of this redefinition and the redefinition, this moving safety to a capacity, that's important because that's what influences the belief system. And that's where our power lies.
But don't think for a moment this is a one and done, that you'll redefine safety and be finished. You'll redefine reliability and be finished. You'll redefine stable operations and be finished. You'll redefine quality or environmental compliance or whatever it is you manage and be done. It's not like that. It's a constant understanding that it's not looking for the deficiencies in the system. It's understanding the strength of the system and then amplifying that strength as effectively as you can. That makes an enormous difference. And to an extent, I think that really helps us understand that first change. So when people come and say, what should we do immediately to change the organization? which people ask you this question all the time, I think the very first thing you say is, let's change the language we use to describe the work we do. And in changing the language we use to describe the work we do, we will then change the belief systems that we have, which will change the value systems that we have, which will then change the way we do work. I've said it to you before, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, I really think the two things we influence most are confidence and capacity. If organizations believe they can be the most reliable organization in the world, you know what happens? They fulfill that self-fulfilling prophecy. They become really reliable. The way we get good is to believe we can be good. I promise you the counter notion of that is always true. If you don't think you can improve, you probably won't. And the capacity part, well, that will never finish. Because preparatory capacity is really difficult. Because it's impossible to create capacity when you need it. It's too late. But it's expensive and burdensome and takes a lot of finely honed political prowess to get the resources, time, and availability to create capacity before you need it. Although that said, I actually think we're in a position where that conversation is easier to have than it ever has been before. Which takes us to the second big change. The second big change is we have to change the way we learn. And I guess you could say change questions. That's what I chose, but this was a big deal. You could say change investigations because that actually would resonate with us pretty well. You could definitely say change the way we learn, which I actually think is probably a better choice given the new name and all. I probably should have changed that slide really quickly during the break, but I didn't, right? But ultimately, I think there's a couple things we want to know. And that is first and foremost, the power of the question. So if you haven't read a guy named David Cooper writer, He's from Case Western University. He's someone that you probably want to look into because years and years ago, he started a process to help groups problem solve. And the process is called appreciative inquiry. Now, I don't know how much you know about appreciative inquiry. They used to call it AI, but then a whole new AI came in and kind of ruined that AI. So now they're back to appreciative inquiry. Appreciative inquiry is a really interesting way to gather information from a group of people. And the premise is really simple. Let me sort of illustrate it for you. In the old days in our organizations, if we were gonna help a group solve a problem, generally what I would do is I would go in and facilitate some kind of discussion. And I'd probably have two flip charts, one on either side of me. And I would bring everybody in and make sure they're comfortable. I'd talk about the problem we were gonna to try to solve that day. And then I would say, okay, define for me our current state. What sucks now? And at first it would be kind of slow, but eventually after the ball got rolling, people would just dump bile as fast as they can, as fast as I could write on the flip chart. And before we took our first break, I'd probably have five or six full flip chart pages of everything that sucked in the organization. And the more they talk about one thing sucking, the more other things start sucking. And it sort of steamrolls, snowballs, I guess is a better way to say it. So you have a giant list of what sucks. And then I would try to bring that 
discussion to a close. It'd be hard, but I'd get it done. And then I'd take a break. And the group would leave for a while. And I'd tell them 15 minutes, but they'd take like 30 because they're all wound up on everything that sucks. And then 30 minutes later, they'd come back together and I'd say, okay, let's go to the other flip chart and let's vision what we want ourselves to be in the future. What do we want to be? And then slowly but surely, we'd write five or six things on the chart. We'd then look at some action planning and we'd uh, assign them. And then the meeting would be over and chances are really high, nothing would happen. I mean, that's pretty much how they all ended. Cooper Ryder said, you know, we can do this better. We can see the people not as the problem, but as the solution. And why don't we just forego the whole bile dump? And so what he said is, what we ought to do is when we bring a group of people together to solve a problem, we ought to write three questions, break them up into pairs, and have them answer each other's question and take notes, and then bring that information together. And the questions are really simple. The first one asks you to define what success looks like in your organization. So the first question Cooper Ryder would say to ask is, think of a time when you did a project that was really successful. How come? Who did what? How did you communicate? How did accountability move? How were you supported? What environment existed that allowed you to be successful? And suddenly you start to build this list of all the things that were present in a project that you did, that you owned, that you're proud of, that you were a part of, that was successful. And that list is powerful. And then he said, give him a second question. And the second question is, is what did you bring to this project that gave the project life? What skills, abilities, and knowledge did you add to this project that allowed the project to be successful? And if you're asked that by somebody and you're thinking of a project that's real, it might be awkward at first, but you'll think of things to say. And what's interesting, if you remember five minutes ago, what you're identifying is really a value set. And suddenly you're below that line of visibility and you're talking about things that you bring to the table that actually helped make a difference in the success of that project. And then the third question is given a world without resistance, unlimited time, money, energy, M&Ms, and toilet paper, what would you do tomorrow? What would you do next week? What would you do next month? And what Cooper Ryder did was actually tap in to the solution side, the confidence side of the equation without the loss of both attitude and time on the what sucks part. And I've done these a thousand times, or probably, I bet more than a thousand times. And the most interesting thing to me is that the more technical the group is, the better this process works. You would think this process would work really well with like the HR cats. You know, they like to hold hands and let's hug first before we get in and, and right. But this is a little hard for them. But hi, a room full of engineers, they get right after it. And what you're left with then is a flip chart that has the components necessary to be successful. That's the first question. An understanding of what the group's shared values are. That's the second question. And a path forward, divided into immediate, near-term, and long-term solutions. And in about an hour, you will have gathered more data than you could check a stick at. I'm not really sure what that means, but it's pretty commonly used in Western Kansas, which is God's chosen country, just in case you're wondering. What Cooper Ryder gets to in this use of appreciative inquiry is the power of the question. And, and that's really important, that when you work with a group, the most important thing you do, the most sacred moment is when you craft the question 
that the group's going to ask. Because remember, the enemy of the question is the answer. So as soon as you start solving the problem, you're no longer analyzing the problem because we can't really learn and perform at the same time. I mean, we're really bad at it. We're in fact, terrible at it. We have to really keep the curiosity, the inquiry, the listening as high as we possibly can, because I'll take it one step further. This is just for us. The enemy of the investigation is the corrective action. But we've got a problem. And the problem is, is it's way sexier to fix a problem than it is to analyze a problem. And you work in an organization that's filled with people who are aligned towards fixing problems. And those people who are good at fixing problems always believe they know the problem before the problem is analyzed. And so one of the challenges you have, for instance, in corrective actions, is that your corrective action program probably fixes the wrong things very effectively. I mean, that's how most of our corrective action programs work. That's not a function of a bad corrective action program. In fact, I would suggest the corrective action program is functioning quite well. That's a function of bad analysis. Those are bad questions. And bad questions lead to bad answers. The challenge is, is our organizations really want to fix things fast. We want seductively unambiguous information. But we know that that's not true. Remember, when the organization's pushing back on you, it's not the organization, it's the question you're asking. When you see good people suffering to do their work, it's not the people, it's the system. And those ideas are really, really an important part of the bigger, deeper understanding of what we bring to the table. Because ultimately, knowing less does not make you smarter. Let me just say that again in case you're thinking about getting a tattoo. This would be a really good one on your left butt cheek. Can I say butt cheek, Charles? That's not too, that's not too blue? Okay. Oh, it's perfect. Okay. So knowing less does not make you smarter. And, and we've learned this dramatically through the pandemic is that choosing to not know is not a reasonable strategy to move forward. In fact, knowing is always better than not knowing because knowing less doesn't make you smarter or safer. And so what I've really done, at least in my career, is pretty simple. I mean, it's, this isn't rocket science by any stretch of the imagination. I've realized that the power exists in formulating the curiosity. And so maybe the biggest improvement that ever happened in my organization was this shift. Shifting the organization's thinking from who failed to what failed. This is as simple as can be. I mean, this is, this is uh, there's nothing very difficult about this idea except that most of our processes and practices and systems that we have are absolutely aligned in the opposite direction. And in fact, when we start by looking at the behavior, because the answer is the enemy of the question, we almost never get the ability to look at the system because we'll find deficiency in the behavior that we can determine to be causal and it answers the question of why the bad thing took place. Now, knowing that and being able to frame that language because language controls thought, right? That helps us understand how to move the organization forward. And the craziest thing about this is, is that when you start with the system and then work towards the behavior, you almost never have to go to the behavior. Because by the time you've effectively described the system that allowed the failure to succeed with some consequence, it's almost the point where you want to apologize and restore the workers on the sharp end of the stick because in many ways, we created the perfect setup for this failure to transpire. That's a powerful part 
of what we think about. Which sort of concludes that second big change. So let's review. Change one is that we change our definition. We, we change the way we talk about what success is, right? So what I always say is safety is not the absence of an accident. It's the presence of capacity. You know this. Change two is that we really change the way we ask questions and we change the way we learn, which influences informal learning, ad hoc learning, critiques, evaluations, audits, assessments, validations, verifications, and even investigations. And we shift our focus so that we start with the system because if we start with the system, then that allows us to understand the deeper context that really created an environment where the conditions existed for the failure to succeed. And that leads us to three. And three, you can make it say whatever you want to, you guys, because uh, you're the bosses of your own future. But I actually think at least at this point in time, and this will change, how often within seven years, Charles, it'll change. I really think what we're doing is not changing the way managers respond to failure or not changing the way the organization responds to failure. Although I think those are, are valid points and actually very, very effective discussion points. What I really think we're doing is changing accountability. And we're moving accountability so that it is no longer a one-way force that goes down the organization, holding the person with the least amount of influence over the system most accountable for the success or failure of that system. Mostly, they step up to the plate and make it succeed, but they do some pretty Herculean things to make it happen. And in fact, accountability is something that I think as a group, we should think about the way we define. Because I, I think really, in my journey, I would tell you that accountability is a partnership and that it really begins with leadership and then through handshake and agreement is shared with the workforce. But accountability is kind of tricky because it, it gets confused with the word culpability. It gets confused with the word blame pretty readily. In, in fact, most of the people you deal with probably don't see a discernible difference between accountability, blame, and culpability. They just don't. And that's a function of how we use the language, right? What's crazy is we know something fundamentally. You're not going to fix safety by fixing safety. Uh, we know that. You're not going to fix reliability by fixing reliability. You're going to actually go deeper into the, your organization's systems and really build capacity in that system for tolerance of variation. That, that's really valuable. But I've really been dealing with this a lot the last couple of years. And one thing's become very profound to me is that when I talk to organizations that are struggling, I hear the language of workers making bad choices, which is the language of accountability moving down the organization, right? These workers made bad choices. They failed to follow. You know, you know what they sound like. I don't even have to listen for it. You guys are experts, right? One of the things about that is, is I actually think making bad choices is a pretty good indicator of our current definition of accountability. I also think it's fundamentally wrong because when we learn, investigate, critique, understand, listen, what we find is it's not so much the workers are making bad choices, but in fact, it's the fact that workers are having bad choices. And what's amazing about the difference between making bad choices and having bad choices is really that very definition of accountability, right? Because if they're making bad choices, the workers are accountable for the choices they make. But if they're choosing the lesser of three evils, if they're in that position and every one of your workers have been there where they can either follow the procedure or do the work, that actually is having bad choices. And that changes the direction that accountability moves. It no longer is moving down at the worker. It's actually now moving up into the system. And the organization must think about what that means. And where it goes is it's something that Decker's been saying for years. And that is we must stop seeing workers as problems to be controlled. What we want to see workers as are solutions to harness. 
But accountability changes things pretty dramatically. And what it changes is really this relationship between risk and control. So we know if risk is greater than control, the system's out of balance. And all of us share this. So I don't have to sell you on this idea at all. What we want is to align risk and control. The only people that can align risk and control permanently, systemically, organizationally, culturally, if you will, are the people who actually are accountable for the functioning of the organizational system. And so if you think about it, I mean, the quick answer is that I think accountability becomes the discussion that's had before the failure takes place. And so one way to think about this is to say, are we having the discussion of the shared sense of fate our organization has before something bad takes place? Because if we're having it before something bad takes place, it really isn't about blame. It's about who is responsible to whom. Who owns what? Who will do which thing? And what's interesting is that's really that shared sense of accountability. And that's the opportunity to talk about things like, what do I do if I get into a position where I really must either obey the rule or not do the work? Ultimately, what I think changes in the way we think about how accountability moves in the organization or how leaders respond or react to failure is really right back to that definition of failure. Because what you do in sort of a resilient standpoint, kind of a David Woods comment part of this, is that ultimately you keep failure from succeeding. And the ability to keep failure from succeeding becomes a really important part of what we think about. Because ultimately, if you think about it, and, and Charles said this earlier, and I think it's actually, Charles, I think you did a better job than I'm going to do at it, is that ultimately leadership is not about this idea of discovering deficiencies. It's just not. What leadership is about is actually the ability to assure success. And that this idea changes to a great extent who we hold in account, who is accountable for what takes place. So that's important and that's vital and it makes a difference. And those three things, changing how we define success, changing how we talk about the work we do, the questions we ask, and then changing the way we respond as an organization, changing this notion of accountability makes a big difference, which leads me to the luxury of one last case study, which is kind of luxurious. Thanks for the time, Charles. You're the best. And this next case study, I think, is an interesting one. I actually have two versions of this. I have a long version and a short version. If the group is super boring and I find them tedious, and kind of stupid, I usually show the nine minute version. If the group is really good, I show the three and a half minute version. Luckily for me, I've got enough time to show you guys the nine minute version. So I think that's it. No, I'm not gonna, are you kidding? You're the best group ever. I wanna show you this case study because when it's done, it asks a question. And this question I think fundamentally ties back into the three big changes that I've illustrated. So without any further ado, watch carefully. This is your final case study for my presentation for your keynote. Here it comes. So this event takes place in a temporary loading platform for offshore support for natural gas wells in the Gulf of Thailand. And it was very temporary. It was set up on the beach and they dredged the beach so it was deep and steep and they could bring vessels in alongside where they had a construction crane on some concrete pads and they would load three vessels a day, pretty much six days a week. And they loaded every single load on every single vessel with something they call super sacks, big bags, one ton cloth bags. Now these one ton cloth bags are normally used for bulk 
items, granulated items like sand or dirt. But in this case, these guys would load everything into these big bags, these super sacks, and then they would rig those super sacks onto the crane hook. Boxes of equipment, maintenance items, food, probably people, but they said they never put people in there. Every single load, three loads a day, six days a week, was loaded into super sacks. The super sacks were rigged to the crane, and then they were taken through an exclusion area to the vessel to be unloaded on board the boat. If you load three loads a day, six days a week for eight years, and everything's the super sack, what you are is the world's best expert in loading super sacks. But what you don't know how to do is load anything that wouldn't fit into a super sack. And that's where this story takes a turn. Because for the event, this crew was asked to load an inline gas separation unit. It, it's basically a piece of equipment that's in a piece of pipe. It's long, skinny, and heavy. If you look up in the dictionary things that won't fit in a bag, the definition starts with long, skinny, and heavy. And so these workers were faced with a condition that was off normal and they had not faced before. They had to solve the problem. And so what they did was adapt. So instead of using the super sack like a bag, they decided that they could use that same super sack like a sling. So they found the middle of the piece of pipe and the, the way they found the middle was by calculating halfway the center of gravity, so the center of the piece of pipe. And then they wrapped the bag once around and then a second time around. So the handles of the super sack were pointed forward and they hooked those handles up to a crane. Then they took a piece of rope and tied some very tight knots to keep the bag as secure as possible. They lifted the bag with the crane and they started to move the load towards the boat. Now, the crane never moves because it's on a concrete platform on the beach. And the biggest hazard these workers have is suspended overhead load. Never want a person underneath a suspended overhead load. And because the crane never moves, the load always flies in the same place. And so what the guys did is they figured out long ago where the danger zone was. And in that danger zone, they put some small fences and some red X's on the beach. This kept people from beneath the suspended load while they loaded the crane. So they lift this pipe up and it's very curiously balanced and they start to swing the load towards the vessel. And what do you think happens next? You're right, it has to fall. Because if it doesn't fall, this is the dumbest story on earth. And it does, and it falls hard, and it hits the beach, and it breaks this piece of equipment into a lot of small pieces. Now, this will fit in a bag. But when it falls, it falls exactly where they predicted it would fall. It lands inside that exclusion zone. Operations halted because they broke a very important piece of equipment. But when it fell, it fell exactly where they predicted it would fall in case it fell. Nobody got hurt, but operations ceased. Here's my question for you. Is this a success or a failure? And that question is really influenced by those three big changes. How we determine and define what success is, right? Because if you're an ops person, this is a big fat failure, right? And God, the story behind this, I could go so far on this story, but they saw it as a huge failure, right? But if you're thinking about resilience and reliability, if you're thinking about what we do, it's a success. I mean, they identified the failure modality, they built controls in the system, they honored those controls, and when it failed, it failed the way they thought it would, and nobody got hurt. What's interesting to me is that that response is a choice, and it's really defined by how the organization defines success. Do accidents happen to us? Or do accidents happen as a part of our operational weaknesses or latent conditions or the way we have a system, right? The second thing 
that I think is significant is how we choose to investigate this is going to color the path forward that this means. And this could lead to terminations or it could lead to actually dramatic improvements or long-term changes in the way the system is done. But that's a function of sort of that second big change. And then the third change, and they're all sort of interrelated, is that how leaders react is going to color the path we move forward. And every event is kind of a choice. I know it's hard to understand, but choosing the direction we move makes a huge difference in how we improve. When something bad happens, you got two choices. You can blame and punish or learn and improve. So is the juice worth the squeeze? Is it worth it to actually go on the journey that we've been going on for so long? Is it worth it to have an organization that's 27 years old that is still growing and learning and morphing and changing? I think the answer is really simple. Yeah, it's not only worth it, it's vital to what we do. Because I think the most exciting part about us as a group is that next year we'll have a whole different load of crap to share with each other. And every year, the kind of crap we bring to the table gets smarter and better and more effective. Oh, I use crap uh, interchangeably with amazing, detailed, super poignant and intellectual information that is shared collectively throughout the community, which the acronym for that is crap, just in case you're wondering, right? This idea that the effort we're putting in is paying off is starting to really show. And to be honest with you guys, I'd be curious to what you think. I don't know if 15 years ago, I thought it would go this far. I'm pretty impressed with the way the world's changing. And I'm super impressed with the way you helped facilitate that change. And it's not just here, it's everywhere around the globe. That's a powerful part of what happens. Where this all takes us is right back to that definition. And I think the definition is really valuable. Stable operations is not indicated by the absence of uncertainty. We could not have gone through more uncertainty. I don't even know what else you would add to this story to give us more uncertainty. I mean, in the middle of the pandemic, we had killer hornets. We've had a locust plague. What the hell else can there be? I mean, a giant pizza crust shortage, that would be terrible, but I mean, that could happen, right? Stable operations for us is really indicated in the presence of resilience. That's what we manage. And I'm super excited because Ivan follows me and he talks about this idea. And I think it's a really powerful idea how the organization itself has the ability to design its safety culture. And if I know Ivan, and I do, you're going to see some of those very same shine ideas carry through this next discussion. Think about those three big changes. That's what I'm thinking about because at some point, I think that's got some power. You guys, thanks for the opportunity to talk with you. Did I do an okay enough job that I don't have to keynote next year, Charles? Because you know I'm being punished this year. This is punishment. Yeah, I don't know if it was that good. We'll see. Oh, oh crap. So thanks for your time. Good luck and have a fun meeting. I can't wait to sit in quietly on the side and see what happens. Thanks, man. Thank you, Todd. Todd, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much for the bacon image, as always. I love that. So I am thrilled to, I'm going to pass over some um, co-host rights to Ivan. So Ivan, you will be able to share out. If you just give me a moment, I will make you a co-host so you have that ability. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce um, Ivan, who's going to speak with us. Well, Todd already teed it up very, very nicely. Um, and Ivan, hopefully you have that ability now to share out. And yep, there we go. So Ivan, it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah, so thrilled to have you with us. Um, you know, I, Todd obviously teed up your, your presentation and discussion so well, but I'm really interested to hear more about your research and thinking on risk and safety and complex systems and, you know, building that kind of culture or the culture building itself. So thanks for joining us and thanks for taking the time. 
Thank you. I really appreciate being here. And uh, I don't think I could have had a better lead in than Todd's. Uh, he, he sure teed up exactly what I'm going to talk about. So uh, I guess without further ado, I'll just go ahead and get into it um, with the PowerPoint. Let's see from the start. Can you see that all right? Perfectly. Awesome. So uh, I'm about to lose the adjunct. I'd like to start there. So I've moved through a career of safety as an operator, and now I'm a professor at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And um, I'm going to talk with you today a little bit about self-designing a safety culture and some of the things that we learned and how this process is completely nonlinear. Um, but Todd really said something that's important that I'd like to springboard off of, and that is that Leadership becoming curious in a different way was a big learning that we had. In fact, the original ask that I had was to create a safety culture. And the problem that I ran into was that we had no unilateral definition of safety in the organization. So creating a safety culture seemed, something, seemed like something that was completely out of reach because it moved in so many different directions. So instead of that, what we started to do is we started to evaluate where we were and we started to see in sort of a meta study of the organization, what kinds of things we could move forward and what kinds of things we could agree on. And that's essentially the story that I'm gonna tell. Um, and it is a story. It's, it's almost exactly what, what Todd told us we should do. And that is kind of share a story with you guys. So that's what it's gonna be. My background, I actually started out before this, before this aviation career as a mine geologist and geophysicist. And I got this theory that any physicist that exists in society for any length of time will ultimately become a philosopher. And I guess that's the burden that I have to carry. So here I am a philosopher, uh, but I did start out as an operator. I started out flying Falcon jets, which is the, uh, air, which is the aircraft in the upper left-hand corner doing search and rescue missions. In fact, that one is deploying a, a rescue pump canister to a sinking vessel. Um, Below that is a C-130, which is the next aircraft that I moved to for the Coast Guard. And I, I flew active duty for the Coast Guard for 10 years. Um, then I moved to the Air Force Reserves and simultaneously to the U.S. Forest Service where I flew lead plane, which in the upper right-hand corner is the small airplane out in front of the tanker, suggesting, urging, showing maybe even where that tanker should drop. But the fundamental job there was safety, was to ensure that the tanker could get in and out of this low level operation without impacting terrain. And we had a pretty abysmal rate for many years um, of, of I'll, I'll say it, of failure in, in that endeavor. Um, we lost I'll just give it to you historically. In my 10 years of active duty in the Coast Guard, I lost three friends in aviation accidents. And those encompassed exactly two accidents. One accident took two, the lives of two friends and one accident took the life of one friend. In my first year in the Forest Service, I'd lost an equal number of friends in aviation accidents. So three. By the time I'd been in the Coast Guard for five years, we'd lost over 20 pilots in aviation accidents. So our, our rate wasn't great and it wasn't improving. And I felt like I needed to do something. So I, I moved out of the cockpit to some degree. I, I still flew, but I moved into a role of aviation safety manager for the, uh, for the Forest Service Region 2, which is uh, Colorado and, and, uh, and Wyoming and a little tiny sliver of Montana. So what I did fundamentally is I started looking at the problem differently. And, and with any problem like that, you wanna get some education, you wanna understand some things. Well, the Forest Service kind of followed on a trend that the Coast Guard had for me, which was to send me to uh, aviation safety programs and accident investigation programs with it in mind that I would become an investigator. And this becomes important a little bit later on. And I actually finished the USC program the Coast Guard sent me through the Navy Accident Investigator Program, so I completed that with the certificate that accompanied it. And the Air Force somehow found out that I was interested in safety, so sure enough, they sent me to Accident Investigation School to learn how to do it their way, which was, again, completely different. And I worked all the way up to the level of board president for the, uh, for the Air Force. Uh, and my final tour, actually, was working at the Air Force Safety Center. So that's a little bit of my background, just to give you an idea where I'm coming from. So here we are. 
the Forest Service tasks me now. I've, I've got my degree from Lund University working with Sidney Decker and, and uh, uh, I've moved into a graduate role with him in the program and I'm now helping him with the graduate program. I've got my master's degree. I'm starting to work on my PhD. And the agency recognizes that, that I've got something to offer, I guess. And what we end up doing is we end up really developing that more thoroughly. And the way we do that is, is this way. We develop three distinct pillars, which I'm responsible for major parts of in, in my role now as a new safety manager and ultimately as a director in the Forest Service. And the first one, the green one, is kind of the leadership journey that takes place. How leadership moves to this new place of becoming curious in a different way. The middle one is the research, which is, which is a fundamental focus of what I'm working on. And then the one on the right, the red one, is how we literally change our approach to accident investigation, which becomes fundamental, a fundamental cornerstone in shifting leaders' thinking, literally developing a way to present information to them in a different way. So that's what we're going to talk about. But obviously, I'm time constrained, and I'm not going to be able to go through every one of these things. So I've highlighted a few of the things that we're going to go ahead and talk about. On the green side, again, leadership's desires to understand how safety works, again, in a different way, and this leading to national safety dialogues. The center part, the research part, I'm going to just give you an idea of some of the people that are involved in that. I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail on the research side. But on the far right side, this is going to be the body of the conversation that we're going to have today. And that is that we had the serious accident investigation guide and we started to challenge that guide for a very fundamental reason. And then we had the joy of working with this guy from Los Alamos National Lab who, I, geez, he was just the previous speaker, Todd Conklin. And Todd introduced us to HOP. We, then two of us in the Forest Service, kind of took what he had, actually, Todd said, steal it, steal it liberally, which we did. And we modified it to fit the Forest Service mode. And then we literally held HOPE dialogues throughout the entire Forest Service. And we called it HOPE, not HOP, because we were kind of hopeful that it would <laughs> indicate some change or at least lead to some change. And then finally, that all came together in a new process of investigation called the Learning Review which was accepted by the organization in 2013. So these are the evolutionary milestones that I'm gonna talk with you about. This is the direction we're gonna take for our little dialogue today. What does it look like? Well, history, the leadership journey, we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk about how we challenged assumptions around error with the leadership. We're gonna talk about changing the investigation paradigm and why that was important and the role of research. And finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about the metrics. How did we know that this thing was actually working? Well, <laughs> the first question we got asked in our safety journey was, why don't people just follow the rules? Well, this is a picture of my dog at the market next to the sign that says no dog at the market, please. We're not fundamentally good rule followers as, as people go. I mean, that's just what people do. We don't follow the rules well. This wasn't moving my goal forward, which was to spend time with my dog on my day off and going to the market. And oh, by the way, my dog's a great dog. My dog didn't cause problems at the market. So why would I pay attention to that? But Fundamentally, what we have to start thinking about is how rules look to the worker. And this is the message that we started to get across to leadership. For example, in this slide, I'd be happy to keep off the red line if I could find the red line, but I can't find it. Or this, I have to spend a half an hour and use my PhD to figure out if I can park in this location. Or this, this, by the way, is the road going from Los Alamos down to, to Santa Fe. These two signs are just that close together, and I have no idea which one I'm supposed to follow or how I'm supposed to do it. Sometimes it's like this. <laughs> and sometimes it looks like this, which to me is fairly self-correcting. <laughs> if we think about this, though, we have to think about what happened with the application of rules in the space of operations within the organization. So I'm going to tell you a story. And I'm going to tell you a story that is a common story using this serious accident investigation guide methodology, which is similar to OSHA's methodology for accident investigation and others. 
And the story that I'm going to tell you is a story that brings about a crisis of trust in the organization. And this is an important thing to think about because if our workforce no longer trusts the, the processes that we use or the leaders in the organization, then we've got a real big problem. And that's what we found. That's exactly what we discovered as we started to map our situation. So what does it look like? Tanker 9 is a really interesting aircraft. It's an old P2V, Neptune. It has two big reciprocating round motors that make a a lovely earthy sound. If you're a Harley Davidson fanatic, you're going to love the noise that these engines make. And then it's got these two whiny jet engines that are out there that produce thrust for low level operations for takeoff and for landing. So essentially for high load, high demand situations. Well, in this particular case, one of those engines, the turbine in one of those jet engines comes apart and it peppers the underside of the wing on the left side of the aircraft. And when that happens, it punches punctures holes in that wing. And that wing is where the fuel is kept. And this fuel is not jet fuel. This is avgas, highly volatile, easily ignitable, and very, very hot when it burns, especially when it's aerated. And as you can imagine, if it's on the bottom of a wing and the wing's moving through the air, it's going to get aerated pretty quickly. So what happens when this turbine comes apart is a big old fire starts, and you're going to hear that the pilots can actually say that in the cockpit voice recording. And when that happens, parts of the wing literally begin to melt off, including the control surface, the aileron on that wing. And controllability is compromised structurally in this aircraft. So here's the story. I happened at this moment to be in a learning lab with Sydney Decker in, uh, in Sweden uh, when my phone rang. And I heard about Gene Wallstrom and uh, Greg Gonziorski and Zach Vandergrind. I knew all three of these guys pretty well, but I knew Gene really well. And Gene was a, was a dear friend of mine. So what happened? Let's take a look at it. Here it is, 26.9 seconds captured on the cockpit voice recorder. And I'm not going to bore you with all the numbers, but if you take a look, there's only a few seconds, like five seconds between each one of these. And here's what happens. The CVR indicated that the co-pilot said, whoa, followed by the sound of heavy breathing. The CVR indicated that the captain said, we got a fire over here, a big old fire, and I can hear, I can hear Gene say that. The CVR indicated the co-pilot saying, I'm holding full right aileron. He's trying to steer the airplane, and it's not working. The CVR indicated that the captain made a sound of heavy breathing, kind of indicating that the captain's helping here. CVR indicated the captain made the sound of heavy breathing. CVR indicated the sound of impact, end of recording. 26.9 seconds. And what I'm going to say to you is in that 26.9 seconds, these folks had a handful of airplane that was difficult to control. They had control surfaces that were melting off of a wing. They had a situation that no matter what they did inside the aircraft, since this was a, a puncture of the, of the wing surface and fuel was leaking out. There wasn't anything they could do to turn that fire off. There was no off button. There was no fire extinguisher button for the underside of the wing of the aircraft. And in 26.9 seconds, these guys struggled with a handful of airplane that was impossible for them to control. So where do we go? Well, at the time, the accident investigation guide, the serious accident investigation guide, said this in the very first chapter, very second paragraph, the causes of most accidents or incidents are the result of failures to observe established policies, procedures, and controls. The NTSB assigned the Forest Service to do the investigation and the Forest Service investigators used this guide as though it was gospel. So here's what they came up with. The probable cause, the failure of the flight crew to maintain airspeed above in-flight minimum control speed, the MCA, after losing power in the left jet engine during initial climb after takeoff. Contributing to the accident was the crew's inadequate cockpit resource management procedures, the failure of the captain to assume command of the airplane during the emergency, the flight crew's failure to carry out the jet engine, jet engine fire emergency, emergency procedure, and the failure of the crew to jettison the retardant load. Note, the NTSB charged this accident to CAL FIRE. This is terrible. This blames these guys for their own death, 
literally. And, and what it does is it undermines the veracity of any investigation that's done using this guide. It literally throws fuel on a fire of a lack of trust in the agency. And this is only one incident of many. The ground firefighters were suffering under the same thing, and in some cases, even worse, judgments of their actions, saying that basically, here, Mrs. So-and-so is your flag representing the life of this fallen firefighter who died because he was stupid. And people were really tired of it. Families were suing the Forest Service, rightly so, because they didn't want to hear this about their families. They didn't want to hear this about their loved ones. And if you think about how this story could have been told differently, and we think about accuracy, we could have said that this was an uncontrollable situation as a result of a turbine failure that punctured the underside of a wing, rendering the wing useless because of fire that was melting control surfaces literally off the structure of the wing. That's a very different way to tell this story. And I'm going to leave it to you to decide if one is more accurate than the other. But here's what happened. More investigations were created with the exact same kind of language and the similar kind of causal findings, failure to follow rules, regulations, policies, and procedures. And what happened was firefighters stopped talking. They stopped taking leadership assignments. They didn't even talk to each other, much less talking to an investigation team. And fear dominated the culture. I, I actually spoke with several firefighters who said the only thing that I learned from that accident was to have the business card of my lawyer in my wallet. And learning shifted to how best defend themselves from the agency. That is certainly not what we want. Now, one of the things that I recognized pretty early on was that, that the currency of safety is information. And this process was undermining information flow at a very, very basic level. So what do we do? Well, let's take a look at our history. Here's the need for change. From 1994 to 2017, Wildland Fire experienced over 400 line of duty firefighter fatalities. Well, it made us really good at investigation, but the problem was the guide that we had made us really crappy at investigation. So we weren't getting anything out of this. The accident rate was fundamentally stagnant. We were, we were killing people at an astronomic rate. And we had to do something different. So first thing we did was we started some research around why it made sense for us as an agency to adopt a, pro a, po a process like this, right? Why did we do this? So one of the things that I did was I, I studied the, these guys, the Dreyfus brothers from University of California, Berkeley. And I started looking at how they viewed novices and experts. And I developed this little table that I'm going to share with you and relate it back to accident investigation. Now, this table that you're going to see on the outside of the circle, you're going to see the expectations that we hold of the expert. In the center, you're going to see the expectations that we have of novices. So what do we expect of the novice? That'll be in the middle. What we expect of the experts will be on the outside. Prescriptive policy. We expect our novices to follow prescriptive policy, but we expect our experts to improvise. Compliance. We expect rote compliance from our novices, but we expect the application and adaptation of rules to fit circumstances of our experts. Procedures. Procedures are important. Of course they're important. But, and that's all that a novice has. So we expect our novices to follow procedures rotely, but we expect complex adaptive problem solving from our experts. Now, let me give you an example. I'm a pilot. I went to Navy flight school, and I can still remember the procedure for before landing checklist in the first Navy airplane that I flew. Harness lock, landing gear down and lock, brakes, parking brakes off, brakes bump firm, gear down, flaps down, landing checks complete. And I was good with that for my first few flights in the T-34. I'd select the landing gear down and things would work and the checklist flowed beautifully. But when something would go wrong, especially if it was outside that checklist, I had to rely on the backseater, the instructor pilot, the expert to help me with a complex adaptive 
problem solving until I reached a level of expertise that allowed me to start to do that. So procedures are important for that novice, but our expectation on the experts completely different. What about planning? Well, novices, that's all they've got is the plan. Whatever the plan is, whatever's been briefed, that's what they have. And so the expectation is that the novice will follow the plan. But what we expect from our experts is the intuition, that intuition to know when the plan isn't working and that intuition to be able to adapt the plan on the fly. In fact, there was a German general by the name of Van Mulke who said, planning is everything, but no plan survives first contact with the enemy. An indication that Van Mulke really understood complex systems, that the plan is okay, but no plan really survives that first contact. Mike Tyson said it a different way. He says, everybody's got a plan until, until the first punch. And that's really true. And then you have to go back to that intuition place. The more expert you are, the easier it is for you to flow into that adaptation and modification of the plan. Rules. Rules are super important. I, I'm not going to argue with that. Todd says all the time that, that there's a great rule that we should think of, and that is never take a sleeping pill and a laxative at, a, at the same time. And I, I think that's brilliant, right? That's just a brilliant thing. But rules are important. They certainly are. I'm a pilot. I, I, I live by rules to some degree, but I also understand that the rules have limitations, that you can't write a rule for every situation. So I have to use my tacit knowledge and my deep assumptions to be able to know how to apply the rules or modify the rules, or sometimes even go around the rules to get the mission done. Controls absolutely want to control our novices, but we want to empower our experts. Now, the reason that I share all this with you is because accident philosophy has always been to hold the experts to the expectations of the novice following an adverse outcome event. And what happens is we insult our experts when we do that. It's horribly insulting. What do we think of when we do this? Well, we think of this, we think of Dreyfus and Dreyfus and their table, and we look at the novice, and what we see with the expectations on the novice is that the novice should have rigid adherence to rules or plans, has little situational perception, no or limited discretionary judgment. If we bounce to expert down at the bottom, we now see that the expert no longer relies on rules, guidelines, or maxims, has an intuitive grasp of situations, and the analytic approach is used only in novel situations. Well, this became a key for us. If our leadership said we should take that pause, that tactical pause, and think about it, then where we really are, if we're in expert performance, is trying to develop the capacity in our experts to recognize when they're in a novel situation. Because according to the research, and this is years of research that Dreyfus and Dreyfus did, if they recognize they're in a novel situation, experts will automatically gravitate to an analytic approach. Well, that's important for us because what that does is that kind of keys us to start to understand accidents in a very different way. Are people pushing themselves or are they pushed by the system to stay in routine? Are there demands placed on them? Are there influences that surround them that actually blind them to novel situations and keep them in routine operations where routine can actually be vulnerable? Well, research and application. Who are the dudes that we look to? Well, you can see Sidney Decker in the lower left-hand corner. That's actually in, uh, in Robert Simwalt's uh, office. Robert is, by the way, leaving the NTSB after many years of great service. Uh, you can see Todd. Todd's pictured, <laughs> pictured rather heavily. Uh, Ed Shine, a uh, good friend of mine, David Woods, and Carl Lake. To name a few, there are many, many people that were involved in this. Reuben McDaniel was a big player in this and a big understander of the, the, the complex adaptive systems and how we can start to work within complex adaptive system. Eric Holnagel, certainly an important part of this. So where did we go? The first thing we did was we started to look at workers, again, not as the enemy. Workers, I mean, workers are trusted by the organization to, to perform work, often complex work. They're entrusted. And 
that lasts until something goes wrong. And then all of a sudden they're held as adversaries in the organization. That's kind of crazy. We recognize that workers do things because they care, especially firefighters. Now, before you get really, really too out of control on this particular picture, that's my wife. She's on a ladder with one foot on the ladder, one foot on a door in a stairwell painting a wall. She's getting the mission done. And the mission's important to her. And the mission is get paint on the wall and not on the ceiling. That's pretty important to her. And she tried a bunch of different things. She tried the paintbrush on the end of the broomstick and didn't have the accuracy. So she innovated this solution. Now, the key to this is that she never felt unsafe when she did this. There wasn't a sense of unsafe activity. And there also wasn't a sense of latent conditions here. She was getting the job done. And so what we see is a whole new perception of how workers approach risk in, in operational settings. And that becomes super important for us to begin to understand and craft a way to look at workers. And by the way, just think about this. If I had told her she was stupid, I don't think I'd still be married. So we don't want to do that with our workers either. Telling them they're stupid is equally counterproductive. And so one of the things that we recognized is we don't want to do anything that inhibits learning. We want to do things that move learning forward. And that means in joining our workers in any process that we create to review incidents and accidents. So we had a choice. When we started the learning review, we looked at the serious accident investigation, which was fundamentally dispositional in its approach. In other words, we looked at the personality of the individuals and their individual disposition and judged it as either good or bad. It was crazy. That alienates our workforce. Instead of that, we started to recognize that people do things because of a nested set of conditions or performance shaping factors that surround them. Now, James Reason early on said, you can't change the human condition, but you can change the conditions under which humans worked. Well, working off of that, we recognized that we did not have a process that focused on recognizing conditions. Instead, we had processes that, that focused on recognizing the disposition of individuals. So we fundamentally, right out of the chute said, we've got to develop something that looks at conditions and starts to map them in a way that's useful for the organization. So we also recognize that after many, many failures that, and this is from Ed Shine, how an organization responds and learns from work events shapes culture. An effective response leads to improvement and a poor response leads to additional problems. Some of which in our case certainly were catastrophic. The lack of trust, horrible. So we started with principles. The learning review is based on several principles. We actually originated with 12 of them. We, we necked them down after years of, of work, but these are the three major ones. Do no further harm to the system or the people within the system. And what we mean by that is that by creating a report that blames the person for the incident or accident, what we literally do is create a second victim, another victim, if you will. The people who do that work are now victims. They're victimized by the system and the judgments of the system. We also recognize that learning can only take place in humble inquiry and critical reflection, which means we have to somehow move ourselves to a place of questioning, of inquiry. We also recognize that our people are good and well-intended and working in a system that's perfect, perfectly designed to deliver what it does. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it really means to us is that error is less interesting because we all error and error determination is not consistent. Now, what do I mean by that? Judgments about error are fundamentally made after the outcome is known. Therefore, the learning review is designed to, to deliver learning products that are interesting, that raise questions that need to be asked and to put learning in the hands of the learner. If your focus is on developing a report that is correct in all facets, I guarantee you'll fail. You'll never do that. But if your goal is to learn, then you should target how best to evoke dialogue and to allow or facilitate learning to take place. So these were the principles that we acted on. 
So the conditions that influence decisions and actions, and we didn't differentiate. Decisions and actions we found were on a spectrum. And cognitive science kind of told us this, that we go from one end, which is our intuitive response to stimulus, to another end, which is our deliberative response, which would be the decisions. So intuitive actions versus versus conscious decisions, all exist on a spectrum and anything that a human being does is someplace on that spectrum, sometimes more toward decision, sometimes more toward action, but you know what? It's not worth our time to, to worry about that. What's worth our time is to start thinking about internal and external influences, social pressures, culture, conditions, training and experience, physical and mental conditions. So our, go our goal became to understand those influences and how they were operating within our system, not just our, our system during the accident, but our system of work. So that's what we began to target. This is an example of one. Uh, I want you to also know that this is scalable, so you don't have to develop things that are quite this large, but this one deals with the transportation of laptops containing personally identifiable information. So on a dispositional level, HR said that the disposition of this worker was bad and the worker should be fired. Let me lay the conditions out for you guys and you guys could be the judge. This was an individual who was going home for knee surgery. He worked in the human relations department. He worked at the Albuquerque Service Center doing the administrative stuff for the organization. The job that he had specifically was to approve people so that they could approve the timesheets for employees. He felt that his job was very important. If he didn't do his job, then a supervisor wouldn't be approved to approve timesheets and workers wouldn't get paid. He felt very strongly that this was something he needed to do. So he's going home for knee surgery the following day and he's gonna stop off at his doctor's office at the doctor's request. But he takes his laptop with him and he downloads the personally identifiable information for the entire Forest Service on his laptop so he can continue to do his job. It's all there. But he also knows this. The hard drive is encrypted. The computer doesn't have, you can't access the computer without your identification card being inserted inside the, the computer and your two-person identification or two-point ident identification after that. So he understands that the system is fairly safe. He also is following an instruction that exists in his facility, literally posted in the elevator. And that instruction said, if you're going to take your laptop home and it contains PII, then follow these instructions. If you have the trunk of a car, put it in the trunk of your car. If you don't have a trunk, if you've got a pickup truck, put it in your pickup truck, but don't put it in a descript bag. And, and if you do have it in a descript bag, like a computer case, cover it with something so it can't be seen from the outside. He does that. He does all of that. He puts the computer behind the seat in the pickup truck. It's not in a descript bag. It's just in, a, in a, a backpack. And he covers it with a jacket so it can't be seen. He parks in front of his doctor's office. He goes inside his doctor's office. Half an hour or so later, he comes back out. His car has been broken into and the laptop's been stolen. The first thing that HR said was, well, he's in violation because there's a rule that HR finds that says you cannot be physically without your laptop at any given moment. You have to have your laptop in your possession at all times. Well, by this time, I'm, I'm a fairly senior leader in the organization and I'm sitting down with two other senior leaders and I turn to one of them and I say to John, John, where's your computer? He said, oh, my computer is uh, downstairs on one of the desks. So it's out of your physical possession, right? Uh-huh. And I turn to the other one uh, the other senior leader that's in the room. And I said, where's yours? And he says, oh, mine's back in the hotel room, really out of his possession. I said, so basically what you're saying to me is that if we follow this rule, we almost have to have the computer surgically inserted in our bodies in order to do this, to comply with this rule, right? And so we immediately recognized that this was a rule that, that lacked fidelity, that wasn't followable, didn't move the mission forward, and was poorly understood because there were rules that actually countered it. So immediately we moved to try and save this guy's job. Well, how do we do that? The first thing that we do is we try and build context around why it made sense for the worker to do what he did. And what we find out is that he had a strong sense of customer service. We find out that there were organizational pressures that drove 
this kind of behavior. We find that training and experience also were consistent with exactly what this worker did. We also found that his emotions kind of pulled him in a direction that said, hey, I'm going to do more for this organization than they're even asking me to do. And then we also saw that the organization had a focus on efficiency, that this was deeply ingrained in the, in the culture of the organization. And then we also noticed that there were problems with signal detection and that there were tactical pressures and memory items and deep assumptions that the worker had about the way the system emerged. Now, we didn't start out with those core ideas or constructs. What we did, did was we started out with, with things that were observations made by the people that do the work that created all those little data points that you see around those core ideas. And then we allowed those data points to self-aggregate and those, that, ag that self-aggregation developed the titles that we had or the categories that we had. So we didn't start out with categories. The categories resulted from the data, which means the data drives the process instead of the process driving the data. Taxonomies are problematic because they influence what we look for. And then we look for things to fill the tax taxonomies. So while this might look like a taxonomy, it's not. It results from the data that we collect and how the data self-organizes. So this becomes very important to us because what we can do with this is we can start to look at these different conditions and all of these are conditions, performance influencing factors. We can look at them and we can aggregate them for leaders who can't see things this way because a lot of leaders couldn't see things in this, they would be overwhelmed. But what we could do is we could list them and we could list them by things that belong to the regulator or the, the legislative body that controls us. So these things would be uh, influences that were outside of our control. The next category would be things that are cultural. What kind of cultural things should we address and how should we begin to address the culture? And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. The third category would be things that we could actually fix within the system. For example, one thing here is that there was no driver that he could access off-site that could contain the data so that the data could be kept on-site and only accessed through VPN. So that's a simple fix. We actually did that within a, a month of initiating the learning review was we created a server on site that people could access off site using VPN. And then the last category are things that if we change them, they might not make a difference or if they change them, maybe they would actually work against us. More importantly, we could recognize those conditions and maybe adjust our awareness within the system. And what I mean by that is our definition of situational awareness because of this process fundamentally changed to making people aware of the things that were influencing them at the point of work and letting them deal with it, respecting them as the experts in the system by simply making the, them aware of the systemic pressures. And by the way, you'd think that this might need some validation, like the data might need some validation. And you're absolutely right. And the way we do that validation is by holding focus groups. And we simply ask the focus group, do these things exist in normal work? Are they in your normal day-to-day -day operations? And what we found out was, oh boy, were they? And if they weren't, if there was something that emerged out of the, the process, out of the learning review process that wasn't in normal work, we would note it and, and say that it was unique to this particular accident and then not spend a great deal of time on it. So it actually helps our economy of how we approach our management of conditions by saying certain conditions are things we're not going to deal with because they're just not worth our spending our time on. The learning review process is uh, basically four phases. We initiate the learning review by getting a team together and that's pretty much standard for everybody. And then we do information collection, not data collection, but information collection. And in that we have principles as well, like not all choices are black and white. And Todd just spoke about choices and I, I wish he could have gone into more detail because he's got a brilliant podcast on that. Gather information to build a complex narrative. And a complex narrative is one that looks at multiple perspectives. What we recognized is that when witnesses give us statements about what happened, those statements don't represent fact. They represent their perceptions or their perspectives of what occurred. And it's important for us to recognize if those perspectives aren't the same, 
Now, the old process, the serious accident investigation process, and actually every process that I've been educated in formally, told us to resolve those based on evidence to find out which one was truthful. Well, we recognized that that's not what we wanted to do at all. We wanted to recognize if there were multiple perspectives, that those pers perspectives existed, may even have existed during the event, and then ask ourselves, was there a way to recognize the difference in perspective? And was there a way to communicate those differences in the moment? Again, an opportunity to learn, not resolving the perspectives, but honoring the perspectives. And of course, we still want to gather physical evidence and we want to develop that event narrative and then place the decisions and actions in context using the network of influences map. So then we, we move on to focus groups and we kind of think about focus groups as the way we develop more information. Now, if this is a huge, big learning event, which by the way, is not necessarily tied to consequence. It may just simply be tied to learning. But if, it, if that's what it is, then what we wanna think about is, can we bring other people in on this that can help us to understand it? And this is where we introduce, sometimes introduce academic specialists in different areas to help us. So Edgar Shines helped us with accidents. Carl Weichs helped us, Ruben McDaniels helped us. All these great names that I mentioned earlier have all helped us in learning reviews. And then finally, we go to a learning review board. Does it matter? Well, yeah, it does. So here's the metrics piece. We need to find out if it's working. This is the chief of the Forest Service at the time, and he's going to explain his position on this. And you know what? I have to stop here because I don't think I said in my share screen, share sound, and that would be super embarrassing. Here we go. So we're going to hear the chief of the Forest Service, and the chief of the Forest Service is going to redefine accountability as being accountable to learn all we can from an accident. Here we go. Oh, he's also going to explain the CRP. The CRP is an overriding group of, of senior executives and leaders who manage the accident from a high level. So that's the CRP, and then the learning review falls underneath that. So here you go. Throughout my Forest Service career, I have placed a special emphasis on our attention to safe work practices. As your chief, I am compelled to do everything possible to ensure that you are appropriately equipped to safely work in the complex work environments you face. I want you to feel positive about coming to work every day. I want you to know that nothing is more important to me than having each of you return home safely at the end of each workday. However, when accidents do happen, our organization's response does affect both employee morale and our future safety. We must learn everything we can from those events to prevent reoccurrence. Our past efforts to prevent or reduce serious incidences, including fatalities, have not always been as effective as intended. Even though we have always stressed safety, our fatality frequency rates remained unchanged for 40 years. This was one of the key reasons why we decided to look into how the Forest Service culture was maybe a factor. And as a result, we committed to our safety journey. Serious accidents and fatalities, they bring sorrow and hardship for families, colleagues, and other loved ones who are left behind. In addition, we have come to realize that witnesses and others close to the incident can unintentionally be harmed by our current accident investigation and response processes. Therefore, we have developed a strategy designed to minimize the negative impact of our accident review methods on survivors and on witnesses. It is essential that we consider these effects as we gather the necessary information needed to fully understand and learn from the incident. This effort, called the Coordinated Response Protocol, CRP for short, represents basic changes in how the Forest Service responds to and learns from tragic events. The CRP uses pre-trained response team members who work to lessen potential future harm to our employees. By design, this process takes every opportunity to minimize the number of interviews our personnel are exposed to, as well as control access to our employees as much as possible. Another important CRP component is the learning review, which replaces the serious accident investigation process. The learning review will collect information to help create learning products to support our ability to learn from the event. 
Learning review information will not be used as a basis for disciplinary action or to place blame on employees. I cannot stress this enough. The learning review is about learning. It's about understanding what happened, so if possible, we can make changes to produce a different outcome in the future. We owe it to those that make the ultimate sacrifice to honor their service by learning everything we can. So here the chief is really making it clear for us how important it is to put learning first. Now I'm gonna go through just a few of the results of the learner review. Um, the learner reviews basically informed national dialogues and the national dialogues at first, you might expect leadership to be in this place where they're moving, right? So it's not all successful. This is not linear, linear learning. Leaders, it takes time. They've got to embrace this. So in 2014, we had our first, uh, our first national dialogue where, where leadership literally wanted to have the, a conversation with the entire Forest Service, all 35,000 of us. And they brought us together in different locations to have these discussions and leadership was deeply engaged. But they also came up with this idea, a signpost that held in the center of it, this idea of following rules, regulation and, and policies and procedures. And we actually saw the emergence of a concept very similar to life-saving rules. And that first meeting was fundamentally coercive where leadership was trying to make the field agree to follow the signpost, follow these rules. Well, my group was in charge of giving them feedback at the end of this, and we used the learning review process to provide that feedback. And when we provided the feedback, the leadership really didn't like the mirror that we held up for them. So the next year, 2015, they said, well, maybe we need to engage a little bit more with folks. Maybe we shouldn't ask them to agree with, with rules, regulations, policies, and procedures out of hand. Maybe we should ask them about that. So in the second, in 2015, we have a more communicative meeting with the field and leadership. And finally, after that one, we again do the learning review on the data that comes out of it on the surveys, the, the exit surveys, and leadership is also a little bit questioning again, you know, did we really hit the mark? Are we really getting through? And the, and the, the answer to that question was fundamentally no, because they hadn't entered into the conversation, into the dialogue with open and humble inquiry. And pointing that out to the move to the 2016 dialogues, which were fundamentally collaborative. So you can see how we, we use the process throughout in very different ways. We also moved from the correct and fix idea to the understand and learn idea. We understood that judgment results in pain, distrust, and silence, and learning results, results in trust and sharing of information. And remember my saying, the currency of information, I mean, the currency of safety is information. Don't forget that. It's critically important. But what happened was that we had a very different result with family, families, the regulators, field personnel, and we recognized that leaders are learners too. And so what happened was we would get lawsuits from every single one of our accident investigations from the families of the fallen firefighters up until the learning review. When we instituted the learning review, we stopped getting sued. From the perspective of the regulator, what we actually found was that the OSHA was citing us for a failure to comply with the general duty clause for every single one of our fatalities. That stopped once we enjoined OSHA and showed them the process and we stopped getting violated. And by the way, just think about that. The general duty clause is the worker, the employer has the uh, responsibility to create a workplace free from known hazard. We're paying firefighters hazard pay to go into the forest to fight fire. We're going to violate that every single time, every single time. And then field personnel. What we found with field personnel is that when we would go and talk with them and explain the process to them, that they would come to us with information. They would literally go out of their way to be accountable. In fact, what we recognized is we couldn't hold our people more accountable than they held themselves. So that idea of accountability shifting to learning was working. And then this idea of leaders becoming learners, hugely important. That's the summary again. We're on the wrap here. But one thing that I want to share with you guys is a recognition of the work that you have been doing. Now, this is a recent document that's just been released in, uh, in uh, not yet final form called Doc 10151 Manual on Human Performance for Regulators, which introduces five human performance principles. 
And I think you guys are going to see that these principles are similar to the ones that you've been advocating for for a really long time. People's performance is shaped by their capabilities and limitations. People interpret situations differently and performs in ways that make sense to them. People adapt to meet the demands of a complex dynamic work environment. People assess risks and make trade-offs. And finally, people's performance is influenced by, and I would change this because I think it's much more than just working with people, technology, and the environment. It's a lot more than that. It's influenced by that whole network of influence that I mentioned. So this is the work you guys have been doing, and it shows in an international organization. And that is the end of my presentation. Do we have time for a couple of questions, Dean? Yeah, we definitely do. So there were some quite a few comments and thoughts in the chat box. And what I'd love to do is just invite anybody that has a question to um, either raise your hand so we can we can call on you or just unmute yourself and I'll look for the little microphone. There's a hand up already. So Brian, gesturing, what do you, what do you think? What's your question? Uh, first off, uh, I don't know if I'm live here. I think I am. You are. Um, I, I think it was a really good presentation and I appreciate it. I had uh, two questions. And again, I'm more of a novice myself in coming into this whole field. But uh, the novice versus expert, which was the good little uh, segue into that, you know, my understanding was always that, you know, I understand that the expert has more knowledge, more experience, and there could be more latitude in their decisions and what they do. But I guess one of the concerns I have also is that there's more what I always call analytical drift in that situation. And at least in uh, like medical situations that I've investigated, you find that people that were like the chief of surgery were the ones that actually had the most problems because you know, they knew that they didn't have to wash their hands for 10 years and they never had an infection with the patient. So now all of a sudden their patients got infected because they didn't have a negative consequence from actions they took causing the analytical drift from the procedures they had, which caused a problem. And I guess, you know, maybe I'll just pause if you could address that. And I'm not saying you're wrong by any means. I'm just trying to find the solution to it. So Brian, I think it's a great question. And hand washing is an interesting uh, conundrum because it's both cultural and it's also imposed by a sense of demand that's placed on the doctors. So the sense of demand that's placed on the doctors, if you think about that as the network of influence and the performance shaping factor, we want to save as much time for that doctor who's hands are blessed by God to prevent, to prevent all the, the, the death and destruction that's going to happen if they're not there right away to handle every single situation. So what we see, what we start to see is we hype them up to begin with on influence. We tell them that they're super important, that their time is super valuable, and we start to move toward an efficient process as opposed to a thorough process. And that drift toward efficiency, that's not evil, that's human. We all drift toward efficiency. That's a, a direction that we want to go. So if we start to understand that, then the next thing we've got to do is we've got to start understanding how can we start to make doctors aware that this is, these are the influences that are on them, that they're being pushed this way. How can we change those influences organizationally? Can we? Is it effective for us to do that or is it economically not feasible? Are we thinking as an organization, the more patients the doctor sees, the better off we are financially? Are we encouraging that with those metrics? So we have to start looking systemically at the problem, not dispositionally at the problem. And then the last thing is proving to the doctors that there's a cause and effect relationship between not washing hands and illness. So like you said, Brian, they exist for a long time doing this activity without adverse outcome. And every time they have a successful outcome, what do they learn from that? They learn that the risk is really not what they believe it to be. And what ends up happening is they normalize the risks associated with the activity, in this case, hand washing. And they literally lower the value of probability. Severity probably doesn't get changed much, but the likelihood changes greatly. And so then you've got to think about, well, what's their individual disposition like to take risk? Are they risk takers? And then fundamentally, the next piece is what is the system of rewards? And it's in that system of rewards that we get the most bang for the buck. That's the performance influencing factors. That Thank help? you. And just one other quick follow-up uh, on one other thing you mentioned, which was about the worker assessing risk. Yeah. And I, again, I understand it, but, uh, and maybe your wife isn't the best example. And if I had a better idea of how to share it, I've got a great picture. Maybe I'll figure out of uh, a guy trying to cut something with a circular saw on a coworker's back. You know, sometimes <laughs> people, uh, people don't always have the best 
ideas of how to do things. And again, you know, if not a negative consequence instantly, then it reinforces it and then it keeps happening until something bad happens. Yeah, and so this we call this the normalization of risk. The longer a system remains safe, the less we're going to believe that that system is unsafe. Did I freeze? No. So we have to think about that, Brian. In that, in that, in fact, share your picture with me. I'll put my my email in the uh, in the chat box so that you've got it. But as we start to think about uh, what you're asking, is in that construct of normalization of risk. Again, that's a very normal thing for humans to do, and we all do it. We all start out, for example, driving, following the rules, regulations, policies, and procedures to a T. But we all very quickly drift away from that. Right? Why do we drift away from it? It's that question that we need to focus on. It's why that drift becomes so available to us and so important to us. And sometimes it's cultural and sometimes it's driven by systemic metrics, things that we measure, reward, and punish. So I think thank that you. might have got, gotten me. Yeah, the, no, those are perfect. Thank you. Sure enough. Brian, thanks for the question. Thanks, Ivan. And uh, let's see, Steve Prevett, you're unmuted. Steve, what's, yes. your, what's your thought? Well, we had a little side discussion going on about a really wonderful affinity diagram there and was kind of likening it to the fishbone diagram. I think uh, Bob also was in on this discussion, but a, a question I have, because I've kind of done it both ways. Generally, a fishbone, you have categories and you drill downwards, but if I understood right, Ivan, it sounded like you went from the bottom and aggregated upwards, and that that's relatively interesting. Can you discuss that? Yeah, absolutely. What we found was, and we tried a lot of different things. I mean, we this was a process of trial and error over a long period of time, years. In fact, 2005 to 2013, 2013 being the first full-blown uh, acceptance of the of the learning review process. And along the way, we, we, we dabbled with latent conditions. We looked at fishbone diagrams. We looked at uh, stamp model. We looked at uh, FRAM from Holnagel. We looked at a whole bunch of different processes along the way. And what we recognized is that all of those processes were fundamentally a compromise in that they were all socio-technical models, right? And what we had in the Forest Service, I mean, when we looked at ground firefighting operations, we didn't have socio-technical. We had guys with King radios, that was technology, chainsaws, that was technology, but the rest of it was shovels, Pulaski's, McLeod's, things that were basic hand tools. And we had a very basically social environment. And our incidents and accidents needed something that was social and focused solely on social rather than being so socio-technical. So we kind of left a lot of those socio-technical things on the side, bow tie, again, socio-technical. We left those on the side and started looking at what we had. And what we had was we had guidance. The guidance that we had was look for conditions. That came right from reason. And we said, if we're gonna do that, then why don't we just start looking for conditions? Why don't we just do that? And then, the next thing that emerged out of that was a map. How can we organize them? Well, we started out by mapping them along a timeline. And what we realized is that that really wasn't realistic either because it separated them. So then we started saying, well, what is the real thing that holds them together? The thing that holds them together is fundamentally the situation, the decision action. So if we start to aggregate influences around decisions and actions, key decisions and actions, we can move forward with that understanding and see the network, see how that network emerges around us. And now we've done this, we did a, a learning review for the Chemical Safety Board that involved thousands of data points, uh, and it's called the Dust Safety uh, Hazard Learning Review. And what we did literally is we surveyed people around the world who were involved in dust explosions and we asked them what were the important aspects of these explosions and mitigations. What, what did we do systemically and how did we approach them? And the thing that we came up with was very, very different. The report was published uh, last year by uh, Chemical Safety Board and I can make the link available to, to uh, Dean. Uh, and, and what it showed was it showed how these things were all networked together. It showed the network and allowed the network to happen. The, the next thing that I want to do to kind of address this is that I mentioned it before is allowing the data to drive the system as opposed to 
to the system driving the data, moving away from these taxonomies and structures and recognizing that each accident is like a fingerprint. They're all unique. And starting to understand that means that we have to have a process that embraces that uniqueness. But then we don't want to stay in that. We want to move to normal work as quickly as we can. So we capture what happened in the incident in terms of conditions. But then we want to look at those conditions in the context of normal work and ask focus groups, do these same conditions exist in normal work? Because then we've got something we can focus on. Did that answer the question, Stephen? Yes, thank you. Good discussion. Awesome. Thank you for the questions. I'm just looking to see if anybody else has their hand up. Um, and it, I don't see anybody else. So um, Ivan, thank you so much for, for the powerful story, for those insights, for some great takeaways. Um, leaders as learners is an interesting one. I, I love um, the way you use focus groups to kind of validate stuff, I think is really, really powerful too, but great all the way around. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dean. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And looks like Charles has already put the uh, Dust Safety Science Learning Review in the uh, in the chat box. So I don't need to do that. My email's there. Either one, you can use Puppelity at UAB or Puppelity at me. I would enjoy hearing from any of you. Great. Thank you so much, Ivan. And that brings us to to our, our lunch break. So what we are going to do is we'll take half an hour um, and I'm going to share out my screen just with a couple of quick things. One is um, we'll be back in 30 minutes time. So 1230 Central Time, 130 Eastern Time. No need to sign out of the Zoom session. Just put yourself on mute and uh, shut down your video. Um, in about 15 minutes, you'll hear more great rock and roll or Jimmy Buffett or something. And um, then we'll be back with Bob Nelms and Brian Basquet. So great to, it was a great morning. Thanks everybody. And we'll see you back in half an hour's time. So just keeping an eye on people coming back in, give everybody a little bit of transition time. <clears throat> Feel free to make requests for the great Patrick Taylor. Thank you. As long as it's at least two decades old, he'll have it. Brilliant. Yeah, Patrick, I'll, I'll, I'll send something in the chat box for the next time around. I have a couple good requests for you. You have to dig deep into those uh, eight track archives. Okay, it is 30 minutes past the hour, and we'll get started again. And, and our next presentation is from Bob Nelms, and I'm thrilled to introduce Bob, although many of you, I think, know Bob, a great man, a great thinker. And I think, Bob, you'll end up talk to us a bit about, um, about accountability and changing perspectives. And, um, and I'm really looking forward to your to your interactive and different kind of presentation. So Bob, it is all yours. Thank you, Dean. I'm looking forward to this also. <laughs> First time I've done this in this uh, venue, that's for sure. Before I start, I don't wanna forget, I wanna commend uh, the former HPRCT board for doing such a phenomenal job at the renaming and the new website, et cetera. I can only imagine how, how difficult that was, but you did a marvelous job. You know, I can only see a few uh, faces up there. I can see Charles and Dean. You're the only faces I can see because of how my uh, screen is set up, but you guys, phenomenal. Thank All right, you. Ellis Nestor left a valve open. You know, I, before I start this, uh, there's a little bit of a danger in this talk. Uh, this event happened 35 years ago. So you're gonna hear me talking about some things that we did during an investigation that you're gonna say, you did that? You did what? Uh, isn't there a better way of doing things than that? And the answer is absolutely. This investigation was formational in the way I understand currently why things go wrong and how to, how to learn from them. So having said this, Ellis Nestor left the valve open. 
So, like I said, 35 years ago, I was doing a series of training classes in northern Alberta uh, at a town called Fort McMurray. Some of you have been there. Back then, there was only, I don't know, 40,000 people that lived there. Today, there's at least double that. Uh, and they were great classes, wonderful people. But there was one class that I taught that I'll never forget. And I'll never forget it because of one of the people that were in the class. And one of the people in the class was huge. I mean, he was not not fat. He was he was muscular. He was a hundred percent muscle. Uh, he wore a muscle shirt. It was forty degrees below zero outside. And this came, this guy came to class every day with a muscle shirt on, and he sat there flexing his muscles all the time. This is a four day class. Uh, he had no neck, and it, oh, by the way, his name was Moses. Now I'll never forget Moses because Moses hated the class that I was teaching. I mean, he, he within the first hour of sitting in this four-day class, he knew he didn't belong there because I'm all about understanding and no blame and looking at yourself. And, and he hears this fluffy stuff and, you know, he's a, a, a getter done Mr. Macho guy and he just tuned out immediately. And he wanted everybody else to know that he didn't want to be there. And not only did he not like this class, but to tell you the truth, the guy hated my guts. He didn't, he, I mean, there was this aversion between he and I, because the feeling was kind of mutual. <laughs> um, so for four days, I had to put up with this man. And when the class ended, I said to myself, thank God, I'll never see that man again, and this is over. Well, that's what I thought. So this was in the fall that I taught that class. And, you know, winter time came, Christmas season came. I'm home with my family for Christmas time. And I guess it was two days after Christmas, my telephone rang in my home office. So I go in my office and I say, hello, this is Bob Nelms. And then the other end, uh, it, it's, it's Moses. He says, hey, Nelms, it's Moses up here in Fort Mac. Remember me? And I said to myself, oh, yeah, I remember you. I said, what's up, Moses? And he said, my hydro treater just blew up. And I said, oh, that's, that's terrible. Was anybody hurt or worse? No, 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 nothing like that, Nelms, nothing like that. But Nelms, they want you to come up here and lead a root cause analysis because that's what we called it back then. We don't call it that anymore, but that's what we called it back then. Now, read that, and remember what I said that he said. He said, they want you to lead a root cause analysis. Did you, did you hear the word they? Well, I heard the word they, and I said, well, Moses, uh, what is your role here? And he says, well, I'm the new unit manager of this. Uh, I'm a manager now, and this is one of my units, and uh, that's my role. But they want you up here to lead this root cause analysis. So I said to him, well, what about you? Do you want me to lead this root cause analysis? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, no, I don't want you up here to lead this root cause analysis. And I said to him, well, well, well why not? He said, because we already know why it happened. That's why. And I said, well, when did this happen? Two days ago. And you already know why it happened? Yeah, it wasn't rocket science, Nelms. I mean, I know you're an aerospace engineer, but we don't need that up here right now. So I said, well, what, what happened? What, what caused it? And he said, one of my men, Ellis Nestor, left a critical isolation valve open, Nelms. And let me show you the schematic so you can follow through with this. He left a critical isolation valve open, Nelms, and because that valve was open, high pressure hydrogen got past that valve and it pressurized a vertical dead leg. The water, I mean the dead leg, that pipe also had water in it. It was 40 degrees below zero that night, Nelms, and the water froze 
It expanded. It ripped the pipe open. But because that valve was open, Nelms, hydrogen got past the valve and it escaped through the crack and ignited due to static electricity. Ellis Nestor left the valve open. And then he said, and not only did he leave a valve open, Nelms, but he signed off on a checklist saying that he checked to make sure that valve was shut. He signed off on a checklist the night before the explosion. He signed off on the checklist without really checking that valve. He pencil whipped the checklist. That guy ought to be fired. We ought to make an example out of here, out of him. But no, they want to do a root cause analysis. <laughs> you know how many times I've told that story? You know how me many memories this brings back? <laughs> so, you know, by the late 1980s, I was, I, have, I was pretty experienced. I did a lot of investigating for the company that I work with, and then I went into business for myself. And of course, I knew about blame. I've experienced blame. You know, the, the bigger the event, the more likely the blame virus is going to emerge. And this was a big one. I was hired by a VP. The VP told uh, Moses to call me. And the VP wanted to get to the bottom of this. But the blame, this was the beginning of my intense feelings about blame and how it ought to be handled. So let me say a little bit about this right now. Uh, and then you're going to mull over it probably for the rest of my presentation. But in my humble opinion, blame ought to be outlawed. I mean, I know it never will be, but it ought to be banned. Ban blame everywhere for everything. The mantra ought to be no blame. When something goes wrong, you're going to feel like blaming. Don't blame. If I was the president of your corporation, I, I mean, I've never been a president of a big corporation, but I'm pretty sure I would, I would tell everybody, if anything goes wrong in this business, there will be no blame. The only time you'd have to worry about your job is if you are blaming. Now, I realize if you just leave it there, well, where's the accountability? There does have to be accountability. So the other half of that, that I embrace wholeheartedly, even in my family, is no blame, but required introspection. That is, everybody involved in this incident is required to look at themselves as part of the problem. No blame, required introspection. Now, that principle was not embedded within me at the time I led this investigation. Uh, it sure is embedded within me now. So let me continue with the story. All right, so I get the call two days after Christmas. I couldn't leave the next day. I had to leave the following day. It takes a whole day to get up there. There's four different flights you gotta take. Uh, you know, Roanoke, Atlanta, Salt Lake City, Calgary, finally, Fort McMurray. That's five legs. <laughs> so it's nighttime. I show up in the airport. That's the actual Fort McMurray airport back then. Now they have a new one. And there's three guys in the airport when I got off the plane, waiting to get on the plane I just got off of. And they recognize me. And they said, Bob Nelms, what are you doing here, you know, four days after Christmas? And I said, well, I'm here to investigate the hydrotreater explosion. You're here to do what? Yeah, you know about the explosion, don't you? Oh, yeah, Bob, everybody up here knows about the explosion. 40,000 people know about the explosion. But, Bob, we already know why it happened. Well, do you work at the hydrotreater? No, no, we work at the other end of the, of, of the refinery, Bob, but I'm telling you, everybody up here knows why it already happened. So I said, well, what do you mean? Why did it happen? And you know what they said? I bet you know what they said. They said, Ellis Nestor left the valve open. 
Whoops. Wait a minute. Let me go back. Can you imagine being Ellis Nestor? 40,000 people, I don't know, you know, at least 30,000 people knew that that explosion happened because of Ellis Nestor. Wait till you hear the rest of this story. Now, I don't know if this is uh, creating any thoughts or feelings within you right now, but I would like a few times during my presentation, I'd like to go to the chat box. So please click in the chat box and let me know what thoughts or feelings are you are experiencing right now. And I'll read some of them and you can all read them also as they come in. Frustration, how awful it would feel to be Ellis. Disgust, yes. Poor Ellis. Irritation. Poor Nestor. It sucks if you're Ellis Nestor. <laughs> have you ever been in his shoes? I have. The amount of shame that Ellis would be feeling is tearing at me, yes. The inability to look deeper into why Nestor had to make that decision. How way do you hear that? Embarrassing. Good. You're where I want you to be. Stop the suckage, as Todd would say. Yeah, I heard his presentation. That's a good word, Chad. I mean, Todd. Tad. Todd. Okay, thank you. Let me continue. So it's my... Uh, okay, uh, another chat came in. Did anyone even talk to Ellis? Well, wait. Good question. So it was nighttime, and I went over to the hotel. That's, that's the Saw Ridge Hotel up there in Fort McMurray. It didn't look like that back then. They added that nice, big uh, entranceway. But uh, anyway, I went to sleep. I didn't really sleep too good. Got up the next morning. And I drove out to the site. I think it was like 30 or 45 minutes to drive out to the site. And I went into the lobby to meet, out, to, to meet Moses. And there he is. And he took me up to the war room. So I walk into to the war room, is what they called it. And there's 15 people sitting in there, including Moses. And I looked at him, and, and I looked at Moses, and, I, and he said, Nelms, meet the team. And I thought to myself, uh-oh, this is not how it's supposed to work. I'm supposed to help with the, uh, def the, define the team. And I said, Moses, you were, you were through a four-day class. You, you remember uh, about the team and the selection of the team. He says, ah, what do you expect us to do, Nelms? This happened four or five days ago. You expect us to wait until you fly up here? We got together, and Nelms, we got the whole thing figured out. You can leave tomorrow morning. I, I tell you, I, when telling this story, my blood starts start shaking a little bit, and my blood boils. So I have to control myself. You know, if this is 35 years ago, I'm not as... Uh, calm maybe as I was back then, and, I mean, as I should have been, and I had to control my shaking. Uh, and you have it all figured out? He says, yep, we got it all figured out. Well, listen, I flew all the way up here. Your VP, his name was Jim, wants me to lead this, so let me take you through the first few steps and see how you've done, uh, he says. So the first thing that I ask him, which is the first step in our process, is, did you gather the five items? Now, don't worry about knowing what the five items are right now. It's the first step in our process. Be concerned with this, with his reaction. His reaction was, ah, we didn't need to do that. This was an easy one. Slam dunk. No, we didn't do your five items. I said, well, what about the first one, a problem statement? Now, as we, are, we know what the problem is. So to make a long story short, I handed out index cards to these 16 folks, and I, I asked everybody to, to write down what problem 
you're trying to understand the causes of. 16 different answers. And then I asked, well, what about a schematic? Did you, uh, did you develop a schematic of the hydrotreater? And he says, oh, we did better than that, Nelms. I, we got P&IDs out the kazoo. Here, look at all the P&IDs. And I says, well, I don't, I, I'm not going to be able to understand the P&IDs. You've got to get me up to speed quickly. What is, what is a hydrotreater? And one of the people on the team, one of the experts, said to me, you don't know what a hydrotreater is? They flew you all the way up here from the, the States, and you don't even know what a hydrotreater is? And I, I said to her, well, that's why they flew me up here, because I don't know what a hydrotreater is. I know how to investigate things, but I guess they're depending on my lack of bias. I don't know. And we walked through the rest of them, and none of the other ones were done of the five items. So I, I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to handle this? So I go on to the, the three Ps. Now, the three Ps. A lot of you have heard about the three Ps. This is the three Ps of evidence. There's four, there's four Ps that people talk about. There's five Ps that people talk about. I, I try to make things simple. We always go after the three Ps, people evidence, physical evidence, paper evidence. So I ask Moses in front of the others, how many people did you interview? I'm sorry. I asked him, did you interview people? Of course we did. How many? Two. Two people? Well, there were only two eyewitnesses, Bob. And I said, Moses, you know, you know, were you listening in the class? We, you're supposed to gather a whole lot of people who's ever interested in this hydrotreater explosion. Put them in a room and ask them, who should we listen to? Did you do that? No, we didn't need to do that. No, we interviewed two people. Did you interview Ellis Nestor? No, he's only going to lie. So then I go on to the physical evidence. Did you gather the physical evidence? Yeah, we cut that piece of pipe out that, bur that blew up, that burst. We sent it down to Edmonton. It's in the lab. Any results yet? Inconclusive. Well, what about paper evidence? And I mean, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, we got paper. This is the checklist. This, this right here. Here's the checklist that he signed. He signed off on the checklist the night before the explosion. Here it is. There's his name right there. Ellis Nestor. Now, before I go on, because this is one of the I suppose, main learnings for me during this investigation. Go to the chat box again, and I'd like you to answer this. Why might ignorance be so important when trying to understand the causes of a serious incident? Yes, filters out bias, no bias lack of bias. It's deafening. It's deafening. Hurry up and find the cause. Fresh approach. Okay. That's right. I don't already know why it happened. I had no idea. I can ask the stupid... Yeah, Bob Latino, hi. I can ask the stupid questions nobody else would ask. Open to all possibilities. Absolutely. That's why HR managers are great team members. Galen, hello, Galen. No ulterior motive. Yes, yes, yes. All right. So now what? So I... I have to slow them down. Uh, I, re I require them to draw the schematic. I don't know what a hydrotreater is. Help me. Draw a simple schematic, simplify it so I can understand it. Moses, here's the, uh, the marker. Would you go up to the flip chart or the whiteboard and 
to show me what a hydro treater is. You know what we all found out right there? He couldn't. He didn't know. Now, I'm not trying to embarrass the man. Nobody's, I'm not into that. But, uh, wow. So another person got up and they started drawing part of the hydro treater and they started using acronyms and expressions that I was not familiar with. And so I would ask questions and, and I would be slowing them down. And uh, I mean, we were two days into drawing the schematic and it started getting to me. I mean, that's a lot of pressure for a young man holding up 16 people in the midst of a major investigation. So I started getting sick. I mean, when I'm under pressure for a long time, that's kind of what happens to me. It gets to my stomach. So we took a break, and I'm up at the front of the room walking around, taking deep breaths, and Moses comes up to me, and he says to me, something wrong now? I'm really not feeling that well. Did you eat at that restaurant I told you not to eat at? No, no, no. It's nothing like that. Well, then what's wrong? Uh, I, I'm, te- I'm, you know, te- I'm tense. Uh, I'm frustrated. I know I'm holding you all up. I know you already think you know why this happened, and you maybe you do. Uh, put yourself on my shoes. I'm, I'm feeling a lot of pressure. Uh, and then, and then I said to I, I said to myself and to him, wait a minute, wait a minute. I got an idea that might be able to help me. And he said, what? And I said, Moses, could you give me a second ignorant person? Whoops. Sorry about this. I need a second ignorant person. And he said, what? You need a second ignorant person? Why? I said, because if both of us don't understand what you're all trying to tell us, it takes the heat off of me. And he said, what? And he goes into a rage, ranting up in the front of the room. Oh, good grief. I mean, this is what I have to put up with. You, you're afraid of, of, you know, it takes the pressure off of you. You want another person to help with that? And he's ranting, and nobody else is in the room right now. There's T and I, and all of a sudden, he stops. And a smile crosses his face. And a halo is up there around his head. And he said, wait a minute, Helms, you want a second ignorant person? I said, yeah. Okay. Tell you what, Nelms, I have just the person in mind. Why don't you go back to the Saw Ridge Hotel, take the rest of the day off, have a glass of wine or whatever you do, and come back tomorrow morning and I'll have you some help. And I smile and I, I felt like hugging the guy. And maybe this guy isn't so bad after all. So I go back to the Saw Ridge and and uh, I do have a glass of wine or two, and I slept pretty good. And I come into the meeting the next morning, the war room, and I look around, and I don't see anybody new. So I said, Moses, where's my help? And he said, I don't know. He said, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. We told him to be here at 9 o'clock. Nelms, we took half a day off for you yesterday. And we're not going to take any more time off. I'm sorry. So you're just going to have to start without him. Oh, boy. So I start again, and and that feeling comes back, and I'm starting to hurt again. And, and maybe 30 minutes later, we're in a long room, and at the back of the room, there's a door. And the door opened up, and a man walked in. Now, please, I am not making fun of people here. Uh, I don't make fun of people. But I'm telling you what really happened here. A man walked in, and this is just about what the guy looked like. Uh, I couldn't find a closer picture, except the guy didn't have black pants on. He had black sweatpants on. And the black sweatpants were pulled all the way up to his armpits, way too tight, if you know what I mean. And he had, and he had uh, hair that was slicked back, 
And he walked in and he said, excuse me. He had a squeaky, squeaky little voice like this. He said, excuse me, excuse me. I said, yes, sir. He said, is this the root cause failure analysis room? And I said, yes. And he says, oh, well, good. I've been looking all over the place for this room. I'm here to be your second ignorant person. And all of the experts and Moses, they're laughing and they're making fun. This guy really looks like this. He really dresses like this. He really talks like this. This guy was using this poor guy, I guess, to bring me down. So I, I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. So the guy walks up to the front of the room and he sits down. There's Moses to my – I mean, there's uh, Nirm, uh, there's the guy to my right. And I, I look at him and I say to him, sir, what is your name? Actually, I didn't say that. There, everybody had name tense. So I remember 15 people is a lot of names to remember. So they all had name tents. So I gave him a name tent. And I said, would you please write your name on a name tent, whatever I want to call you. So he wrote it down, and I looked at it, and I didn't know how to pronounce it. So I said, sir, what is your name? And he said, my name is Normal. And I'm, the way he said it was indescribable. I said, your name is what? My name is Normal. You know, he said it with an accent. The guy was from another country. Again, I'm not making fun of him. This, real, this is how it all played out. And I, I, I asked him one more time, and he got mad at me. My, he, he's tired of everybody asking his name. My name is Normal. N-I-R-M-A-L, Normal. Normal, do you know why you're here? Well, no, not really. I said, Normal. If you if you hear any one of these people in this room say something that you don't understand, just raise your hand and ask a question, okay? And I'm thinking, ay, ay, ay. And he said, yeah, okay. So I have to bring him up to speed. And thankfully, we have the problem statement identified, and we have the schematic on the, on the wall. So I use the schematic. And... I'm sorry, I guess I skipped a few slides. Let me go one more slide. I'm, I'm going to walk through the schematic. And I said, Normal, here's the schematic. Uh, that isolation valve was left open. I did not use any names. Hydrogen got past the valve. It pressurized a vertical dead leg. That's just a vertical pipe with an end on it that doesn't go anywhere. Water also got into the dead leg, filled it halfway. It was 40 degrees below zero that night. The water froze. It expanded. It split the pipe, and all the hydrogen escaped and ignited due to static electricity. Do you understand? And he's shaking his head up and down, but he's got his hand on his face like this. So I go back to the meeting, and I'm not kidding. Uh, Wendy, one minute after I explained the five items and showed him that schematic, his hand goes up. Excuse me, excuse me. Yes, sir. And he said, like this, he said, I don't under, I'm going to talk normal now, okay? He said, I don't understand how water could get in a pipe and freeze and split the pipe. And when I heard that, I said to myself, this myself now, now that's a stupid question. So I looked at Normal and I said, Normal, uh, you know, water expands when it freezes. And he said, I know that, I'm not stupid. He said, didn't you say this was a vertical pipe? Yes. Didn't you say it was filled halfway with water? Yes. And he says, well, I can understand if it was a horizontal pipe and the whole thing filled up with water and froze, it'd have to split something. But a vertical pipe filled halfway with water? If it froze, why wouldn't the water just expand upward? Why would it split the pipe? 
And then he said, every once in a while, I leave my milk bottle on my front porch by mistake. And when the milk freezes, it just pushes the top off. It doesn't break the glass. And when I heard that, I looked at Moses. Because <laughs> this whole stinking thing came from him from the very beginning. And, oh, I wish I had a recording of this. That guy went ballistic. Ah, this is ridiculous. This is Fort McMurray. We have, it's 40 below out there. We've got pipes bursting all over the place here because of frozen water. And Nermal says, vertical pipes, vertical pipes. He says, vertical, horizontal, like, it doesn't matter what kind of pipe. And he said, filled halfway with water, halfway. And there's this big bull raging against this little mouse. And we're all just sitting back there listening. And finally, you know, this guy Nermal, we ended up being really good friends, carpooled together, ate dinner together. He was a mountain of a man. Finally, he said, this is ridiculous. This is what happens, you know, 10 minutes after I walk into a room. Oh, yeah. Look, why She's on we... her way. Okay. I'm sorry. I, somebody doesn't, somebody's not muted, but that's okay. So we said, why don't we just do a test? So I said, what kind of test? And he said, why don't we just get 20 tubes, same diameter, same material, same thickness, etc. fill them halfway with water, stick them outside, it's 40 below outside, and see what happens. And Moses is going, oh, geez, we already know what happened here. And the rest of the team looked at Moses and said, well, Moses, you know, what's the big deal? How long is that going to take? So they boxed him in. Now the team is starting to get a little bit more open-minded. We created the four, they, they had the weld plates in the bottom of the tubes to hold the water. That's what took so long. They did that. We poured the water in there. We put our parkas on. It's 40 below. And the tubes were not, they were probably like three inches, four inches in diameter. It didn't take long for the water to freeze. And not one tube burst. He totally redirected the whole course of that investigation with that one ignorant, unbiased, brave question. And this was the beginning of the change in Moses. Actually, not just Moses, the rest of the team and me. This cracked our shells. Let me talk about this, because this is another main point. A lot of you might not like this. I don't know. We'll see. Many years ago, I read a book called uh, The Prophet, written by Khalil Gibran. And one sentence in that book really riveted me. He said, your, pa your pain, this is emotional pain now, your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. And wow, when I read that, whew. you know, every one of you were hired by your companies because they are depending on what you know or your expertise. But there are limits to what you know. Nobody knows everything about anything. I mean, take myself. I know how to investigate things, but there are limits to what I know. And, and it's kind of a hard limit. I feel very comfortable inside the shell of my understanding. But when somebody drags me to the edge of my shell and breaks that shell, it hurts. It's painful. I've learned that that's good. I have... I just learn what I didn't know. Outside the shell is ignorance. Inside the cell, shell is uh, expertise. We want to grow into what we don't know and learn. And you can't do that without pain. Now, I, I have some very good friends that are listening in, and I don't know if they're listening to this part or not, but one of them told me, that they were so happy with their learning processes because 
everybody is so calm and happy as the result of them. And I say to myself and to you, I might be wrong here, but that's not good. Think of yourself. When have you changed the most? Was it when you were nice and calm and happy and kumbaya? <laughs> or was it when the shell cracked? I'm telling you, Moses' shell cracked in that room. The team's shell cracked in that room. So did mine. I got to hear some thoughts about this. What thoughts are going through your mind at this point? It can be painful to see our own biases. Thank you, Sharon. Ignorance is, well, that was before. Comfort zones are too comfortable. Absolutely, Tanya. Never assume. Trust but verify. Everybody. Thank you, Susan. Peace doesn't find the answer. Chaos does. Ooh, that was a good one. We need to question our own answers. Alice isn't so bad after all, thank goodness. Guess and test. Yeah. Okay. They're all good. What I'm wondering is if you're buying into my statement that if there's no pain, there's no growth. I'm talking about true growth. True learning only occurs through pain. So we'll talk about that later uh, when we finish. So let me continue. So, I mean, now we're, we're, our hands are up in the air. We don't know what the heck to do. We go back into the war room, and I say to Moses, Moses, you never even interviewed Ellis Nestor. Is that right? Yeah, because I told you he'd only lie. <laughs> I'm thinking, nice attitude, Moses. So I said, well, I want to I talk to him. Could you call him into the room? Now, please, I would never do that today. But he, Moses reached back on the wall, and he, and he picked up a telephone, and he called somebody, and he requested, Mo, uh, he requested Ellis Nestor to come into the room, and he did. Ellis Nestor walks into the room. There's 16 people in the room, you know, all these PhDs and uh, highbrow people. Some of them have ties on, and here's Ellis Nestor walks into the room, and he looks at me. I'm standing up. Everybody's sitting down, and I look at him, and I, I say, Hello, Ellis. My name is Bob Nelms. I'm the lead investigator here. Do you know why I called you in? I can only imagine is his answer. So I said to him, and I, I, I grabbed the checklist. It was, it was on, the on the table. It's in my hand. And I said to him, Ellis, is it true that you signed off on a checklist the night before the explosion without really checking that valve? And he said, you got it in your hand, don't you? I said, yeah, actually I do. Well, you want to know what really happened? You want to know why I did that? Well, I said, of course. That's why we're here. And then he said, put your parkas on. I want to show you something. So we go into the suit-up room, and we put our parkas on. Uh, I don't know if I should get into the details of this, but <laughs> 40 below out there. First, you've got to take your, your office shoes off, and then you put these big boots on. Well, first, no, first you put the overalls on, then the boots on, then the, the, the parka on, then the hood up. They dress me up first because I'm the lead investigator. And then all the other people get dressed up, and by that time I'm hot and I'm sweating. And then we're going to follow Ellis Nestor out to the hydro treater, which is maybe a quarter of a mile from where we suited up. 
Now, Alice could have got a van for us, but he didn't. We had to walk out there. I I guess he just wanted to prove a point. So we go out there, and I'm the third or fourth man out, and I walk out there, and wham, uh, 40 below hits your face. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in that exp- uh, exposed to that before. I don't know how people can do that. I mean, I don't watch TV. I watch all these things where people are out there. I don't know how you do it. I mean, it hurts. I remember blinking, and the sweat that was on my eyes froze when of my eyes shut. And by the time we got to the blockhouse, which was right next to the hydro treater, uh, a quarter of a mile out there, I couldn't feel anything. I'm walking on stubs. My fingers are, you know, crooked. <laughs> we go in the blockhouse. We undress. We thaw out. I don't mean we undress. You know what I mean. We thaw out. We... Then we go out to the hydro treater. Now, the hydro treater is right there, and I remember it being noisy, you know, like hissing and noisy. And, and uh, so we, he has to yell. We all gather around Ellis Nestor because he wants to show us something. And, he, and, and we're standing around him, and he points up, and he says, do you see that valve up there? Four flights up. There's, there's a valve. That's the valve I'm supposed to check. That's the valve I'm supposed to check. You see how you get up there? Now, it's not in the photograph, but there's a caged ladder that goes straight up. No landings or anything, straight up, four flights. There's ice all over the, the rungs of the stairs. That's the valve I'm supposed to check. That's the valve I'm supposed to check. And he says, I hope you realize when you looked at this checklist, this is a daily checklist. And we never use that valve, but twice a year, that's a purge valve. Twice the year, we take down the hydro treater to, and for maintenance. We have to purge it with nitrogen. That's the valve we open. We only touch it twice a year. The last time we touched it was three months ago. But no, I'm supposed to check it once a day. And then he looks up there and he points and he says, he asks us, look at it. Is it open or closed? And Big Mouth, Big Mouth Moses looked up, looked at it, looked up there, and he said, "Looks closed to me." And Ellis looked at him, and he looked at the rest of us, and he said, "That's exactly what I thought. It was open three threads. You couldn't see the three threads from the ground." And then he told us all, because what I do for you, Moses, like a good little boy, is I go into the blockhouse, I pull open the file cabinet, I get the checklist, I come right here every day, I look up there, it looks the same way as it did yesterday, it looks closed, and I signed off in the checklist. And Moses is, you know, he's embarrassed. And then he takes us into the blockhouse, and he opens the file cabinet up, and he pulls out a stack of papers an inch thick, or almost an inch thick, and he throws it on the table, and he said, these are all of my daily checklists. There ain't no way I could ever do any of all these things. Uh, I've got to do what I'm doing. Ellis Nestor left a valve open. So we start from scratch. I had had it, and I said, we're going to do this by the book, five items, one at a time. We're going to get a group of people in a room, and we're going to ask, who should we interview, and we're going to interview every one of them. And I shouldn't even call it an interview. It's a conversation. We're trying to learn here. A massive amount of physical evidence, including that valve. They didn't even look at the valve. Uh, and we finally got to the bottom of it. Now, I, I don't want to get into how and all that. I want to get to the end of the story. I want to hear some of your thoughts here. What really happened? If this doesn't make your hair stand on end, if you have any hair, I don't know what will. You can read it, but I'm going to read it also. Operator A cracked open the isolation valve months prior to the incident. 
Operator A was not Ellis Nestor, somebody totally different. Why did he do that? Well, he did that because he was required to take a sample every day of the hydrogen and send it to the lab. And the sample point was up there to the right of the isolation valve, of course. So every day that guy had to climb four flights to the sample point and it started getting cold and the winter came and he said to himself, wait a minute, I, that valve that's right about head level, if I crack that isolation valve open three threads so that nobody knows, I can take the sample from, from that valve that's lower. So that's what he did. He cracked the isolation valve open. He didn't tell anybody he did this. He started taking the samples. Why do you think the water level was right there at the sample point? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of obvious that every time he drew a sample, he drew a water off with it. So he sends, sends it to the lab. The lab analyzes it. We got the paper evidence from the lab, and there was obviously water in there, but the lab never told the area about the water in the hydrogen. What are they doing? What are they taking the samples for if they're not going to report back? Think of all the things that were done wrong here. The day prior to the explosion, operator A could not get a sample at the lower valve. He opened the valve, but nothing came out. Uh-oh. I wonder why nothing came out. Well, there was ice in it. He didn't know, but the operator didn't know that. He didn't know there was water in there. So what does he do? He requested maintenance on the valve. They are allowed to do that. They are not allowed to disassemble the valve by themselves. So he requested maintenance on the valve. Main uh, he didn't do anything about the open valve. He, there, there, is lock, there was lockout, tagout procedures back then, and he depended on the maintenance people to follow Lotto. The maintenance people got there, and they didn't. Look at where we're going to have to go to lock this thing out, is what they thought. I mean, that's four flights up. They only used that valve twice a year. Nobody has touched it since. Uh, it's, the near, it's near shift change. So they arrive near shift end and they disassemble the valve. They're working on a live line and they don't even know it because they think the upper valve is shut. They didn't finish the job. The valve bonnet was laying on the ground right below that valve. We, we, we found this with physical evidence gathering. We ask ourselves, what is this valve bonnet doing here? All the screws are intact. It wasn't damaged or anything. That led us to the maintenance that was done. That led us to the whole story. Shift ends, maintenance leaves without finishing the repair with the bonnet laying on the ground. The next morning, it was a little warmer. Not a lot, but a little warmer. The sun came up. When it came around and hit that valve, the experts on our team did heat transfer calculations and it made sense that uh, it un unplugged the ice. Ellis Nestor left a valve open. Now, what did this do to me? Uh, well, I'm thinking right now all the others. It did a lot to all of us, but what did it do to me? I think there's four slides I want to share with you. Of course, you know, you don't have to agree with this, but this is this is me. This is what I learned from that. And the first one is maybe the most important, blame. If there's any such thing as a root cause, and I think there is, blame is very close to it. Think about our society right now. Think about the state of things, you know, with COVID and with the politics and with the world situation. Oh, my goodness. 
Wouldn't it be nice to just start thinking about your families or your work groups that you work in? Wouldn't it be nice if you could embrace the mantra, no blame, required introspection? I mean, what, I mean, that's idealistic maybe, but what a world it would be. So that's the first thing that happened to me as a result of this. The second thing I'm convinced of is this. It's our biases that cause our problems. It's also our biases that cause our good things. It's what we know. What we know isn't always right. It's not always complete. It's not always good. It's our biases that cause our problems. We need to tap into ignorance to expose the biases. Did you hear the word I used, though? To expose the biases. And in the process of exposing biases, we're all human. We all have egos. Heck, I do. It hurts. It hurts. Painless, which leads to the third. I'm convinced of this. Painless learning is not learning at all. The shell must crack for profound learning to have occurred. And then finally, it's almost never what it seems to be on the surface. When I look back at all the things I've investigated, especially the big ones, when something goes wrong in our lives, there is an epic story that is begging to be revealed. Okay, Dean, I think I, I, I'm not to positive about the flow here, Dean, but is this where I ask for questions or comments? Yeah, I think it's a perfect time. Um, so okay. would love to hear from anybody what your questions or comments are and feel free to chat them into the chat box or better yet, raise a hand and, and um, we'll make sure you're unmuted and you can ask live. But Bob, this is like a very interesting very interesting story and bunch of revelations, you know, both about, you know, the, the vulnerable way you told that story and your own aha moments, but got me thinking on a few things too, but we'll come back to that. Let's see what uh, thoughts people have. And there are a lot of good ones in the chat box already. Bob, you're a good storyteller. I appreciate that one. Um, okay. Another so interesting question here, Bob. Um, how do you promote pain growth without shutting people down? So how do you really encourage that kind of, I really want to get at it, you know, and, and you have to go over a little bit of a tipping point there. I think it just happens. Uh, if you intentionally try to not have it happen, that's, it, it takes more energy for that than to do it naturally. It just happens. Uh, if, if you, uh, I, I know I'm talking to HP people and all kinds of people in here, but as an investigator, if you gather the evidence, the, the people evidence, the physical evidence, the paper evidence, and ask yourself, who needs to really see this? Who, who really needs to come to grips with this? and you get them in a room and you show it to them, their shell's gonna crack. In fact, they're gonna, they're gonna get mad at you. Where did you get that information? That's ridiculous, that's not the way it is. It's going to crack. And when I'm leading an investigation and that happens, I honestly say to myself, good, good. I don't say it to them, of course, but to me, you know, I don't like it either because they're upset, but I know the process is working. I don't know how good of an answer that was, but. No, I think it was a good answer. And, and there's another one um, in the chat box that I'll read to you, Bob. And then I'll ask a couple yeah. people to just jump into the conversation. But um, there was a question about that. You mentioned you you mentioned that now you would never ask Ellis Nestor to come into the room. Why would that be? Uh, that's a, incredibly intimidating to ask a person that you've never met before mm. to come in to 16 people who are going to pepper him with questions. At least that's what he thinks. It's too intimidating. 
we I would want to inter when I don't like the word interview. I would like to sit down with Ellis one on one, at least that's how I do it these days, one on one, hear his total story, get him comfortable with me, and then if necessary, bring him in with the others later. But never uh, I, that, that, that's a murder board. In fact, some people call it the murder board. What a ridiculous phrase. Yeah, so really getting people to the point of feeling safe that they're they're able to talk and have a conversation versus being interrogated. Yeah, and you know, it's simple. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. How are you gonna feel if you get called into a meeting of 16 people and you never met them and you know they're investigating what you did? Not gonna feel uh, good. No. Yeah, and there are a couple, so I'll, uh, I'll ask Brian and, and I'll ask Bob Latino if you wanna just unmute yourselves and, and um, bring up the points that you raised about, um, there was a question, Bob, about sabotage, um, you know, and, and where does that cross the line, um, you know, in terms of, of blame or maybe, you know, to paraphrase, misconduct. But uh, Bob Latino, I'll start with you. Bob, what's your thought there? Hey, Bob. <laughs> Hi, Bob. I'm, I'm just, uh... Uh, where, where did it cross the line on blame when in, in the scenarios that I'm familiar with, which is extremely rare, where it, it, does, sabot does sabotage constitute a condition in which to blame? I'm going to answer that, of course, Bob. I'm going to give you my take on it. But what sure. about you want to bring Brian in here also? And because and, it's the same question. Brian, what about what you want to add to that, Brian? Uh, no, and first off, uh, for those who don't know, I'm a huge convert of Bob. I, when I was working for the state, I brought him in, and we did a tremendous amount of training, and the office that I ran uh, embraced and came up with this SOP for Bob's latent cause analysis procedure. But that said, you know, my personal experience is that, you know, if you have a coordinated effort to undermine the system, it becomes very difficult. I think when you get people that are just making mistakes or there's problems, but when there's a deliberate multi-person, uh, I guess the word conspiracy, to subvert the system, then I think it becomes a little more difficult. And I'm not saying, and even that, even with that as an understanding, I still endorse and embrace what Bob's talking about. But I think it's just with that with that situation, you know, when you have something that almost borders on a criminal conspiracy. I think that makes this a little difficult, and I think it makes anything a little difficult. I think the most difficult problems to investigate are the ones that are deliberately concealed, not ones that are just you can't find because you're not looking or you're not looking in the right place, but when they're deliberately concealed and not by one, but by multiple parties. You know, when we first started working up there in this facility in, in Canada, I won't mention the company, but we, we found people that deliberate that consciously deliberately buried physical evidence so it couldn't be found i mean that does happen it happens everywhere it happens in your business brian and, and our businesses everywhere but you know i so i'm a idealist and i know it i'm a teacher and a coach and i know it and my stance is firm on this knowing that you have your own businesses to run and you have to take whatever I say uh, and apply it in your own way. But in and the way I say, feel is if, if there's sabotage, you better know why there was sabotage. What the heck is going on here? And there's only one way to know it. No blame, but required introspection. Now, if somebody tries to hurt somebody, of course, that's breaking the law. And the law is going to come in and take them and put handcuffs on but as a business entity, why are you investigating anything? Why? If it's to learn, you can't blame ever. So maybe in the case of sabotage, maybe you don't investigate. Maybe you just say, hey, we know this guy did it on purpose and you put the handcuffs on. Maybe. I wouldn't do that if I were you, but, but if you're going to investigate, no blame. I, I could maybe do a little follow-up in a different industry that maybe will put it in a situation. Let's say, and I don't, you work for a drug manufacturer and then you have employees that are deliberately diluting the quality of the drug so they can sell that drug on the illicit market. So let's say you're doing a pain med like Oxycontin, which is in the news a lot. 
And then the, the employees are deliberately making the equivalent of placebos that are going to patients so they can actually take the medicine and sell it on the side. So I think there comes a point, and again, I'm a full, I'm a total Kool-Aid drinker in what Bob says, but I think there is a little flip switch at some point where it goes beyond we're trying to make the company better to that deliberate criminal conspiracy. And again, that was in a different industry than mine. It's just kind of spontaneous. So you could probably poke holes in it, but. Well, I think the, the, line, the line I was drawing that was, was, at least to me personally, would be that there was malice with intent. Right. You, you know what the outcome would be and you chose to do that. And that, that, that crosses a criminal line uh, in, in, in a lot of the cases. So, but, but sometimes people are just ignorant of the outcome and they're doing it as a shortcut and it wasn't, uh, you know, deliberate with that outcome, that, that uh, intent, but uh, things didn't go as the way as they planned and they shortcut it worked in the past. Yeah, no, I concur and I agree. And, and again, it might not be the best example. I was trying to pick something that was a little bit of an outlier. Let's, uh, so thanks for that. Let's draw a couple more people into this conversation. Jason Simpson, I see you're unmuted. So Jason, what are your thoughts here? Oh, maybe that was just an errant being unmuted. Um, and uh, Rob, Rob Statham, you had been unmuted for a second. So I just want to check in with you and see if you have any thoughts on this one. And I'll pause there. And by, by all means, um, yeah, Rob, I, I have a couple. I have a couple things that uh, that come to mind. Now, I jumped in a little late, so if I get off point, uh, correct me. But uh, my experience has been what I've found uh, is people act like uh, they've followed all the rules. They've done everything they can. And then you show up and you actually look and you do a real uh, uh investigation you're seeking after truth and you let evidence lead you and you find out that uh maybe uh people weren't doing what they said they were doing but it's never one person and they know it if if there's time for discipline or if you've uh, uh violated the law or uh process safety management rules or whatever regulations you live by that should be uh, taken care of before something blows up. We need to figure out why we uh, live that way and don't do anything about it until something blows up. That's that's my two cents. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, by the way, I didn't know Rob was here, but uh, Rob and I are, Rob has taken over for me in Failsafe uh, very, very shortly. And I'm glad he's here and he, I'm glad he spoke up and I appreciate how he sees things. So the time for discipline is and punishment is before the incident. You see somebody not wearing a hard hat in a hard hat area? What the heck? Why aren't you wearing a hard hat? You forgot? Strike one. And if it happens again, strike two. Three strikes, you're out. You don't wait for somebody to get hurt and then discipline him. I totally agree with you, Rob. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rob, and thanks, Bob. And, you know, um, Bob Nelms, I want to try to connect a couple of things here that I heard and I'm curious about from your perspective and your experience. Um, totally love the no blame and required introspection concept. Um, and that also true learning requires this kind of breakthrough, this kind of, you know, pain, as you put it. How do you get people over, how do we ourselves get over that hump of going, willingly into that vulnerability and that level of pain to get true learning? Is it simply rub some dirt on it? You know it's going to hurt and the second time around it's not going to be as bad? Uh, is it like Buddha because we know suffering is there so accept it? What's the, what's the secret? That's a good question. That means when I say that's a good question that means I don't know the answer. Yeah I don't uh, either. And well let me let me say you know, Rob asked me a question the other day that led me to this comment. Uh, I used to teach a class where there was a van fire, and I, we got into the causes of the van fire. And I, I was the main cause of the van fire. The way I was, the way I treated people, my wife, uh, I, me, the first, time I, the first time I presented the van fire with a class of people, and 
and heard what they said about me, it didn't mean anything. I collected my paycheck and I went home. The second time, the third time, the 50th time, the 100th time, it was over 400 times at least that I, I, I had to go through that. And I'm telling you, it hurt. At, at some point, I realized, oh, my goodness, I'm a creep in certain areas of my life, and i got to change, and I have. So, you got, I mean, Dean, short answer, you, gotta wanna, you have to want to go there. Yeah, thank you for that. It kind of reminds me of uh, something my grandmother used to say about, you know, if three people tell you you're drunk, guess what? You're probably drunk. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, that's, and, and Jason had, had texted or chatted in that, you know, it requires getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that is a good, simple, but very accurate thing of, you know, always wanting to have that curious mindset and being open to those kind of things. Um, got a bunch more people here that are unmuted. So I'm going to check in with uh, first Amy Dwayne. Amy, what do you think? Oh, Amy's muted. Charles, you, Charles Major, you're unmuted. What's your thought? Bob, you're the foremost authority in the world on introspection. Uh, what, what is a simple methodology or set of questions? Because I don't want to wait until I find myself super bad wrong and destroy some relationship or uh, property or find myself um, in a position I don't want to be in. So how do we, how do we daily, uh, like after, after every action, what does the after action view look like uh, that you might learn to ask yourself these questions on the small ones? And I think really uh, that kind of just is what Dean was talking about is once you survive a couple of small ones, you, you're more able to, survive the bigger uh-ohs uh, that you might make also. But I'm just, how, do you, how would you go about and how do you go about doing that? Well, you teed up an answer that could be a long one, but I won't make it long. So, so uh, let me give you an example. I, I, on my desk here is a glass of water. Let's suppose during this presentation, I knock over the glass of water with my hand. Well, I already know the causes of it. I did it. I don't have to gather evidence. I don't have to do any of that fancy stuff. It's right there. I, I did it. I, I had the glass where it shouldn't be. So I can ask myself every time something really little happens in my life, what is it about the way I am that contributed to that spilled spilled water in this case. What is it about the way I am? No matter what it is that goes wrong, little ones, like you just said, little ones are the best, uh, but real little ones, things you know the causes of already. Um, so I, I don't, is, does that make sense? Should I say more? No, I, 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 I think I understand that if we, if we see ourselves as part of the uh, part of the problem, then we can figure out how we might become part of the solution. But you got to see ourselves as part of the problem and the small things and everything uh, eventually, right? So if it's happening in our culture, if sabotage is happening in our culture, what is it about our culture that will allow or promote that? And what is it about the way I play a role in that culture, right? So every person... Uh, you know, and the system could ask themselves that question, or what is it about the way I impact the system that would allow just one person's actions to bring down the entire system? You know, why, what is it I, what, is, what do I contribute to capacity? What do I contribute uh, to not only the problem, but the, the solution? Yeah, good, Charles. So let's I check this an at. Who is going to talk? Oh, sorry, Bob. Go ahead. Well, as an add-on to, to what Charles said, anytime you feel like blaming, no matter what it is, try to understand to such an extent that you're convinced you would have done the same thing if you were that person. 
that's a golden rule. I mean, my golden rule, my, I mean, I had a conversation with my wife the other day, and she, boy, she didn't like that. She said, I don't want to understand some things. Well, then we're different. But if you feel like blaming, I think that's where we ought to go. Understand first. That doesn't condone their behavior. You know, the people flying planes into the World Trade Center, you don't want to condone that. But why'd they do that? It, it, wouldn't it be nice to understand it totally and thoroughly? Maybe we already do. I don't know. But I, I, I want to be an understander, not a blamer. So I want to check in with a couple of folks here. Richard Cole, you've been unmuted for some time, so I apologize for being so slow at getting to you. But Richard, what's your, what's your thought here? I think you have to look at to see whether or not it's part of, so this gets into your role as an investigator and what you're doing is sometimes you can't prevent from the external, like the flying planes into the World Trade Center. That might be not within your scope of control to where you can ever do that. So there's, you would need that understanding, but when you're looking at the internal of what were the factors, because most violations like the leaving the valve, like Ellis leaving the valve open that was there but for a reason. It was, you know, everybody, Ellis probably wasn't the only person whose name was on that stack of check, checklists. So that's a routine violation that we just get to. It's just a normal way of business. We think that things are the way they are. That can be violations. Sabotage, I take us a little bit differently. That's usually an external factor that what we're in in our system that we're investigating may not have anything to do with that or we may not have any control over why that person did something. So I think we have to sort that out some as far as looking at it from a human performance standpoint and how do we make sure that we were protecting. So it changes our focus into how do we change human error or how, do we need to have better protection for the system so that we keep hum, you know, the person who would do the deliberate act is there enough of a hazard there that we need to protect it? It can change the focus on our actions afterward to get back into what can we control and what are we protecting? Thank you, Richard. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And we do have, let's see, Galen, you're also unmuted and Galen, same thing. Sorry, it took me so long to get back to you. So Galen, what's your thought here? So, uh, I think it, 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 it comes down to a, a leadership discussion, to be honest with you. That, that's just my thought. Uh, as, as hop coaches, we're really to influence leaders and, and how to make this journey and how to make this leap, how to crack that shell. That's our job is to coach leaders. But it comes down to leadership. I can't tell you how many times when I was on my tools, we've all seen this. So the supervisor would come out and I was doing a workaround and I'm not a bad guy or a bad employee. I'm just trying to get the work done. If the equipment doesn't work correctly or we have budget cuts or time constraints, you do the workaround. And I don't know how many times the boss would come out and if we weren't doing it exactly, maybe the way it was supposed to be, he would turn around and go back to the office. And so he didn't say anything, but he told me everything I needed to know and that's go for it. And so we do it a hundred times and 99 times we get it right. And then the one times we get it wrong, you throw me under the bus. Why would I ever want to sit down and have a conversation with you and tell you about the blue line again after the experience I just went through? So it's not an employee problem. It's a leadership problem. And I think that's one of our biggest challenges as hop coaches is to influence our leadership. Great comment, Galen. Yeah, absolutely. And let's see any, so yeah, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here, Sharon Small. I'm just going to ask you to unmute yourself because you, I, you chatted <laughs> quite a bit in the chat box there. And, and I suspect you have some insights on this one. Um, yeah. Oh, is my camera not working? That's all right. Let me just do this. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm with, um, I, you know, I'm with this idea of like, how many times do we, um, you know, count uh, errors and then we forget about all the thousands of successes, um, you know, that was just mentioned. But 
but more, it was just when we started talking about um, theoretical, you know, what ifs, it's like, it, it's really hard to talk, uh, talk about a what if because a what if leaves too many, it depends. Um, so, you know, when you talk about like sabotage, I mean, my, my question was, um, who is that, um, that was talking about uh, sabotage? Um, it was Bob was Latino it, and Brian. Uh, Brian. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering how often you actually come across really deliberate sabotage. And if you come across it more than every once in a while, um, uh, I mean, that might be food for thought. It's like Bob is saying, you know, maybe we need to consider what our, our input is um, in something. So um, I obviously am having trouble with that camera anyway. Um, so that's all. It just kind of got me all like, you know, there's a lot to think about. And what I love about Bob is you can ask Bob really hard questions and he's so genuinely curious and, um, and has learned, you know, such humility through his own errors. And, and you hear this in his stories um, that, that he's just like, he just absorbs them, um, you know, with years of experience. So thank you, Bob. You're so nice, Sharon. Thank you. And yeah, thank you, Sharon. And Brian, you're unmuted again. Brian Gesturing, what do you think? Yeah, I just had one other thought. Um, so if you have an organization where there's a leadership problem, how can you fix that? And especially I'm thinking toward governmental agencies. I think private industry, there's actually some external factors and board members and things like that can be responsive. But again, when you have governmental entities, there's not always the biggest uh, uh, motivation to try and move to leadership. There's a lot of agencies where the L and agency stands for leadership. And like the CIA, it doesn't have an L. You know, so how do you go about trying to do that? How would you, uh, is, is it a lost cause? You know, Charles Major or someone more, more able to answer that should jump into that. That's a really good question, Brian. Thank you for asking. Well, Brian, you're, you're probably on this, this same journey is that when we look at things that have increased productivity, made, made the workplace safer, that there's a limit to trying to continuously constrain the worker and, and this scientific methodology, scientific leadership concept that everybody was taught, which everybody has to get their, their shell cracked. If you have an MBA and it's 10 years old or more, you're gonna have to get your shell cracked over this deal because you buy into the fact that this stratification around workers work, supervisors, supervisors, leaders lead, planner plan, and that those other people are smarter than the worker, we're gonna run into a problem when we say, hey, we, we need to take down the barriers, not blame the people at the sharp end of the stick when things go wrong. Really, actually most of that blame and authority is at the other end of the stick, all the way up to the regulator. So when we show the performance over the years uh, and its improvement to those top set of leaders and, uh, you know, SIF, uh, reduction is one of those things, right, that when we look at uh, the in incredible things that have happened in uh, normal OSHA kind of safety through compliance, but then when we look at SIF and how it's been totally unaffected by that compliance level effort, and then we have to understand why people do things and the discretionary effort behind those things to take it to the next level and to focus our attention, you, you start, we're starting to see boards, uh, CEOs, everybody make that switch from a Heinrich type thinking to a SIF reduction type thinking. And that's the same kind of thing, you know, we, we had Ivan on here, right? So he, he comes from a governmental background and agency. Uh, you know, the Forest Service is a great example because look, have other governmental agencies look at them and say they've learned this the hard way that learning is more important than blame and creating an organization and a culture where we have a learning organization and we learn faster and faster all the time from things that go right and things that go wrong, not just things that go wrong. Uh, when we're learning all the time, we just improve, one, our outputs, but when we go to the people who do the work at the sharp end of the stick, who know all the problems and have most of the answers at a much lower uh, cost of uh, implementation, then we also get a more engaged workforce. So it's, it's a message that's way different, almost 180 from what uh, they may have uh, heard in the past, but as more and more people are doing this, it becomes easier and easier for other top leaders to talk to other top leaders. It's not just us weirdos at this conference, right? 
uh, we, we, you know, we have SVPs and CEOs and other people uh, who are also willing to say that message about, I was wrong about the way I thought about the world. Yeah, and I don't, I don't disagree with anything you've said, and I think you really nailed it because I was going to mention about Ivan's presentation where you had the head of the Forest Service actually embracing that culture, which I thought was remarkable. But, you know, my personal experience is coming from government is that when you have uh, a, a situation where agencies are led for short periods of time by political appointees, it's very difficult to them to embrace anything that is accountability. Like if there was a place to put blame, sorry, Bob, they should be the ones that get it up top because they're not embracing a culture that allows that type of thing to happen. And it clearly is it's a transformative nature when they do. The problem is, how do you change that type of situation? Maybe you just can't. Maybe you start in little bits on the bottom and do the best you can. You got very peaceful in the background there, Bob. I don't know if you deliberately changed that or if, if your background automatically set off to the farm ground. <laughs> I deliberately did that. Because yeah. I wanted Very to peaceful. see your face. I wanted to yeah. see your face bigger than I was seeing it before. Well, I have craniomegaly, so you're already suffering. <laughs> um, so. All right. Thanks for that. And we, let's see, we have two more questions we have time for. Uh, Richard Cole, you are unmuted or you were unmuted. Richard, um, did you have something to add there or a, a question? I, th I think in looking at the governmental agencies, I think it's a good point that they're focused. You have a lot of short-term appointees and they leave. We had the same thing in organizations I was in where we had a military officer would run the facility, but he'd only be there for a year. So you had the people in the work, their culture was just get it done and, and we'll be here after he leaves. So you don't change. Todd started on it this morning and he talked about it, experience, beliefs, leads to actions and that leads to results. Unfortunately, most, the higher you are in the hierarchy, the more you're only looking at the results. You're forgetting about what all is going on down there below and you have very little opportunity to get out and look and see. That's the biggest thing we try and get executives to do when we work with them. I tell them is the only way you're ever gonna know what's happening is to go out and look, see the situations that that people are put in, but that's what will continue to change culture. I think that hierarchy, that pyramid is one of the biggest things you got to do is how do you change people's experiences in what happens? So, so it's how does the, your manager, your first line supervisor react when you make a mistake to how does his manager react? And we all have to learn. So if you have to have that start at the top, and get that buy-in to get real change happening. So you have that real experience, but it's, everybody's gonna go through that. It's how do we experience, how, do, how does it feel to us? And, and Bob's way of, of, of no blame, I think is one of the best ways to get that because you get people talking and people own it. When they make a mistake, they'll come and tell you they made the mistake. But the biggest thing you'll get is the introspection of why did I do it that way? There's usually a good reason. I, I've investigated very few accidents where there wasn't a good reason why the person did exactly what they did at the time. So Bob's gets to that, why did we do it? It's usually because, well, we've been doing it that way for a long time, almost always. Thank you for those thoughts. And then, and that is going to be a good segue, I think, along with all of this into our next uh, discussion, next presentation. So thank you, Richard. Bob Nelms, one more nuts and bolts kind of question here from the chat box um, about 10 minutes ago, six minutes ago. So again, poor facilitator job here. I'm just getting to this one. But there's a question on capturing improvements and solutions. Um, who can or should provide solutions when you're doing um, an analysis. The people that were involved. That's a quick answer. I don't know how much I need to elaborate. Well, I, uh, I think it's a good answer. It should not be a formal investigative team that goes in there that's detached from everybody else and, co and comes up with the causes and then recommendations, et cetera. I don't think that's how it should work. The people that were involved in the incident should be, in, 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 you know, included all the way along, and they should be the ones who come up with the, the, uh, the solution, if you will. 
Great. Thank you. Yes. Got some agreements in there. So looks like Bob, we, that's been a great discussion. So thank you very, very much for telling the story in the way that you told it and lighting the, the dashboard up here with lots of questions and conversation. Thank you very much, Dean, and everybody else. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Great conversation. And, and it does lead really nicely into the next um, discussion that we have with Brian, Brian Basquette from Black Dog Associates about um, managing cognitive biases. And Brian, um, you, I think I've given you the, the co-host rights so you can share when you're ready. Um, okay. Yep. But it is, uh, I think, a perfect segue because we heard a lot about a lot of different kind of biases to recognize and manage. So can't wait to hear more from you on this topic. There we go. Okay, very good. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a, a pleasure and an honor to, to talk to you this afternoon about a, an area that I've had a lot of passion in, and that's really uh, helping the knowledge workers do their work very well. Uh, <clears throat> I will start out by, by explaining a couple, a couple of acronyms that I'm going to use. You know, we love acronyms, especially in the nuclear power industry. DOE loves acronyms. Everybody loves acronyms. They're almost like a rite of passage. You know, if you can speak the language, you can speak the acronyms. But they can also be very biased sometimes, you know. I am going to use a, a couple of acronyms today uh, based upon my experiences, my work experiences. One of them is INPO, I-N-P-O. That's the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations, where I retired from. And also OPG, Ontario Power Generation, where I spent three years as their, uh, their, their corporate HU manager. So if you hear INPO or, or, or OPG, that's what I'm talking about. But, you know, they can really be very, very misleading sometimes. I just got an email the other day from the CIA. CIA. Wow, I thought that'd be really neat to go up and work for them, you know, see how spies do and, and all that stuff. But actually, it wasn't the CIA. It was uh, Capital Investment Associates want me to invest money in their in their portfolio. Uh, also, you know, another one is 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 the acronym SOB. What an SOB. Well, most of you think it, uh, that is, is a derogatory uh, comment. But actually, that was the uh, initials of my first wife, my ex-wife. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory manner, but that was her first, middle, and last initial. And we didn't even realize that until somebody gave us some embroidered towels. So she would give me the SOB towel and tell me to go take a shower. Anyway, always uh, keep in mind uh, the acronyms. If you hear me use an acronym, please speak up and let me know, and I'll be happy to... Uh, to define what those are. Also want to use the chat box quite a bit. Uh, I'll be asking you some questions. Uh, I do want you to uh, answer those. Uh, and right now, here's a question I want to start out with. Uh, what has been the most recent important decision that you've made where the decision was not a clear cut choice? It could be work related, it could be personal, uh, but it's gotta be important. And I say that because Every day, on average, people make 35,000 decisions, a lot of decisions. You know, that's over 2,000 an hour of our waking life. Uh, fortunately, most of those decisions are pretty easy, uh, uh, low consequence, non-consequential, but it's those important decisions that can be life-changing. So think about the one that you've made. You don't have to tell us. Just kind of park it somewhere, maybe jot it down, because <clears throat> we're going to come back and talk about it. But as we're as you're thinking about that, you know, what were the consequences if you got the decision right or wrong? What information did you use? Did you get use the right information? How about reaching out to others to get their additional information? Reaching out to experts, reaching out to somebody. Uh, and then how did you confirm that the information and the conclusions you made were co accurate, complete? and based on sound judgment. And it could have been a very painful decision. Now, I woke up this morning and decided, what do I want to have for breakfast? Well, you know, there, there's really not much consequence to that. <clears throat> but if I made a decision about uh, buying a new house 
uh, or, uh, or taking a career uh, alternative, those are huge decisions. And I better make sure that I'm looking at the right information, getting the right input, and also making sure that I'm following a good decision-making process that is controlled and managed uh, from the biases that can come in. So what we're going to talk about, uh, we'll, we'll talk about some context and background. You know, I've learned a lot from Todd Conklin. Todd's my, my hero. I tell you, he's so smart. He's, he's just so witty. And uh, he says things, he said things that I've heard that just stay with me. One of the biggest profound things he taught me was focus on context. We can't understand a problem. We can't understand uh, what happened in an event until we understand the context. So I want to start out with some context today. We'll talk about what are cognitive biases. You know, there's 145 of them last time I checked. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to focus on just the, maybe the top dozen, I think, are, are very applicable to, to, the, to this audience. Uh, we're all susceptible to them. How, how are we susceptible? I'll use some exercises and some uh, examples to show how they influence our decision making and, and uh, how, how our thinking is, is influenced by the biases. You cannot eliminate cognitive biases. Sometimes the same types of processes that lead us to cognitive biases are the same types of processes that also help us make the best decisions. It's according to context. Uh, we'll talk about some common ones uh, and then we'll get to the meat of it. You know, what can we do to manage these cognitive biases? And we'll also look at some event prevention tools that if they're used correctly can help us uncover and manage the cognitive biases. We're also gonna do a breakout session uh, after uh, about an hour and we'll get you together uh, in small groups and you can talk about how to apply this information, some key takeaways. And also if you wanna talk about your significant problem that you jotted down uh, it, it talk about how successful that was and if you see that maybe some cognitive biases came into play with that. And then we'll have you come back and report out and we'll be done by 3.30 Central Time. Okay? All right. <clears throat> I've been uh, involved with the nuclear industry for about 37 years. So I worked at a couple of uh, uh, utilities before going to INPO. Uh, so I've had a lot of great opportunities to work with a whole lot of really smart people. And during our journey with human performance, which is now human and organizational performance, I'm a convert, by the way, uh, <clears throat> we really focused initially on behavior. And that's not a bad place to focus. Behavior is observable. That's how you get to the results that you need. And so we, we came up with these little observation checklists and apps and this and that to, 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 to identify behaviors. And we could, uh, we could uh, trend those behaviors. And if we see... Uh, some, some uh, uptake in, in, in at-risk behaviors. We could do some interventions and all that's very, very good. And also we talked about re reinforcing behaviors, you know, going out and thanking people when they, when they have the safe behaviors and reinforcing those, uh, you know, giving out meal chits. I remember that was a big thing until this one plant was giving out meal chits to their cafeteria and people looked at it as punishment. It's just terrible food. But a lot of times, you know, the positive reinforcements are uh, appreciated. But all that's external. And the shift now has become, since about 2010, where we actually found that it's more than just the behavior. It's the intent. It's the motivations behind the behavior. It's how well the person believes that the behavior is important. It's all these internal things, the thinking, uh, the beliefs, and all that, <clears throat> that really goes from behavioral psychology to cognitive behavioral psychology. And that's a big shift that aligns with, very well with HOP. Uh, and so this operating experience has also told us that, you know, if we have an active error that triggers an event, uh, there's probably four to 10 latent errors that set up that active error to happen. And if we really want to focus on active errors, let's focus on those latent errors and latent conditions. And many of those latent errors and latent conditions have been driven by cognitive biases. So there's a lot of reason for going to this and really focusing on trying to uncover and manage it. Here's a little, uh, we, we've, I think most everybody's seen the, the iceberg 
uh, analogy uh, with events. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use this iceberg analogy to kind of show uh, the relationship behave, between behavior and results and what goes in to having those behaviors and results occur. We got to understand what people were thinking at a particular time when the event occurred. We got, to, uh, we got to understand what people are thinking when they come up with aha moments. And a lot of our thinking is driven by our beliefs, our beliefs about what's right and wrong, what's important to us. And I had a story one time <clears throat> about uh, uh, back when we had the World Trade Center. Of course, that was a long time ago. But uh, we, we asked a group, uh, if you <clears throat> had somebody, somebody who will give you $100,000, and they put a harness on you, and there's a cable from one top of one uh, World Trade Center building to the other, would you go across that to the other side for $100,000? What about $500,000? What about a million? And you know, so you get some people raising their hand, but then I change the question to this. What if you're grandchild or your child or somebody you love dearly was on the other side and their life depended upon you going across, would you do it? And almost 100% of the people said yes. Uh, now that goes down significantly if you ask somebody about their spouse. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it goes down to about 68% there, but that's only if it's anonymous, by the way. Okay, we all have perceptions. What are perceptions? Well, perceptions are thoughts, uh, they're uh, judgments. Uh, we, we take all this information in from our, uh, our surrounding and it's literally thousands of bits of data. And we have to interpret that data and only focus right. on certain portions. Sorry? Did somebody say something? Let me look at my chat here, okay. So the thing about perceptions is they're real to the person who is perceiving something, but that doesn't mean that the other person next to them is seeing the same thing. So the way that you understand perceptions is you ask the right questions. And seeking to understand before being understood is a very important part of dealing with cognitive biases. Okay, what do you see here? You see two words, right? Teach and learn. Of course, you know, that's how we learn. If somebody teaches us and we teach ourselves. But what meaning does this illustration have for you? If you were to write a statement on what this means, write it in your chat box. I want to see how you interpret this illustration. They mirror each other. It depends. Okay. You learn when you teach. The words mirror each other. Yes. So some people uh, agree on their perception. Others have different perceptions. But why do people differ on their perceptions? Any ideas? Experience. Absolutely. Yes, Catherine. We all have different experiences. We all have different upbringings. We all have different uh, aha moments. We all, we, we, we've all had different painful experiences, uh, life experiences, and some are significant. And those significant life experiences can, uh, can uh, be with us forever and they will forever change our lives. Different perspectives, uh, different cultures. We come up from different cultures. Uh, the human condition is the same regardless of the culture but the culture helps drive a lot of behaviors that we see in our work organizations, uh, in the places that we live, uh, all those types of things. Okay. Henry Ford, you know, he was big in scientific management. You know, he started the assembly lines uh, up in uh, Detroit and they were able to manufacture a forge very, very quickly. Um, but this is, a, this is a quote that I think has a lot of relevance. It is, it's really hard to think. 
you know, think about those times that you've really been engrossed in, in, in doing uh, something that was uh, very, very taxing. And at the end of the day, you're, you're more exhausted than if you were going out and doing manual labor. It's really hard work to think. And, you know, people basically like to find easier ways to do things. And that's where the, the, the word heuristics comes into play. Heuristics are those shortcuts that we come up with, those rules of thumb, those efficient ways of tackling problems. They, they usually work very well for us, but sometimes they can be an air trap. You know, they'll lead us to the wrong conclusions. Uh, they'll lead us into cognitive biases. So we need to understand these heuristics and we need to understand when, when they're hindering our good decision-making. Okay, cognitive biases, cognitive biases, <clears throat> they influence our decision-making, okay? Uh, they're a type of error in thinking. Now, how do you know if, if a person has an error in thinking? You know, it's like going to a knowledge worker and doing an observation on a knowledge worker. What do you do? Sit there, watch them think in their cubicle? Of course not. The only way you can uh, really do an observation with somebody like that is to have a dialogue with them. Ask them to, <clears throat> excuse me, to review uh, something they're working on. Uh, ask them to, uh, to talk about uh, how they went about finishing a project or how they came upon a particular decision or how they did a calculation. Uh, and that's how you find the possibility of errors in thinking. Uh, and that's how you can uncover cognitive biases also. But it's our brain's attempt to simplify, simplify things. Human beings do not like chaos. We like to put order to chaos. And sometimes when we do that, when we have a chaotic situation, what we'll do is put together a mental, uh, mental model. Mental models can be helpful or they can hinder. It's the, depending upon how, how accurate that they are. But many times people will come up with a mental model and they'll hold on to that mental model and all the information they get is used to validate that mental model instead of keeping an open mind with it. So it's really the difference between our perceived reality and the assumptions that we make about our mental model. And we do make assumptions. Everything we do, we have to make assumptions. Very, very important. Okay, Richard Cole. Dr. Cole is a very intelligent man. And uh, I asked him uh, beforehand if he would uh, work with me on this. So Richard, I'm gonna ask you to read this slide to us. Only smart people can read this. I couldn't believe that I could actually understand what I was reading. The Phenomenal Power of the Human Mind according to a research at Cambridge University it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and the last letter be in the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. Amazing, huh? And I was always taught spelling was important. Wow, Richard. What a great job you just did. But spelling is uh, certainly not there, that's for sure. So let's think about this little example and how it applies to cognitive biases, because it has a lot of applications to a lot of the events that we've, we've had to experience in our high reliability organizations. Now, if you look at this and you see the first and last word, uh, the first and last letter of the word being able to uh, to show Richard what the word is actually is, then ask yourself how that applies to procedures. Think about procedures. Everybody's had issues with procedure use and adherence, okay? It's, uh, uh, you know, you'll, you'll say, oh my gosh, we had this event and the person didn't follow the procedure as written and you go out and you investigate and you find out, well, everybody knows what that procedure means. But then you get a new person that doesn't know how to interpret that uh, misspelled word or that, or that uh, error in the procedure, and they, have, they, they trigger an event. It's because people are filling in what they perceive the procedure should say versus what it actually says. And it's all because of cognitive biases. 
And that's the insight of looking at cognitive biases and being able to uncover them so you can learn from them and manage them in the future. Okay, hold on just a sec. Okay, I think most of us have seen this uh, generic uh, model. Uh, basically, it, it goes like this. Uh, uh, the, uh, the more familiar you are with a task, uh, the uh, better you're able to do it with less attention. Uh, and basically, we spend a lot of our time in skill-based uh, learning, a skill-based performance. And many times, we will lower the level of attention, lower than it needs to be, and that can cause a, uh, that can trigger an event. Uh, uh, based upon an active error. Now, if you're following through skill base, which we do about 90% of our time, uh, then the error rate is, is, is very low, as you can see. But then something changes. It's not, uh, you're not as familiar with the change that's happened. So then you go to rule-based, the if-then. And many times what happens with that is we misinterpret either the event or we misinterpret the conditions for which uh, uh, the, uh, the rule, I'm sorry, or we misinterpret the conditions under which that rule is supposed to be followed. <clears throat> That's where you get into cognitive biases. And also, knowledge-based. That's where the error rate goes up tremendously. Uh, it's because we don't have a clear-cut rule to follow. We have to rely on our judgment. We have to rely on our knowledge. We have to rely on our experience. And this is where we can get into inaccurate mental pictures. The inaccurate mental picture can occur many times if we don't manage our cognitive biases. So I'll show you that because when we talk about cognitive biases, they can also, uh, they can be involved in any, any of these three, but absolutely we need to be very mindful of them in knowledge-based performance when we're making mental models. <clears throat> okay, uh, I'm going to call on somebody else who's very, very intelligent, uh, Tanya Hewitt. Uh, Tanya, uh, I, I uh, had a chance to have Tanya uh, come to OPG uh, when I worked there, and she uh, was involved with an audit by our regulator. And a uh, very, very insightful lady. Uh, I know she's going to do great. Uh, with this exercise, but I want her to uh, demonstrate it for me. So, Tanya, are you there? I am. All right. Thanks for playing along. I appreciate it. Uh, just start out with the first one. The, uh, first, I just want you to state the word and not the color of the word. Let's see how well you do there. Yellow, blue, orange. I keep going? Yes, please. Okay. Black, red, Green, purple, yellow, red, orange, green, black, blue, red, purple, green, blue, orange. Good, good. Now, Tanya, I'd suspect that you've seen those letters of those words, the letters of those words, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times already. So I think it's safe to assume that you were in uh, skill-based mode, right? Okay. Now, what I want you to do is state the color of the word and not the word. Green, red, blue, yellow, blue, black, red, blue, green, black, red, yellow, green, blue, black, blue, red, green. Okay, excellent. You were a little slower that second time though, weren't you? Quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. So, so why was the second uh, exercise more difficult to do than the first one? I had to really think about what I was going to say. <laughs> there you go. See, we had her go from skill-based mode to rule-based mode, and we saw that it took more focus, more thought, because she's going if-then, if-then. Uh, and that's what happens with cognitive biases. They can sneak in when we sneak into either rule-based or knowledge-based performance mode. Okay, here's some examples of cognitive biases. Um, first, you know, we tend to notice things that confirms our belief rather than contradicts them. Uh, that's a bias that's very easy to fall into. Uh, 
you know, we'll rational away, uh, rationalize away facts. Uh, and the reason why we'll already have a mental model in place. And if the facts doesn't fit our mental model, we dismiss it or rationalize it away or make an excuse for it. Um, and we're all social beings, very much so. We want to be involved with a team. We want to be involved with a group. Uh, and we don't want to let the team or the group down. So we, we will pretty much follow the norm of the team in many respects. Uh, we know that if when we're using the substitution uh, rule. You know, people will do what the norm has them do rather than what the formal rule has them do. And that's because we're social beings. Uh, and we'll tend to rush through a conclusion. And once we have our conclusion, then we just go around confirming uh, that conclusion rather than actually being more critical and skeptical and uh, examining all the facts. Now, let me ask you, uh, does anybody know the answer to that, uh, that statement, a blind beggar had a brother who died? What relationship was a blind beggar, beggar to the brother who died? And brother's not the answer. Does anybody know the answer to that? If you do, chat it out for me. Ah, yes, sister, very good. Well, I, when I first saw this, I couldn't figure it out to save my life because I had a mental model that all blind beggars were men. I don't know why I had that. Maybe I'm somehow biased in that way. But, uh, but once somebody identified sister, it was kind of an aha moment for me. And that's really what we can do when we uncover these cognitive biases, they can really help us have an aha moment and they'll stick with us. And we can use that experience going forward. Okay, let's talk about some uh, common cognitive biases. Uh, anchoring of uh, the anchoring bias. You know, that's really basically uh, what we see. Uh-oh, I didn't want to start that. Let me, let, me, let me stop that right now. Uh, the uh, anchoring bias, you know, it's whatever we see first uh, will bias our judgment going forward. And, and a good example of that, see those numbers? Which is a larger number? Somebody type an answer. Is it the first one, eight times seven times six times five? Or is it one times two times three times four? Which is a larger number? They're equal. My first instinct is to say that they're the same. Okay. Well, they really are the same. It was a trick question. Uh, but generally speaking, if you show this to large audiences, uh, most people will come to the conclusion that the eight times seven one is larger because you started out with larger numbers. And that's how anchoring bias can, can uh, persuade our decision making. Uh, confirmation bias is another one. Uh, you know, we tend to find things that confirm our beliefs and our conclusions uh, rather than be uh, uh, questioning about those. <clears throat> that way we will prematurely discount those things that conflict with our beliefs. Confirmation bias. Attribution I, uh, error, that's when we attribute the actions of others to their character flaws, our perceived character flaws that we think they have, rather than uh, doing that for ourselves, if we make a mistake, then we attribute it to the situation around us uh, rather than uh, our character flaw. A good example, you may have a, uh, an employee uh, who was late uh, getting a project done, and you may attribute that to the, uh, their being lazy, when in fact, uh, that individual may have had some uh, personal illness or may have had a family member who was ill. There's a lot of other reasons why wow. just being lazy. <coughs> Excuse me. Self-serving bias. Uh, we tend to uh, attribute to, uh, the success that we're involved with to our own uh, strengths uh, rather than really attributing to uh, the failures of others. Uh, when somebody does something wrong or we're involved with an event, it's really easy uh, to kind of self-serve ourselves and then uh, look at other people as really being the culprits. And that gets back to the blame game that we've talked about all day. Uh, that's the typical thing. You know, you've heard managers and, and, and uh, workers talk about, God, what were they thinking? 
when they when they did that, you know? Well, you know what? Uh, it's easy to, to uh, wait till after an event occurs and start doing that. What were they thinking? Because you weren't there when it happened. And then gambler's fallacy. Uh, this was one that happened a whole lot with the uh, um, Columbia accident. I'll show you a little video about this. Hey, Brian, the audio is not coming through. What's that? I'm sorry. Yeah, the audio is not coming through. Oh, so it's not? I'm sorry. Let me see here. Yeah, you might need to. Re re okay, now screen. we'll try. Let me start over. Thank you. Now we're still not getting it. Brian, if you unshare your screen and then reshare it, when you go to share it again. Okay, bottom, now let me try that because according to me, it's unmuted. Let me stop it. Okay. Okay. The bottom left will be a share audio option. Bottom left, share sound okay very good thank you very much sorry about that everybody common error trap others hold on to stock that's fallen because they believe it can't 20 coin flips have all landed head side up okay Gamza's fallacy is an incorrect assumption that a random event is more or less likely to occur after another event or series of events. For example, 20 coin flips have all landed head side up. The next flip is more likely to be tails, right? Wrong. Every coin toss is an independent event with a 50% probability of landing on heads, regardless of what's happened in the past. In the same way, a slot machine will not eventually hit the jackpot if a gambler plays on it for hours and hours. The probability of winning is the same on each play. He may believe he's getting closer to the jackpot, but he isn't. Some investors liquidate a position after it goes up, because they believe it can't possibly continue to go up. Others hold on to stock that's fallen because they believe it can't possibly decline any further. Investors shouldn't base decisions on gamblers' fallacies, but rather on fundamental analysis. Because each event is independent and the past doesn't change the probability of future events. Very good. Yes, that's a, that's a very prevalent one as well. I mean, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not a big gambler myself, but I do like to go play roulette. And uh, sometimes, and, you know, you see 10, the last 10 times it fell on black. So what's the tendency? Well, I'm going to put my money on black, but it's really still 50%. And that's where we have to be careful because our experiences we rely on to make decisions. And just because we've had success over and over using this one uh, approach doesn't necessarily mean it's going to fit the next approach. That's our gam gambler's fallacy can creep into our, uh, our decision-making. And the last one, this is really relevant, outcome bias. Particularly, uh, uh, you know, we judge the success by the result and not by looking at the actual at-risk behaviors that we had and the, uh, the, the fallacies that we decided on. Sometimes, quite frankly, we just get lucky. Now, I remember a lot of outages uh, uh, at, at the plants uh, where, you know, they say, oh, we got, we got the outage done uh, on budget and on time. And then they start the plant up and it, it trips uh, three or four times because we didn't do the right work and we didn't do uh, the proper work and we didn't scope it out right. But the outcome, I remember uh, one of my uh, colleagues at a DOE plant one time, uh, his plant manager after an outage uh, gave everybody a mug that said, um, under budget, ahead of schedule, enough said. And he gave it to everybody at the plant. And, and you know, this, this poor HU manager was getting ready to pull his hair out. 
that was the wrong message uh, to send to these folks. Uh, some more bandwagon effects. Uh, I got another little video to show that. Can you all hear that? You can't? No, now it's going. Okay. There you go. Why are you guys drinking Diet Coke? Everyone in Carmel drinks regular Coke. Hey, we got regular Cokes. That's cool. Yeah, these are uh, much better than Diet Cokes, yeah. Yeah, you know, peer pressure is, is a very strong uh, influencer of behaviors. And people don't like to be an outside, outlier, uh, so they'll conform. Uh, but that can be very, very dangerous uh, because you may have an illusion of, uh, of consensus when in fact you don't have it. I've, I've heard many, many times where <clears throat> two people who were involved in an event, one was a senior level person, one was a junior level person, and uh, the senior level person had a really strong reputation uh, as being one of the best technicians. And then he does something and the junior person does not uh, question him because it's, it's, a, it's a social situation, uh, especially in, in like meetings when you're trying to come up with a decision. Uh, it's very, very important that people have the psychological safety to speak up uh, when they disagree or they need to ask questions. One of the best tools you have uh, to manage cognitive biases is asking the hard questions. A framing effect, again, that sometimes framing, reframing things is good, where you take a situation and you explain it in different terms because it helps us look at things differently. But if it's not used correctly, you may reframe uh, a problem inaccurately. So you have to make sure that when you're using the framing effect, that you still follow that healthy skepticism and making sure the reframing is not dismissing some of the facts. A high hindsight bias, we all have seen that, you know, the Monday morning quarterback league that comes in after, after an event. And boy, I tell you, it's really clear what they should have done. Well, they weren't there. So hindsight bias uh, can, can really help us get off the learning and over to the blame. We want to stay away from that. Uh, Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, that's when we overestimate our own ability to do something or overestimate our knowledge to do something. Oh, my gosh. I can tell you a lot of war stories on this where I really think I'm a good handyman, uh, and it looks so easy when the plumber does some kind of work, and I said, I can do that. Well, <laughs> no, it didn't work out too well. I think we can all kind of agree with that, uh, falling into those traps. Uh, ostrich bias really, really big sometimes when we go back to the people who we have a lot of trust and faith in. Uh, you know, we, we see them in a certain lights, kind of like the halo effect, uh, where you just put your head into sand and don't really listen to anything negative or any, any kind of challenge to a particular decision. Everything's going to be good. Everything's great. Uh, you know, I, my wife was a teacher, first grade school teacher. And sometimes if she had a really misbehaving child that she had problems with, she could call in the, the parents for a conference. And they come in and, well, my little Johnny never does anything bad at school, uh, at home. My little Johnny's a good boy. <clears throat> a lot of that's the ostrich effect. And our favorite employees, think about that. Uh, sometimes a manager will have their favorite employee. And, uh, you know, everything that they do, they, they kind of get a pass for it. And uh, they set a new standard ostrich bias. Recency bias, we tend to gauge more, uh, uh, more evidence on recent things and tend to dis dismiss those things that happened a long time ago. We see that in performance appraisals. You know, you did, you really had a strong year, you got accomplished a lot, there was a lot of great results, uh, and then uh, two weeks before performance appraisal time, you make a big mistake, 
And that's what your uh, boss focuses on, what happened two weeks ago, rather than, you know, the, the, all the uh, 12 months that you were getting evaluated against. Okay, here's how we manage cognitive biases. <clears throat> First thing is being self-aware, self-awareness, self-correction. Uh, really looking and doing some self-reflection, uh, asking ourselves how we came about to make this decision, asking people for feedback. Uh, the team, uh, if the team is healthy and there's healthy inquiry and there's healthy advocacy and everybody has psychological safety, uh, then they can challenge each other in a constructive way. You know, I had a guy one time at Impo I worked with, he had a, he had a, a term called technical arrogance. And he was an ops guy. <clears throat> and he would go to the plant sometime and he would talk to some, some operators about something he perceived as, a, as an issue. And uh, they just had this technical arrogance. And they go off on their technical uh, abilities and kind of just dismiss whatever skepticism that he may have. So what I've found in, in my experiences is those people who are truly, truly experts, experts in their field, those are the folks that know that they still need to learn and they don't think they've made it to the top of the mountain. It's, it's a continuous learning process and that's why they are experts. The other one I, I really like is Humble Inquiry. Uh, Edgar Schein wrote a book called Humble Inquiry. Really good read. Uh, but the idea behind that is you need to be humble. You don't need to think you have all the answers. Are you the smartest person in the whole world? Are you the smartest person in, in the place? Yes, you want to use your experience, but help me understand is a wonderful term to use to show humble inquiry. It's neutral uh, and you need to try to maintain your neutrality. Even if you do come to a conclusion, question that conclusion. Challenging assumptions. I worked with a plant one time <clears throat> years ago when I was at Impo, where the plant manager called us to, to help him uh, figure out uh, some of the flaws that they were having in some of their decision making. They had um, uh, turbine driven auxiliary feed pumps. And those who are, uh, have worked in the PWRs know that they can be very problematic pieces of equipment. And they had some problems with them. They shut the plant down. They went in, they, they troubleshooted, they, they put a fix together, and they started the plant back up. Well, that wasn't the fix. They had to shut back down again. Again, they went through the troubleshooting. They thought they fixed the problem, and they started up a second time. And then they had to shut down the third time. Now, the third time, the regulator was, was really skeptical of uh, how they were doing. And, and the regulator basically said, until you can convince us that you thoroughly troubleshooted this issue with your equipment and you fixed the true uh, causes of this, this equipment problem, we're not gonna let you start back up. And so <clears throat> we went in, we did a little assessment. We had a, had a workshop and did some learning. We didn't call them learning teams back then, but we did what, what I would call a learning team. And we got the right people together and asked them what was going on. And one thing that came very clear, their culture was a culture of not uh, validating assumptions. They were not validating assumptions. Uh, they were treating assumptions as facts, particularly when they came from certain people who were held in very high esteem. And so they put some things together uh, to make sure that they were uh, properly validating their assumptions. They got their, their uh, pumps fixed and they are, were able to start back up. And it was a very good learning opportunity for that particular site. Kind of like what Bob was talking about earlier about pain. That was a very painful learning experience for that plant, but they did take their learnings and they applied them uh, going forward. <clears throat> healthy teamwork. If you have healthy te teamwork where open challenging, open respectful challenging goes on, it's embraced, it's reinforced. Uh, you have the proper uh, diversity to have good team proficiency uh, and you have an open reporting process uh, to ask the right questions. That's very good, very, very important. And that requires the team to uh, address, identify and address any air traps that they may have, such as, uh, you know, time pressure continues to be a common air trap. And, and a lot of times it's more self-imposed, uh, but sometimes it's also externally imposed. But knowing that, you're able to manage it. 
And then finally, addressing context, understand how that happened, understand how we went back and, and made our decisions, understand how we decided what information that we're gonna address. <clears throat> so the how-to is a very important way of, uh, of managing our cognitive biases because you can uncover them that way. And something else I wanna, I wanna tell you I found that be very helpful, especially when, we're, when I'm doing a learning group, is having that soak time, having some time for people to soak, getting away, taking a break, uh, and, and a significant break, two hours. Uh, sometimes it, it's overnight and they come back the next day, but uh, sometimes a minimum of two hours is what you need so that people can go out and self-reflect about where we started, the progress we've made, and asking the right questions. And just about every time I've done the soak time thing, I come back with some excellent, my, the team comes back with some excellent, rich answers. Really good. And also some rich questions as well. <clears throat> Here's some more things. Uh, being aware of the risk factors. We always have risk. There's different levels, but the first thing we have to do is be aware of that risk. Once we're aware of it and the seriousness of it, then we can put in uh, things in place to manage it. You know, time pressure being fatigue. Think about how we act uh, when, we, when we're really, really fatigued. We had, a, we had an event one time uh, back before they had uh, the um, work hour uh, exceptions. And we, had a, 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 we were going in an, an outage and this gentleman had worked for 23 days straight without a day off, 12 hour shifts. And guess what? He triggered an event. Well, you could have predicted that, right? <clears throat> and that was back when, you know, first thing you want to do is blame him. He was a uh, supplemental worker and they wanted to fire him and all that. We, luckily, we were able to, to persuade the leaders to use this as a learning opportunity. And they were ex actually much more mindful of, uh, of, of managing uh, work hours. Lack of information, uh, being aware how we affect others in our communications. It's not what we say, it's how you say it, as you know. A good example of that is I'm gonna say this sentence uh, several ways, you know, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? What were you thinking? So, you, you know, if you'll say that, you're gonna say it in a neutral, uh, healthy way and not in a sarcastic way. And you know, the, the leading questions, you agree with that, don't you? And that's really big in groupthink. Groupthink can be very uh, uh, apparent when you see a lot of leading questions, rhetorical questions, and people know the answer before they're asked. That's all about using the, the faint signal observations, uh, you know, looking and seeing the body language of people in, in the room. Uh, seeing who's speaking and who's not speaking. Where's the eye contact coming? All of that can tell you whether you have false sense of con uh, consensus and whether you really have an engaged thinking team. And then there's another thing called cognitive dissonance. I know that's a, that's a psychological term, but I think it's a very important term, particularly with cognitive biases and going back to self-awareness. Sometimes in our work lives and even in our personal lives, we're directed to do things that we don't believe are the right things to do. Uh, it could be a boss wanting you to take a shortcut uh, in the work situation, or maybe having to uh, uh, go around and circumvent a particular uh, process. And when you do it, you have this sense of uneasiness. It's really our way of telling ourselves this is the wrong thing to do. That's cognitive biases. <clears throat> if you have contradictory beliefs and behaviors. So when you have cognitive bias, uh, dissonance, I'm sorry, cognitive dissonance, you need to be aware of that. And when you're aware of it, you need to ask the, right, the, the tough questions. Why do I have this knot in my stomach? Uh, what's, what's, where's that coming from? Because that could be a cue that you could be experiencing some hidden cognitive biases. Here's some uh, uh, performance, uh, error performance, event-free tools uh, that can also help us if you use them correctly. Um, questioning attitude, you know, for a while there, everything was lack of questioning attitude. What do you mean by that? Well, it's just, you know, having that he healthy skepticism where you're asking the right questions. 
uh, and validating assumptions. You can't validate them unless you know what they are. And sometimes we, we use assumptions as facts, particularly we have a mental model. So just stepping back and asking ourselves, what are our assumptions? And then confirming that those assumptions are the right assumptions can really help us. You know, peer check, independent verification, uh, concurrent verification, if they're done in a robust way, they can certainly help us uh, alleviate or manage these cognitive biases. Using, using precise communications. Now, I remember we first rolled out three-way, three-part communications uh, when I was working at Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station. The operators hated it, hated it, stupid. This is way too much trouble, blah, blah, blah. But then after we've practiced with them on the simulator, they caught some subtle mistakes in their communications. And once they saw that, they were able to embrace it as something good. Peer check, the same thing, peer checking. You know, I'm not going to uh, look over my buddy's shoulder. And I'm not a supervisor. But then as they were doing them, ah, wow, I got your back. They were able to embrace them. And then, of course, challenge meetings. Uh, those are always very, very good for knowledge workers, where you play devil's advocate, challenge advocate. And one last thing is signature. You really have to have people really think about what their signature means. It's their word. It's their professional reputation on the line. And they should not sign their signature very lightly. I mean, if you're going to write a check for $10,000, you're going to make sure it's written the right way. It's written to the right person. And there's a good reason for you to spend $10,000 before you sign it, right? <clears throat> so all these can help also alleviate uh, cognitive biases or manage them. Okay. Here's some questions to help you uh, uh, challenge yourself, uh, your team <clears throat> with, uh, with cognitive biases, know, knowing the path that you followed. Uh, it's not just the, the decision, but how you came to it and the conclusion. How did you come to that? You know, making sure that the information you're using is accurate, complete, current, and unbiased, validating uh, our conclusions, and, and, and feeling free to, to uh, to dismiss those options, even if they <clears throat> were important to you, get your pride out of the way, be humble, and uh, admit that uh, that was the wrong conclusion. If you could do that early rather than later, it can, uh, it can certainly uh, dismiss a lot of uh, possible pain. And make it you get the right people, the right input. Uh, and, and I really like what Bob was talking about, uh, uh, about the... Uh, Oh, one, one, one of the speakers before me was talking about uh, getting somebody uh, if from, uh, from outside who didn't know a lot about what they were talking about, and they were able to really to uncover a lot of things that nobody saw. Very, very important. Uh, air traps, blind spots, we all have blind spots, and that's why it's good to get somebody else involved, because we can't see our blind spots. Okay, that's how all that I have. Um, do we want to go into small groups now or you want to go ahead and, and open up for questions? How about we do this, Brian? Let's go into just a few, uh, a little bit of time with small group breakout sessions, just to take okay. maybe, to, to take 10 minutes or so. Okay. Tick around those questions that you have on the screen. Um, so we'll divide the group up random or this whole group up randomly into smaller five, six person groups. Um, and then just ask you to think about those questions. So what we'll need to do is I will, uh, I'll assign the groups. Um, we'll take about 10 minutes or so, 12 minutes in there. Think about those questions that you see up on the screen, key takeaways. How would you apply it? Um, yeah, I like that, the questions you've got there, Brian, around cognitive biases and how they influence your decision and how can you overcome those kinds of barriers. I think they're, they're good things to talk about in the breakout groups. Um, and then we'll, we'll bring you back into a large group and you can just kind of share a few of the insights that you all had. Does that sound fair? That sounds like a good plan to me, Dean. Thank you. Cool. All right, we'll go with, uh, it is eight minutes until the hour. Um, we'll give you about 10 minutes. I'll give you some time signals in the breakout group rooms, and then we'll just come back. So here we go. Slow okay. Uh, 
Dean, uh, do you want me to go through all the, how many groups did we have, by the way? Well, you know what, we we ended up with 10, which was quite a few. So maybe what we do, Brian, is just like, let's get some volunteers to just talk about some highlights from your group. And okay. Maybe yeah, we that's, don't need that's good. We'll keep it open. Yeah. Yeah. So let's just look for a volunteer or two or five that want to share some highlights from your discussion. So who wants to just jump in? I, I took notes. So I'll, I'll go. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. So um, a, a few things. 35,000 decisions a day. It makes sense to offload onto shortcuts and rules of thumb. That was like, that's a lot of decisions. Um, uh, another was cognitive biases rooted in more primal senses are hardest to overcome. And, and they're, they're the hardest to notice in ourselves. They're the hardest to bring to the attention of others. Um, and, uh, and when you build a house in a pandemic, hindsight bias pays off because the cost of wood now is so absorbent. <laughs> it makes you happy that you did the work. That's awesome, Sharon. Thank you. Let's see, who else wants to share some highlights from their discussion? We've got a few other people unmuted. Daniel, you're unmuted. Is that because you would like to share something? I'd love to hear it. Sure, sure, why not? Other than the fact that I think I monopolized the whole time in our breakout, but um, no, we, we had some great discussions, uh, largely about diversity. Um, uh, you know, I think one thing we, we had in common is, you know, we employ, our, our different environments employ a lot of engineers, some of them PhDs, some of them scientists. And, um, you know, unfortunately, when what they create as far as policy and procedure um, gets put into implementation, it's not those same individuals who are putting their hands into very dangerous equipment at times. So, uh, you know, getting, getting um, those documents and those policies and procedures reviewed by the people who have to interpret them and understand them and know the repercussions of what each and every step might mean if it's done either correctly or incorrectly, uh, how important that is. Yeah, great thoughts. Thank you. And let's take one more, and then Brian, I'll turn to you for some insights. If you heard. So, uh, Janet Amos, you're unmuted. Also, what do you think? Oh my, I didn't mean to be unmuted, but um, I, I, I can. You, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I mean, I can just say, uh, you know, a few things. I also, um, I also joined the conversation late. I, I had meetings, but I, I think what was really interesting is, um, you know, we. I guess talking about our own biases in many, many different ways. I shared example when I was in social work and how child protection officers had biases about correction, patrol, uh, parole officers who had biases about mental health workers. And, you know, one of the things we did was get people in the room to talk about what they actually did. Um, and so try to dismiss a lot of assumptions. So I'm not sure if this is in line with what you were wanting to talk about, but I think sometimes it's really get, asking people to share what it is they do and how they do it and why they do it and and you can kind of move beyond and, and I guess the other point was about taking time up front um, you know we, we tend to have I tend to have this desire to move things through quickly but taking that really important time up front to try and think about what might be my cognitive biases and having others think about that would actually make a better plan decision yeah but I mean maybe I'll open it up to the other group um, yeah uh, members of my group thank you Thank you, Janet. That was and, great. Yeah, really good insights. Yeah, we have, and Galen, you're also unmuted. Galen, what do you think? Yeah, so uh, Jason, you would you like to tell that quick story? My other team? Yeah. yeah, sure, about the glasses? Yeah, yeah, just Jason had a quick story, and then, and then I'll share a quick thought. <clears throat> Sure. Yeah. We were just talking about like we had a recent incident a couple of weeks ago where, uh, you know, a couple of electrical workers, there was a there was an arc flash and uh, uh, one of the workers, the lead hand had, I don't know, a few days before had said that he didn't want to be a lead hand anymore, want to go back to the line work, didn't want to be, you know, didn't want the responsibility. Well, anyway, they're doing this job. He was the lead. He was senior person on site. Uh, he had an arc flash while he was uh, while he was uh, splicing together two phases. They were, turned out to be out of phase. 
anyway, we, you know, the way we do incidents now, I've got, we very quickly, I get together the, the VPs from the areas, uh, I'm the VP of safety, we get everybody together, we talk through the, the details, understand whether it's reportable. Right away, one of the VPs starts going on about, oh, you know, what was his state of mind? I mean, he didn't want to be a lead hand, he didn't want to be there, he's supposed to be setting the example, you know, you know, what's going on here? They, we found out he didn't have the right glasses on, he didn't have arc-rated glasses on, you know, this is negligence, you know, we need to drug and alcohol test. And I said, just hold on, like, just slow down, guys. Like, let's get the facts before we start jumping to conclusions. Well, long story short, two days later, we start getting into the details. We found out we didn't have any arc rated glasses for anybody because our something went wrong in our inventory system and everybody in the field was operating without these glasses. So, I think a lot of people learned quite a valuable lesson about biases there. Uh, you know, bringing he, you know bringing to the to the discussion his basically bias that this guy you know wasn't going to do the right job or wasn't doing the right thing, and you know, unfortunately, he the VP learned a lesson there. But it just shows you you just have to be objective when you go into these things, right? That that's what we're kind of Colin and I talked about. Galen and I talked about that a little bit. Yeah, it's a good story, Jason. Galen, do you want to build on that a little? Yeah, just 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 to build on it. I, I, I appreciate that, Jason. I, I thought that was a perfect story scenario for this this group. So we want discretionary effort from our employees. It will take a 30-year man that's answered the bell every time we've called on him, day, night, weekends, rain, sleet, or snow, and we have one event and we're going to drug test him. Now, how do yeah. you is that? <laughs> I've showed up for 30 years and been your guy. And now you want to kind of treat me like a criminal. So we'll think in the real world. So we want discretionary effort, but the, the key I asked Jason, how do we fix this? This, this bias, like the automatically, well, he didn't want to do it. And he, he, you know, maybe we need, maybe some drugs or how do we, why do we think stuff like that? How do we fix it? Well, we both said the same thing. I thought it was interesting. If you go back to rule number one, HBI, people come to work to do a good job. So right. at least give them that. The benefit of the doubt, trust. Jason said right. trust. At, yeah. at least show them some trust. They, they've been your guy for 30 years, so they must be trustworthy. So let's show some, let's show some trust and let's always, if we're not sure what to do, fall back on rule number one. 99.9% .9 of the people want to do a good job and they want to go home safely to their family. And so uh, I thought I thought it was a great illustration. Yeah, thank you. And let's take one more and then Brian, I'll turn to you for some uh, some thoughts about what you heard. But Richard Cole, you're unmuted too. What do you think? I was talking with Ken Wolfer and one of the biggest things we were talking about is avoiding getting into question checklist type mentalities because they tend to bring biases in if all you're going to do is ask a certain script of questions, you'll find that you'll get the answers to those questions, but you don't get all the stuff between the lines of the questions that you didn't learn. So I learned a technique called cognitive interviewing several years ago, and I'll thank Charles Major for helping make, being one of the main ones that made that happen. But I've worked with the teacher, Ron Fisher, since then. And, and I find out it's one of the best ways is just ask very open questions. Tell me everything you can about what you were doing, you know, that night, that afternoon, that evening. Don't leave out. No detail is too small and nothing was going and just let them go. I think that's one of the things that goes with learning teams. Once you get the group dynamics going, whatever you can do to just start telling you all that was going on. And then the last thing that I'll bring up is first get all that information. The last thing I'll do is always take the people back to where it was and see what kind of conditions they were really learning in. Because sometimes they won't even know that they were working in an adverse condition because they've worked in it for the last 10 years. So it's not adverse to them anymore. It's just conditions. Always go look. Thank you, Richard. Brian, what did you hear out of all that? Wow, a lot of really great insights. Uh, a lot of uh, good uh, examples uh, of uh, how these cognitive biases can lead us wrong, down the wrong path. A lot of really good ideas on how we can manage them. We can't uh, eliminate them. We can manage them. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that, that just kind of occurred to me here is 
a thirst for learning. If, if your organization cultivates a thirst for learning, where it's good to get the right questions out, it's, it's good to listen and really listen to understand, just having that culture ingrained will help you manage these cognitive biases. But I was very, very impressed with all the, uh, all the feedback that people were giving on, uh, on how they internalize what we talked about. So I'm very pleased with that. Yeah, and thank you. thanks for, for sharing the insights that led us down that, just that, that path to some good discussion, Brian. I appreciate that. Oh, I, let me... Uh, okay, I just wanted to uh, end saying thanks, uh, everybody, for, for listening to me. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, please check out my uh, website. Uh, I do a lot of new human and organizational performance lead training. Uh, and by the way, you see me in the cockpit there, right? <clears throat> That's not a real cockpit. That's a simulator that we bought at Ontario Power Generation. It was really a great uh, learning tool, training tool. Uh, and I, I sent this around to my relatives and friends, and they were all unanimous in saying, if I get on a plane and you're sitting in the cockpit on the driver's side, I'm getting off that plane. <laughs> I thought that was pretty smart on their part. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Brian. All right, well, that brings us to the end of day one, and I'm going to do two things, three things. Well, maybe more than that. First, Charles Major, I'm going to bring you back in. You started us off today. What are your closing thoughts on day one today? Wow. So uh, as predicted, there was a lot of stuff going on in there. And I, as the day went on, one thing that impressed me was we didn't get less participation. We got more. So uh, thank you, one, everybody out there. But to Dean, thank you for facilitating uh, the job of, of, of bringing out the ideas. So one of the things that's our main focus here uh, in this community of learning is that it, it be a community of learning. So yes, we have speakers, yes, but it's the crosstalk, the, 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 the self-teach, the people throwing up links, uh, people throwing up ideas, uh, those are the things that people are going to write down, come back and check on, that the learning didn't just happen one day in June, right? That learning and, and part of that relationship got built that took us through the rest of the year. So, success. Love that. Thank you. And you, yeah, I totally agree with keeping that momentum going and the momentum that we built through the day. So love that. Tomorrow, we're back here with another great lineup um, that's up on the screen right now. We'll start at nine central time and go through with another good cadence of activities throughout the day. So um, that's all I got, except for thank you all very, very much for, for the energy and the thought that you put into today. And we will see you tomorrow. Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody.